Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the April 12th, 2023 workshop of the Historic District Commission. Um, we're going to start with um, a staff announcement and then we're going to move into adopting the design standards. We had a public hearing at the February meeting about the design standards and it was for UDO alignment and adding McCrory Heights. We'll talk a little bit more about that next. And then we do have one workshop item, 1147 Ligonor that we'll welcome. So, um, but first, before we get started, I have an announcement for the entire commission. Um, it is with uh, sadness. I have, I can't, I, sadness that I'm announcing that Cindy Kohanic has resigned and is relocating out of state. And her last day is Friday. And I don't know what I'm going to do without her. So, Cindy, thank you so much for all your service. We, we've really benefited and grown from your support and your expertise. And we're all the better for having you here. So, thank you. I'd like to echo that sentiment. I'd like to echo that sentiment. You know, I'm in Wesley Heights and Cindy is a, you know, a, a mainstay there at our community association meetings. And I know that we're not the only neighborhood where she consistently shows up. Um, she is level headed. <laughs> uh, even when I know I've wanted to like scream at the top of my lungs, she's, uh, um, she is. As you said, Chrissy, going to be missed <laughs> thoroughly. And so um, thank you for being so level headed. Thank you for being so consistent and thank you for being um, such a an asset to not only the staff, but to the commission as well. You'll be missed. Wish you well, Cindy. Would you like to say anything? <laughs> You're <laughs> okay. C Cindy's microphone is off and she does not want to speak because she's a little emotional, but, um, and we don't want to put her further on the spot, but we, we were very sad to miss her. Yeah. I will say one thing. I do yes. appreciate all of the staff. The staff here is fabulous and the commission has been great to work with. You guys are all fabulous. So that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. you. Thanks. Cool. You too. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we're going to get through the rest of this meeting like we have all the others and we're going to enjoy having Cindy here for one more day for one more commission meeting. So next we're going to look towards um, the adoption of some design standards updates. And again, we had a public hearing about this at our February meeting. We've received no comments. We talked further about um, heritage trees at the retreat on March 2nd. And that is the one that is one change that was made. There are also some minor edits made to the McCurry Heights summary. Um, here, just giving you an overview of one of the main purposes was updating all zoning code citations to UDO references and then alignment with timeline changes for submitting final plans and obtaining COAs that we adopted as part of the rules for procedure in December. And then the heritage tree review, which is page 8.5, number seven. It's a new standard that was added. Let me go down here. And that new standard is, oops, won't let me zoom. That heritage trees are a new section of the unified development ordinance and article 20.14 um any heritage tree as defined by the unified development ordinance would not be subject to hdc review and that's to prevent conflicts between uh, review processes and help streamline things for applicants seeking to remove heritage trees and the heritage tree uh, ordinance is very specific about replacement measures and what's required they are trees that are 30 inches and larger DBH and their native species to North Carolina. So we're talking about a pretty small portion of trees as well. 
but that is also in here for review. And again, we talked about this at the March 2nd retreat, and I received no further comments about that. And then the last change is uh, McCrory Heights just cleaned up the description about McCrory Heights and made sure to add um, information about the neighborhood covenants. I know we have covenants in Wesley Heights and we probably need to look to update the Wesley Heights summary page as well in chapter three to reference the covenants, but um, we would be remiss if we didn't take this opportunity to include that while we're including McCrory Heights as part of the district. And one of their covenants is that they require that new construction have traditional masonry exterior to be uniform with the neighborhood's existing original structures. So that was just an important tweak. Yes, ma'am. The, there were two corrections I wanted to share or make. I sure. got here late. I had a problem parking on this particular copy. Yes. Um, the sentence that in the last paragraph that begins, some, I can't read it. Some, it, it's grammatically, it's missing something. Some losses have nibbled at the edge of the neighborhood. The bulk of McCrory Heights, it should be while some okay. losses have Right. Easy. Easy. Okay. easy and then yep. the other one is further on down where it says um, conform with. It should be conform to. Perfect. Noted. Marilyn, you got that? Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your attention to that. Anybody else have any edits along the similar lines to this or any other of the changes? I'm going to go back to the summary page. Over to you, Kim. All right, perfect. Our, I just have one question. Our yes, just Commissioner Bell. The next meeting. Commissioner Bell, will you repeat that? Sorry. Um, will changes be reflected in the next meeting guide? Or changes go into effect upon adoption. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, we have had time to sit with this, look at it, review it. We've had a couple of grammatical updates. Do we have a motion to adopt uh, the design standards and the updates for UDO alignment? Just need a, a, a motion to adopt. Okay, Commissioner Hawkins. Yes, I'd like to move that we adopt the design standard updates for UDO alignment and Macquarie Heights information added to chapter three. All right. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Hawkins, seconded by Commissioner Walker. Any discussion of the motion? All right, let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Oh, yes. Yes. Commissioner Wojcik. Yes. Commissioner Walker. Yes. Into the mic, please. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. And Commissioner Parati. Yes. Motion to approve passes 8 0. All right. And then the next thing on our agenda is um before you move on do we all have mics we all need mics okay um hold on cindy linda would you please get everyone mics thank you all right thanks um okay we are looking for angie lauer is joining us for a workshop with about eleven forty seven 47 ligonore angie are you with us Hey, Angie. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Can we, let's see, start video. There you go. There we, go. we can see you. Hey. Okay. Um, I'm just going to turn it straight over to you. Let me know how you'd like to proceed. I'm on page 1 for you. Okay. Well, 1st of all, I also want to, um, with this, with the news from for Cindy, absolute. Extreme guidance, and I just want to make it for the record. I think you're absolutely wonderful and you will be missed. So that's from the. ALB design family. So thank you. Thanks, Angie. You're welcome. Um, so this project is, is we really just want and uh, kind of an FYI to see what we can and cannot do. 
1147 Linganore. Um, it is a little bit of a unique house. Um, it is a one story with um, a partial upper level on the right hand side. It has a driveway that curves um, from west to east a little bit, you know, right there we're on slide one. And it has a front facing garage. And um, the garage internally is disconnected from the house. So there is no connection between the garage and the house without going outside, either through the front path or through the back door. Uh, slide number two, and, and again, this is gonna be just for an FYI to see how we can handle the situation. So slide number two is the existing survey um, of the property. And in order to get into the house, you either go into a side facing, which is a west facing door, um, or west paper, wet paper west facing door, or you have to come in from the back door. So there is no direct connection from garage. So slide three, four, and five are the approach either from Berkeley or from um, Romney Road. And you could see the white car that's in the driveway and the grade. That white car is the neighbor to the left. It is not the subject property's car. So slide number four is a different approach. And you could see they have a little planter strip between the, between the properties. Um, slide number five uh, shows you kind of a head-on shot and the crepe myrtles that are in the planter strip view from the driveway. Slide number seven, um, again, this is now coming from Romney Road, looking at the house. So the house is a front-facing garage. Um, they want to create some heated square footage on the house, which is would take the garage from a garage a non-traditional front-facing, non-conforming front-facing garage um, into heated square footage. And the displacement of the, of the driveway so that it would not violate section 8.2 number six, which says no front yard parking, but it's existing non-conforming. And so we want to kind of have a dialogue about what the commission's thoughts are we can't displace the driveway. There's nowhere to go to the left. Um, and so we have options. We thought, well, if we use a window, so slide number 10. Um, so slide number 10, we just did a quick overlay. If we convert it to a window with the shutters to match the rest of the house, they are not a standard. They're more of a, um, oh my gosh cottage style with double hung window. So the bottom sash is larger than the upper sash. Um, so it'd be six over nine or a simulated garage door, carriage style garage door, because it's a very cottage looking house. I believe that the original or the doors that are on there are not original, they're aluminum. Um, and I don't think they might've been um, original. So to change it to a, garage door or a simulated garage door with glass, but I still have front yard parking. So I just need feedback from the commission on your thoughts. Uh, slide number 11 kind of gives you an indication. You can see the blue box in slide number 11 is the size of a car. I can't really um, divert the driveway without truly changing the grade on the neighbor's side. However, I would only gain two feet. There's no gain of an entire parking pad to, to the north. So I just want kind of feedback. Um, I know that in a second phase of this project, we're going to be changing the dormers on the right-hand side, but it doesn't impact the left-hand side. So right now we're just discussing what to do with the driveway and the garage. So thoughts. All right. Thanks, Angie. <clears throat> Commissioners. Angie, is it currently being used as a garage? It is currently being used as storage. They do not park in there. The door is very narrow. It's only like a seven foot, yes. seven foot wide door. Mm -hmm. and it's seven, seven two. Seven yeah. So they are parking where that blue square is currently. 
Yes. So in the um, that's where you park. That that's it. And that's a small car. You could see the width of the door. Mm -hmm. You know, many could park in there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's it's an unusual situation. You could see barely to the right, and those photos of the streetscape I think gave it the best um, view. Changing the grade to the left of that car in slide number eight. Can you zoom in on that slide six, Christy? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, um, there's nowhere to go. Mm. And you can see on the property line, the survey, there's just very little distance between the house and the property line. So slide number two. Okay. Um, we have to, while you uh, go through that, Angie, we have a commissioner who has a question. Commissioner Wojcik. Hi, Angie. How are hey, you? Good. How are you? Good. Can you just give me a little bit of an idea of why we want to widen the driveway? I understand the transition of the garage to living space, but what is the benefit or need or why are we asking to expand the driveway? Well, we don't want to expand the driveway. That's the whole purpose of this sketch is the potential grade disruption to the to the neighbor to the north. Because it violates section 8.2 number six, if we can if we change this garage door to a window, for instance, mm -hmm. then I have front yard parking. I see. That makes sense. Thank you very much. I'm trying to say, okay, we really can't go paper north on this, or you know, north on this um, diagram. So the red line is saying, ah, it doesn't offer enough side yard parking for the disruption. So the gain is worse than the, the you know, the cure is worse than the problem. Um, so so Angie, what you're, I just want to make sure I understand too. So really the conversation that we're having about the parking is uh, not, it, it is because you are taking away the garage door, which is not really functioning as a garage right now anyway. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then invite, you know, so I had a conversation with staff about this, it's like, ah, you know, if you move that and you take away the garage door, then you have front yard parking. Okay. Well, if I put a window in, I'm taking away garage door or do I simulate the garage door with a window that, and a panel so that I can insulate the garage because it's not insulated. Yeah. And it, no matter what you have front exactly. yard parking. Exactly. So it's an existing non-conforming based on zoning terms. It's existing non-conforming use and structure. Um, so I come to y'all with this dilemma. Christy, have we had this happen in the past? No, no. Oh, yeah, it's special. Um, yeah, Commissioner Barth. Do, do you know if the garage was original to the house or is it? Was it added on? So based on brick, mortar, joints, everything that we could see, it appears to be original. Um, however, there was there's no connection in the house. Like there's no way to get to it from in the house. So there's a, a fireplace that is in the middle of the room. That's the living room, which is to the right of the garage. And the only way to get in the garage is through the front door or through the back door. So you have to go out into the elements to access this. So to answer your question, it appears to be based on the brick mortar and alignment of the joints, but I don't know for certain, I guess Christy might have um, some background. Um, I, you know, Angie, what year was this house? Is this like late forties? It is. I think it's 50 something. So I'd have to look it up on GIS. I don't have that information directly in front of me. So I did find, you know, some of the um, mid century homes, uh, post war homes, some of the America small house, 
there are front facing garages in those in those catalogs that we have even old Sears catalogs, you know, there are front facing cottages. Um, but I can't find one exactly like this. Have you found um, instances or precedent for front yard parking in our districts with other non conforming lots like this one? So, not that they haven't had a notice of violation or they're parking without HDC knowing. Okay. So, the garage and the driveway, if you look at the streetscape, which is go, going back to slide number five or six, you can see that it is an original curb cut. It doesn't appear to be a non original curb cut. Um, so, I'm I, I come to you with question. It looks like it's original to the house from we haven't made a site visit, but we've looked at photos and looking at like the architectural details mm -hmm. and the way garages were handled when they were first added to houses, like they were kind of considered separate. So I'm not totally surprised that there's not an interior connection mm -hmm. and that people would walk out to their front door. Mm -hmm. um, there are not too many front facing garages though, there aren't. which makes this house special too. And in the past, whenever we've had a non-conforming situation, we have allowed for a different kind of thing because of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that there are things that we don't like to set a precedent with, like painted brick and front yard parking and all of that. Um, however, exceptions have been made when the lot is exceptional. Right, due to unique circumstances of mm -hmm. the lot or the building. Yeah. And also look at, you know, reversibility. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, there's already front yard parking there now because you can't get through the garage door. Correct. So also too, there's um, in section 8.8, .8, let's see, 8.23, it says retain existing historic drives. And so that is an existing historic drive on a street that has you know, very prominent houses. So this is a much smaller house than most. This house does not have any rear yard access for a driveway unless the, the garage was turned into a carport and you drive through it. Um, so 8.2.3, retain existing historic driveways, which we would do if we are, can alter the garage door to still look like a garage door, but it's not, would that satisfy the commission because it is reversible, um, but convert the interior portion, which you guys don't have purview over to heated square footage. We're just changing the exterior um, of, the of the door, basically. If I change it to a window, I know I, I feel like I'm in violation, right? Like, I feel like I know I'm violating 8.2.6. Um, but with 8.2.3 and the second option that we have to change the garage door to more of a carriage style to let some light into the space, would that satisfy the commission? I would be satisfied with that as one commissioner, um, just because you do have a non-conformity that you're dealing with. And there's no way to really, given the size of the garage, make it accommodate a modern day vehicle. Um, it looks like, and just so you know, so that you all know, I just looked up uh, the house on Polaris and it says your built is 1950. Okay. Um, so yeah, as one commissioner, Angie, I think that there's a case to be made for that. And I know this is a unique and I don't want to take up too much of the commission's time. I just want the pulse, you know, like if you guys say yes, like, I think we're good with this. Then we can also proceed with, you know, dormer changes on the right side, which 
um, we'll, we'd come to you, but I don't want to, we don't want to split the project into two. We wanted to make it very cohesive. Okay, so we're we're a little past one. Um, I see where Commissioner Wojcik has something she wants to say. At this point, if you all have people in the room, we can hear you if you're talking. Just step out if you have something to say because it's distracting. Um, but if you have something, commissioners, that you want to share with Angie, let's uh, try and make it quick so that we can get onto the agenda. Okay, all right, Commissioner Wojcik. I just wanted to say I agree with Angie and Miss Kim, and I think that the garage door look would be very appropriate if you left the existing garage door and converted the interior to living square footage. We would never know, um, just obviously by changing that door to something more aesthetically pleasing could be an actual complement to the architecture. And leaving the drive as it is seems appropriate and actually meets our guidelines so that would be my thought okay anyone have uh, a differing opinion that you want to share before we move on well there you have it angie thank you thank you and i know it's non-binding so uh, we would present something more <laughs> official to the commission so appreciate your time on this one and i'll see you in um, a few minutes Couple of hours, minutes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was just going to remind everyone that workshops are high level, non binding feedback. And um, just as a reminder. So, yes. thank you, everybody. Thank um, you. Chairman Parati, over to you. Sure. sure All right. The Charlotte Historic District Commission welcomes you to the April 12th meeting. I'm Kim Parati, chairperson, and I call this meeting to order at 1.04 p.m. Also sitting on today's commission are Chris Barth, Noelle Bell, Michelle Hawkins, Sarah Wheat, Scott Whitlock, Jill Walker. Have I missed anyone? All right, thank you. Also present are HTC staff, Christy Harps, Candice Lighty, Jenny Shugart, Cindy Kohanek, Marilyn Drath, and Linda Keish. Jill Sanchez Myers is our attorney, but today we have Nicole Hewitt. Nicole Hewitt. Um, and uh, Candy Thomas, our court reporter. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the commission has resumed in person meetings. However, as a continuing health and safety precaution, the commission is permitting applicants and members of the public to participate using a remote online platform if they choose. Due to the hybrid format, I ask for your patience today as we proceed. There might be slight delays as we transition between speakers, participants, and presentations. Participants in today's evidentiary hearings were required to provide a copy of any presentation document, exhibit, or other material that they wish to submit during the evidentiary hearing prior to today's meeting. All such materials, as well as a copy of city staff's presentations and documents, were posted online prior to this meeting and may be viewed by visiting the HTC webpage. For everyone participating remotely in today's meeting, we ask that the following guidelines be observed. Please make sure you are on camera using a video source during any testimony. Please mute your audio when you're not speaking. Use only one source of audio, computer or phone. Do not put your phone on hold. Make sure you are in a quiet area. Please turn off or silence electronic devices and do not speak over the person talking or you'll be asked to leave the meeting. Please use the raise your hand tool and please do not speak unless recognized by the chair or by staff. Because the commission is a quasi judicial body, any speaker for or against an application must be sworn in. Any individual wishing to speak for or against an application was asked to sign up and provide any additional evidence in advance of the meeting. During the hearing, I will open the floor to anyone who has joined the meeting today by telephone. When it is your turn to speak, please begin by stating your name and address. The review of each application consists of the presentation of the application and deliberation. The application is presented by the HDC staff. The commission will first determine if there is sufficient information to proceed with the hearing. 
The applicant presents their testimony for the application. Other parties wishing to speak for or against will be given reasonable time to present factual sworn testimony based on the HDC design standards. The HDC may question the applicant and HDC staff members. HDC staff and the applicant will be given an opportunity for rebuttal and final comments. The HDC will close the hearing for discussion and deliberation. During discussion and deliberation, only the commission and staff may speak. An HDC member may request the hearing be open for further questioning. The HDC will craft a motion for approval, continuation, or denial. The majority vote of the commission present is required for a decision to be reached. A final vote by the HDC will end the hearing. If you'll be addressing the commission today, please raise your right hand and respond I do to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be mindful we have a court reporter present who is responsible for making an accurate and complete record of these proceedings. The reporter must be able to hear and understand. Everyone present must state their names and addresses before they speak. Speak clearly, loudly, and one at a time. The reporter will interrupt only when absolutely necessary to get clarification on what was just said or to alert speakers they are having difficulty hearing or understanding. Are there any questions? All right, let's get started. Okay, our first application is 1512, 1514 Southwood, and I believe the applicants are here in the room. So I invite them to come up and join us and they were just sworn in. So while they're getting settled, um, the project was continued from the January 18th meeting for information about trees, fences and walls, windows, sidewalks and parking, materials. The applicants have provided additional information, both in the standard presentation. We also have information in the agenda supplement, which is linked online. And the additional information in the supplement is about the windows and doors. Um, staff was also informed this morning that um, a sheet was submitted in February by the applicant that was missed during the presentation. Um, and so we usually when this happens, even though they've had a couple months to let us know it was missing, we still like to let you know, air on the side of the applicant. So that is before you. And I would say this would be applicants exhibit number one, and we would add it to the agenda supplement. It is about helical peers. So it is here on the screen for everybody. Um, with that, I'm not going to present any more, but turn it over to the applicants and let them share with you more about their project. So Paul would state your names and your addresses for our court reporter, please. Uh, Wesley Fitzgerald, and the address is 9700 uh, Baxter Caldwell Drive, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28213. Uh, Ron Skefka, uh, 3116 Willow Oak Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28209. Can you keep this closer to you and talk loudly, please? Thank you. <laughs> Usually a problem I don't have. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ron Skefka, I reside at uh, 3116 Willow Oak Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28209. Okay, and I'm on slide eight. If you could help me um, there on the um, left side, let me know where you'd like to begin. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys for hearing our information or for our presentation. Um, I guess the easiest place to start was with item number one for why we were continued um, and probably the most pertinent um so there is a tree um approximately two feet four inches from the front corner of the building which is sorry which is that orange red circle there um that tree at this time has already caused some damage to that corner of the building and per the structural report that christy was so nice to include um was basically stating that with or without the tree being gone there was already damage and two helical piers were going to need to be installed um, at this corner. Um, it 
and based on our conversations with staff at HTC, the primary care is of the building and we would like to retain the building and we are in fact trying to save this building. Um, I'm sure all of the staff is aware from last week's correspondence that um, we had received approval to, for the demolition of the non-historical structure on the site next same site but a house on this building and that obviously was approved so we're trying our hardest to save this building and it seems that the the real only way forward at this point is to install these piers that are going to kill this tree as we bury the helical pier into the ground right at the base of the root ball um and then yes awesome so i think that kind of speaks in and of itself um, the other side of this is that um, there's going to be site work done all around this area in any way, and the impact if the tree was to somehow remain during all of this is very likely to kill the tree and still hurt our building at the same time. So on, on that side, we feel that that's the best course of action and realistically the only course of action to to continue propping up this corner of the building that's already experienced damage. Um, for the second reason why we were continued, um, if you could go to sheet uh, 24, I think. Or would have been from the January presentation? No, okay. Um, there should have been a site section. Oops, sorry, go back down uh, a little bit further. 15, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so this was something that we had to put together for the um, Charlotte Civil site, um, basically showing that we were screening the mechanical units, both the proposed and the future. But one thing that it really did show is the illustration of how our site is impacted by grade. So the building itself sits on an already sloped site, and part of the building is a subterranean basement with the rear access only. And one of the things we had talked about was a very small retaining wall at the front of the property. So in front of the building, there is a space already um, that experiences drainage issues. And so our proposal was to put a small patio that can be used as an amenity space for both the primary tenant, Mr. Skafka and his law firm, um, as well as the tenant space at the front of the building. Um, this is helping to alleviate some drainage problems. And in order to create enough space for that, we needed to create a small retaining wall, um, no more than two feet in height, to separate this patio space at the grade of the building from the street grade, which is, as you can see, uh, 746 versus 7 7.77 versus uh, 748 and a half, or 749 and a half, I believe, 748 and a half. So um, from the street side, very little of this wall will actually be visible and the proposal is for a cast concrete wall as we have another cast concrete wall so that is not using any concrete block or anything like that it'll be board formed cast in place um, poured concrete so on that from the sidewalk side depending on where on the property line you are you may see as much as about eight inches to a foot to as little as three or four inches just above the grass line um and then on i think 13. so on this one you can see at the back of the site um we are having to fill in a good portion of the site uh to meet grading expectations for ada compliance and so as such uh it was deemed necessary to have a retaining wall on the back third of this property to prop up all this infill dirt that we're bringing in. Um, that wall uh, is currently sitting about eight feet, four inches, and it's retaining about eight feet of dirt at this point in time. So very little of that wall is sticking up above grade. Um, and then um, there's a couple of renderings on this one uh, on sheet 16. So we understanding the HTC guidelines saying that a wall should be no higher than it has to be. Um, we made it the minimum height that the structural engineer felt comfortable with retaining all that. And then on the sides where not necessary, we've sloped down the concrete 
so that it should make as minimal of an impact as possible. But I would like to remind that it is very far back on this property um, and would not be visible from any right of way. Um, there is a it's an it's an easement for there that is completely wooded through. Um, and then there's an, another adjacent property behind that that is of commercial use, not of any kind of residential. Um, and then that wall is also proposed to be of a cast in place board formed concrete. Um, but very, once again, hopefully very little of it, if at all, should be seen from the streetscape. Um, the bigger one that we kind of went back through and discussed um, after our initial HDC hearing was relating to the windows. Um, so we heard the council's commentary and their ideas and their suggestions, and we went back to the drawing board to make sure that we were doing our due diligence as well as upholding to the HDC standards. Um, based on that, we went out and um, tried to get as many uh, opinions as possible from different sources, um, some of which are listed um, on the HDC's website, not as preferred. I don't think you guys recommend anybody, but it's somebody that obviously has done work before. Um, so we've called out multiple people. So that would include Salem Heritage Windows, uh, Powell and Sons Window and Glass, Modern Restoration, uh, Argo Window Repair, uh, Shed Brand Window and Door Revitalization, and then Barefoot and Company, which is a glass and window frame manufacturer as well. Um, and I think maybe the owner, Ron, can speak to this a little bit, um, but it seems like we struggled to get in contact with many of them. Um, and we were able to get two reports done and two people that looked at the documentation that we had already provided, as well as made site visits to actually look at the project in person. And those would be the two reports on the supplemental pages, Christy. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. I hate looking behind me while everybody's looking at me. <laughs> um, so the the windows are likely original to this addition, which was done in the 50s, as we discussed last time. The original building is a 1920s CMU structure at the back of the property, and this was added on in the 50s. So they both of the um, people that we had come out are of the belief that these jealousy windows are original to the 1950 structure. Um, but the one thing that they both found in common, especially after an inspection of the windows in person, which was crucial because we felt like just us providing evidence to them would not be enough. And we wanted them to visit. And you can even see um, the they commented that they obviously went to the property. There was um, a lot of damage, both of time and age, but also this property has suffered several break-ins over the years um, through these windows. And um, if you, yeah, so actually this is a perfect example. So this is on one of the windows facing the streetscape. Um, at some point, the window frame cracked. You'll see, um, and then it was tried to repair. It's actually done with a, a, a car bondo or uh, like a fiberglass bondo that was applied over the window um, where a crack was found in the aluminum frame, um, which is certainly not an approved repair, but not one that happened under either one of our watches and may have even happened before the HTC uh, was even founded. Um, their recommendations were the replacement of these windows and um, simply because in a lot of cases, they found that the aluminum frames are no longer repairable and a lot of these parts are no longer available, especially since um, I believe out of the 12 window openings, which 13 total openings, um, 10 of them had completely non-functional um, operable mechanisms to actually lift the window panes. And several of them have been stuck open for who knows how long at this point, and it's caused some severe water damage and mold to the inside of this property. Um, now, like I said, we heard the commentary from the HCC staff, and we have worked to um, revise our previous submission into something that may be more conforming and give the appearance and look 
as best as we possibly can to match these, which are just no longer uh, an, an item that we can readily have and repair and grab. So um, if you could go back to one of the uh, elevations on the main presentation. Yeah, so one more up, please. Okay, wonderful. So on the front of the building, there is a four pane jealousy window. And this was one of the ones that was the worst affected. This had been had several break ins and they had actually screwed in um, with self tapping screws, a metal mesh behind it to prevent further break ins. But we are looking to simulate the appearance of the jealousy window with a storefront, an in play, a, an inserted storefront system with a simulated divided light with interior and exterior uh, muntins to this. Um, we looked into doing true separated storefront pieces, but to mimic the look and feel, the uh, divider in the storefront piece would have been too thick. Um, it would have about doubled the size of that initial sat of that initial divider um, running across it. So we feel that this was a very good option to simulate the divide in that and give both interior and exterior depth. These are not just going to be applied like stick on or clip on, which I know is obviously not allowed for 4.1418. Uh, <laughs> Took some notes today. Um, so we feel that this would simulate the appearance while also providing the necessary um, kind of replacement of these windows. Um, beyond that, so on the front side, we have changed out the garage door for a storefront door with a, or a storefront system with a door. And then where we have an existing doorway into the building, we're just updating it with a new storefront system because that frame was um, bent and broken and installed actually backwards in the, uh, in the door system and the doorway. Um, and then the windows on the front that would be replaced are with as close as we can mimic with the storefront. Um, on the rear, similar to what we did last time, we're doing a, um, where there's vinyl siding on the rear of the building, we're removing that, restoring the wood lap siding that's underneath um, that's remaining, and then doing a storefront piece with the same um, simulated divided muntins to mimic a warehouse style feel on the back of that building, which is very similar to our neighbor next door, which is the cask building, which is obviously passed through HDC um, a few years ago. Um, if you could slide to the next, please. So going down the side of the building, um, we we had a, uh, a talk with Christy um, after our first meeting here, and we wanted to ensure that for the business use inside of this, we wanted to provide as much natural light as we could, um, but we also understood the limitations of not opening and enlarging the existing openings where possible. Um, Based on our conversation and understanding, um, we would like to add two openings that mimic the style of the front of the building as it turns the corner um, and give it that same feel, which is then kind of divided from the rest of the existing openings that we are not changing in the windows um, by the uh, roof access ladder. So based on that, we feel that we've, as you can see, between the top and bottom comparison, we've mimicked the style as, as similar as we can while also bringing a, at least two more openings. The last opening on the left, that doorway, um, it was no longer functional in the current design scheme. Um, so we've chosen to take some of the existing brick that we have left over from the building and infill that and create a window there instead of a non-functional door and the door is not glazed at all. It's actually a mostly rotten wooden door. The bottom quarter of it is probably three quarters gone as it is sits anyway. Um, moving back into the CMU part of the building, um, we provided the entry to the primary tenant, which is Kafka Law, and then some additional windows back there um, to provide light into their offices and their space back there. Um, moving past 
the windows um, for the sidewalks and parking, um, it was discussed about not basically paving right up to the edge of the building. Um, I believe it's sheet or what, maybe two or three is the illustrated site plan. Wonderful. Yes. Um, so we worked with our civil engineer to squeeze out um, some space. Um, so we provided a 15 inch planting strip um, along the edge, um, basically separating obviously the building from the sidewalk and the drive aisle. Um, it pinches back down at the staircase as it drops down against that. Um, and the only, and then basically right in front of that as it moves to catch the ADA parking spot. Um, but along the rest of the drive aisle section, we've created that parking strip. Um, at the front, obviously, it's a patio space and amenity space to be used. Um, and we felt that it wasn't, can directly adjacent to the um, drive aisle and therefore didn't kind of fall in the same realm of the planting strip requirement. Um, and then the last one was, or the second to last one was the um, removal of any wood material or wood, cementitious wood like material. So that was when it removed, we are switching to the underside of the canopy structure is a is a metal deck appearance um and we felt that based on the commentary from the hdc uh last meeting that was a more uh a more appropriate material to be shown in this given the industrial style of the building um and then the last comment was the metal roofing on the back which we still plan we still intend to use um, with the rigid insulation underneath it to provide the energy code compliance. Um, and it is not just bare metal. It does have a color. Um, I believe it's dove gray. It's a nice light gray, but it should dull down on any reflectivity and anything that would want to blind the neighborhood. And then, yeah, I think, Ron, do you have anything to comment or add? Um. The only thing that I, is uh, Wes indicated, uh, it was very difficult to get somebody that was willing to do uh, a report with the idea of trying to repair or save the windows. The um, Salem Heritage, uh, I even personally knew somebody that they'd perform work for and even having them to reach out to them had no interest in uh, coming out and uh, doing anything with regard to these type of windows. And I know Wes uh, ran over some other names. Uh, also, uh, professionally, I know the owners of the Renewal by Anderson uh, franchise here in town, and they uh, likewise uh, were unable to source or to be able to find someone that would be able to. So I'm very appreciative uh, Bill Green from Barefoot and Company, uh, as well as Natalie from Shed Brand for taking their time to do that and to provide the information. That was probably the most difficult thing uh, after leaving here to last meeting to actually reduce that to someone's uh, written opinion on them. Uh, that was hard fought to get those reports. So uh, since I reached out to contact or try to contact people, um, that was my personal knowledge of that struggle. So. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. Uh, Chrissy, do we have anyone on the line? No callers. As one commissioner, I appreciate your due diligence. So, um, commissioners, questions of Wes and Ron? Yeah. Uh, so, on the windows, am I understanding correctly that all windows will be replaced? The whole, the whole building? That is correct. And none of them will be operable? Uh, no, sir. And you said you're going to have simulated divided light um, muttons on the inside and on the outside. Is there a spacer bar in the glass? So we had explored that um, as an option, but when creating the space for that piece to actually even the spacer bar dividing it, uh, we ended up with a much larger uh, Munton or, you know, 
horizontal bar that ended up dwarfing the size of the original jealousy windows and you know as as was commented to us maintaining at least the appearance if we were to replace them maintaining the appearances paramount in the replacement of that and we felt that that was the best way was this with these interior and exterior simulated divided piece so what's the thickness of the glass the ig um we are currently looking at a um one inch uh total thickness or 20 it's actually 24 mils um and then it's a quarter it's a half inch exterior glass uh a quarter inch uh air gap and a quarter inch interior glass piece so i, I would i'm just curious uh why that spacer would be bigger what size are the mutton pieces they're one inch by um actually i think uh, the one, the window sheet actually has the depiction of them. It wouldn't have changed from the first presentation, so it might be way down there. But I believe it's um, one inch uh, visible uh, height, and then each piece is uh, a half an inch extra um, to the thickness of the glass. So the... The the windows that are there now that are operable, I'm just looking at the front elevation picture. So you have two, like in the top left, you have two sash. And so when they're closed, you're seeing the frame of the top sash across the middle. What's the thickness of that? So as as it sits, if the window is closed and some of them are not closed and haven't been closed for some time. Um, that is one and a quarter inches when fully closed. And that's the inclusion of the top frame over the lip of the bottom frame. I, I think it would look, um, I think you would notice not having the spacer bar. I think it's gonna look like exactly what it is without that. And so I would, question that you can't find one that would be the right thickness might not be easy but i just feel like that's especially walking by these you're gonna it's gonna you're gonna see exactly what it is you know one piece of glass with mutton stuck on the inside and on the outside and nothing in between so anyway that's uh a question i guess and um I think that, well, first off, I think you did a good job of addressing most of what's here. The tree, and I agree that it's probably doing damage to the building and, uh, you know, should probably come down. But what is the condition of the tree? I mean, the, is the, as an arborist looked at it. We have, um, we've tried actually several arborists. Um, to to come out and look and once again uh, ron may be able to speak a little bit more to that but we've had both himself call our gc um call and try and get people i mean we've even had um you know not that it's always the best option but we've tried to get um some of ron's friends that have done tree work for him at his personal house here in charlotte come out and look at it and we just can't get people to come out and look at it and i think it's a matter of not looking so much at the health of the tree that it is the the building has already experienced the damage and we're trying to prevent more damage to this to this building i mean it's the need for two helical piers on this corner speaks to the damage and granted there are going to be 11 other helical piers trying to prop this building up as there are some serious structural conditions around the building that have cracked cmu brick and masonry all alike um and we just we want to kind of sit on that as the as the reasoning is that the building has experienced a shift because of this and we would like to prevent that from happening even more and return it to its original position because it has fallen down at that corner um okay and let's see So the, you mentioned something about removing the vinyl 
and going back with can you just tell me what you were talking about there? Yeah, so the rear face of this building, both of the original 1920s building and the 1950s building on the rear elevations, they have vinyl siding over the lap board. And so we're going to remove that and restore and re and we're not going to paint it, but we're going to reseal it uh, to preserve that wood lap siding that is the historic part of the building underneath it. We we're not sure when the laps the vinyl siding was put over top of it, but Obviously, we understand that HTC board is not a huge fan of that. <laughs> so in that upper left, that gable, we're talking about that. So just those little nubs on either side of the storefront glass? Uh, that correct. That'll be that'll be the wood lap that's saved. And mm -hmm. we're and obviously along the large vertical section in the back, um, at the back of the 1950s edition that sits at the on the roof level, that is also vinyl siding that will be the restored wood lap siding. Okay. All right. Well, that's all my questions right now. Thank you, Commissioner Whitlock. Other commissioners, Commissioner Hawkins. So, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your presentation and for being thorough with the uh, standards. Um, I did want to circle back though to the tree uh, item. So. Uh, Ideally, if a tree is to be removed, we need that those standards to be followed so that we the, the HDs or the commission can assess that and you know so that you can move forward with, with whatever the decision is. So um, I think that's what we would need in order to help you with that. Um, and I guess the other question related to the tree is if you're looking to remove the tree, did you have plans to replant trees? And because I'm not sure I saw that. Yes. And I could be missing it, but if you could slide over to the illustrated site plan, please, Christy. So during this, we obviously there are planting requirements from the city of Charlotte, but however, we are proposing with the removal of this one tree and saving the two trees on the street that are existing as well, we're going to be locating an additional six large shade trees, as well as some additional smaller evergreen trees around the property as well, as well as a multitude of other plantings, um, basically shielding the uh, commercial building as it sits from the residential space right next door, um, which is separated from us by uh, easement and then some fencing on the back of those properties. But we are allowing for six shade trees to be planted as a it, as a replacement or a uh, as a, uh, basically as a replacement for that tree being removed. Okay, and I'm going to defer to my uh, fellow commissioners and Christy as far as those replace replacements if they are suitable um, options, but I just wanted to make sure I understood that. That's a great question. Um, Canopy tree is, are you replacing one canopy tree with at least one canopy tree? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions? Commissioner Barth. Um, Christy, if we go to, maybe oh, I'll just ask the question. Maybe you answered this already, but what were you proposing for the material of the landscape wall in the front? The landscape wall, the, the small one on the front is going to be of a similar construction to the rear one, which is going to be a, a cast in place board formed concrete wall. Gotcha. Okay. And because it is in fact, retaining at least somewhere between 8 inches to almost 8, almost 2 feet of dirt, depending on where you are running up and down that sidewalk section. Okay. And it, and there's like a leg of it that connects back to the existing building. Correct. Yeah. Um, there's a photo of the front of the building under the existing conditions. So we are. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a little hard to see, but off, if you look at that one in the corner, we are about, about 15 inches away from the cask building and there is a grade change there already. So basically all the water is sloping down off the sidewalk into our site, off the edge of cask into our site. And we're just trying to, create a space for that to drain to the center of this patio space and drain away from the front of our building. Um, so we do have to deal with a little bit of a grade change there as well. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
and obviously we'll get into this as we deliberate, but I mean, would you consider um, doing that wall and brick instead since it is attaching to the existing brick, maybe complementing that material choice? Yeah, I mean, we I, I can't see why we'd have an issue with uh, do you mean the actual solid construction of it or facing it with brick uh, facing it. With OK, yeah, I'm, I think we'd be open to that for sure. And then um, I thank you for putting the planting strip uh, down the side. Um, I think we have a similar concern with the the front of the building, just paving directly up to the um, the the brick wall there. Um, I think you know I'd be curious to see if you guys would be open to pulling that around the corner and going on the front as well. Um, so you mean where it comes down the side, kind of pulling it around as it gets towards that entryway? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Correct. just up to basically the, the Where door. the door is. Yeah, 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 and that we would that was something we'd be open to. Okay. That's all. All right. <clears throat> any other questions, commissioners? All right, guys. Do you have anything you'd like to say before we close? Um, I did want to clarify some of the conversation about trying to obtain reports as it related to the tree. Uh, Wes is correct. If, Ron, if you'll speak up and into the mic. Goodness, sorry. Um, I wanted to clarify what Wes was saying about uh, reports and with related to the tree. Initially, prior to the first hearing that we had sought out to have people come out and look at the tree, when we came in, back and we had the hearing and we were given the six feedback notes, the focus became the structural aspect and obtaining the structural report as related to the existing and ongoing damage to this. As Wes said, the focus has been on whether I can save this building and whether or not it should be demolished. So um, just for clarity's sake, based on the six items that we are given, I did not continue to seek anything with regard to the health of the tree. I focused on whether our structural engineer of record on this project did agree that this was causing damage to the structure and looking at those uh, HDC standards. So I didn't want to misrepresent anything in that regard. At that point, that became our focus and I, I believe the letter speaks for itself in terms of that's exactly what he said. And that's why I'm seeking the removal of the tree is because I do want to save the building. That had a lot to do with me buying this property. And I'm at a decision point at this point as to whether to do that or not. So um, that, that that's the focal point. And that's the distinction between how we originally started looking at this corner and what can be done. And then how we lasered in on it related to whether or not it was damaging the structure. That's the basis for my request to remove it. All right. Thanks, Ron. Okay. <clears throat> we will now close for deliberation. Commissioners, why don't we start with um, general thoughts and then we'll move to why we continued the case. Or we could start with why we continued the case. Why don't we do that? Okay. So let's start with uh, where let's pick up where Ron left off the trees. So we have a structural engineer's letter um, speaking about the damage that was done to the building by the tree. Um, to me, that is a good reason to remove it. One will be replanted. So uh, anyone have a different opinion? Okay, all right, then let's move on to the second reason we continued this. Fences and walls, right? So we're looking at the retaining wall uh, in the front primarily, and then of course there's the one in the back, right? And so um, uh, paraphrasing our standard, uh, the wall needs to be functional, not just pretty. <laughs> so, um, do we feel like enough evidence has been provided to show that the wall is in fact functional? All right. I see people nodding their heads. Yes, Commissioner Walker. And if you'll turn on your mic and speak into it. Apologies. You're on number two. Uh huh. Which also talks about the proposed landscape. Mm -hmm. I'm still a little concerned about the hardscape to softscape ratio. And I don't know if anybody's driven over there to see the properties that are across the street. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, they're, they're all homes with, with large lawn, lawns and ivy and 
green, green growing all around them. And then, as you can see, that original home that's there has its own front lawn. Um, while I understand the need for the landscape wall, I, I guess I, I have a little bit of concern about the ratio of hardscape in the front of both the structures now. If you look on slide, um, there's one slide that kind of gives you a sense of how much hardscape there is. Um, slide number 16. Okay. And I guess in our guidelines, we talk about context and looking at the properties that are 360 degrees around this property. And that's that's the one thing I still have problems with, as I did when they originally submitted this. Um, so this is, uh, you know, unlike the properties across the street, it's uh, it's a business commercial property. So it's a little different that way, right? And just looking at it in its current state, there's not a lot of green space there now. There is in front of the house that's being taken. Oh, well, in front of the house, yeah. Yeah, okay. and I and I guess in our guidelines, when it talks about new construction for non-residential, it does it does talk about how context is important mm -hmm. to look at what's around it. Sure. So that's just my comment on that. Okay. Anyone else have a similar uh, feeling about the lack of green space on this property? You know, I'm thinking Commissioner Walker about, um, oh gosh, we saw this application, Christy will, or <laughs> Cindy will be able to tell me, uh, it's a tavern, tavern, no, no, no. Um, th there's, it's uh, paved in the front and we allow for seating and like, Ed's yep. Tavern? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think, you're, are you thinking the vintage? That's what I'm uh, thinking. It's like 215 or something like that, yeah. East Worthington, yeah. right at the edge of the district. Yeah. Where so. they had that, front, they changed parking mm -hmm. to like a patio mm -hmm. and used planters. Yeah. That's what, that's what I was thinking about. But the context for that, I, I can't really think about the context for that, uh, for the, for vintage. Do you, is it similar to this? Well, I think if you just go to Google Maps, if you can do that quickly, Christy, and Absolutely. plug in the address, you can do the, see them. Thank you. And while Christy pulls that up, I'm going to ask again to who here has concerns uh, in addition to Commissioner Walker about, well, that was fast, Christy. Thank you. But it, so people online can see it. Okay. That take me just a second. All right. Kim, could I ask a question? Sure. Well, uh, we're we're Chief, closed. Maybe someone on the board. Okay. All right. What is the material for the parking lot paving? It looks different. Mm -hmm. It was discussed as being gravel in the first meeting. Yeah, we need to be able to hear you. I thought yeah. I was talking into it. I know, I know. It's it counterintuitive. Discussed as being gravel in the first presentation. Okay, and I see heads nodding. They they cannot speak, but they can communicate. <laughs> yes. So here's the context. The, there is a difference, right? That mm -hmm. this was originally a parking lot that they mm -hmm. transformed into this outdoor patio. Mm -hmm. It's the very edge of the district. So South Boulevard is here. Mm -hmm. This is Dunkin' Donuts. This is not part of the district across the street. Mm -hmm. um, but then right next door, nice green space, it's green space mm -hmm. and we get into the residential portion of East Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Okay. And or then can you show the Southwood street? Yes. Yes, I sure can. Thank you for bringing these points up. Commissioner Walker. Oops, I'm throwing stuff around. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Technical difficulties. Give me one second. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Christy experiencing technical difficulties. Um. Uh, 
You know what? Um, why don't we hold there until Chrissy? Well, she's so fast. It. She's so fast. Okay, so Southwood, you have the cask building here, which faces uh, West Summit across the street, residential. And then you have 15th, 12th, that is right up against the cask building that they were talking about with the drainage issue. Yeah. Um, and currently it's a driveway kind of parking and on this side, it is green here. <laughs> Greenish. <laughs> so um, before we move on, Commissioner Walker brings up a good point. We love our green space. It's you know one of the reasons, one of the things that makes our neighborhood so special, right? So um, there's a particular um, look to this building, and of course, next door, uh, the house that is coming down has ample green space. Um, anyone else have issues with the green space here? Yes, Commissioner Barth. I was I was just going to say, um, I mean, given, you know, I look at the cask building, it's, granted it's on a larger lot, it's a bigger structure, but it's, it sort of sets, sets up more of that industrial urban setting that we see along Summit and this part of Wilmore. Um, granted, we are backed up right to a residential part, um, which I appreciate some of the landscaping efforts the applicant has done with the two islands. Uh, facing those res residential properties, and you know, I don't, I don't know that we've heard any testimony from the neighbors in protest mm -hmm. of this project. So I'm that does make me more comfortable. And this being a commercial building, I think is quite nice, or not quite. It is nice, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that I think that gives it a few favors as far as hardscape versus landscape. I will say that the the front portion I probably would like to see reduced a little bit as far as the paving. I think I meant mentioned, you know, not paving up to the building in certain parts. Um, I think it can be reduced, but as far as accessing this building, safety, um, uh, handicap accessibility, you know, some things are going to have to be done in order to meet the standards. So, you know, if this is, if the front part is, is minimized a little bit, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm great with this, this plan. Can we get a little more greenscape and then that, that makes us all a little happier. Commissioner Wojcik? I think that the planting space that they've created as a buffer between their side residents will actually very much increase the green space because when that second house goes away, you're going to have an elevation and a, um, you know, a floor area, basically. I mean, you'll have a base planting and a height of greenery that will actually create a really nice visual buffer and green element to the area. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Wojcik. Anything uh, anyone wants to add that has not already been said? Commissioner Whitlock? Yeah, I, I would just want to confirm that the old curb cut it, it, the drawings are showing it not there and mm -hmm. grass. I just want to be um, reassured that that is, in fact, the case. That, that it's, it's still there? That it will be coming out. That it will be coming. The old curb cut will be coming out. Right. We don't have to. We can communicate without reopening. <laughs> or actually, it looks like we should reopen. So why don't we reopen and pose that question to Wes? Um, just so I'm clear in your question, you're saying the curb cut for the driveway in front of 1512 Southwood, the warehouse, we are proposing for that to be removed and continue the green space at the street side instead of having the driveway up to the front. Okay. And that's approved with the city or? It's actually required by the city for us to do that. Okay. But would, it was part of the give and take was then opening up the significantly larger curb cut down the end where there's also the city easement which is that gravel strip to the left side that 10 foot piece okay good thanks all right thank you we will reclose okay so uh why don't we move on to point three standards for windows people <laughs> only two companies came out 
I mean, we ask for, uh, we ask for evidence and we ask for applicants to go as far as they can. I think that they've shown, you know, a lot of, they've been fastidious in their reaching out to, uh, companies. They had two come in and, you know, they're saying that the windows need to go. These are all the windows. So what do we, what do we say about that? Commissioner Wojcik? I think that the information that was provided by those two companies were very helpful because in the original pictures, it wasn't as evident to me of the patchwork that had mm -hmm. been done previously. And the fact that you can even see pieces of metal attached to the existing windows and Bondo and mm -hmm. such are, are very helpful in terms of the integrity of the existing window frame. And then the fact that you can't even purchase the mechanics that go with that system to make them operable. I, I think those two pieces were very helpful. Yeah, that's going to be something for us to really consider as we start looking at applications for Oakland Park and Macquarie Heights, you know, so these applicants have gone a long way towards helping us understand a little bit more. But then we get to our question or some of the issues posed by Commissioner Whitlock, which is, okay, so you can't go back with original you can't restore it how do you how do you make it fit as best possible and i think that that's the challenge because listening to commissioner whitlock i'm not i'm no longer convinced that um the solution is the best one commissioner whitlock do you have anything you want to say about that well first i agree i agree the windows need to come out and be replaced um just questioning the the detail of the window that's going back and the look of that and i am concerned that there would be no spacer bar in the one inch insulated glass and um are we also concerned that they don't open <laughs> i mean of course i would like to see them open um i guess i I'm not sure. I'd have to see where uh, our standards say that they have to. Open. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that they do. Yeah. 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 Oh, Commissioner Bell. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. The only thing I wanted to add is I agree that the based on what was presented, it is a little concerning that it was challenging to get some um, experts out there. But we'll figure that out another time. But based on what was presented and what Commissioner Wojcik said. Um, but the one concern I did have is the fact that they would not be functioning windows. I didn't, and I intended to ask that question, but I figured we would deliberate. Um, if it's, it's going to be a commercial space, people will be inside. How, I would just want to discuss that. Maybe we have to reopen it. Why would the windows not function? Oh, and what opportunities about would that like Oh. safety or anything we're we're concerned about appearance so if they don't function what's the um if they could function do they have the same dimensions as windows that could function is this those boards only mm -hmm. concern okay thank you that makes sense okay yeah so that's not our purview right it's exactly. not, okay never mind <laughs> commissioner barth um i agree with uh Commissioner Whitlock's comments, you know, I'm, I'm curious here if a more traditional like clad or even steel window would be appropriate here. I think the applicants have a, a tough uh, task in front of them in that, you know, they don't make these windows anymore. They're incredibly, I would imagine the window expert, but I would imagine they're incredibly difficult to repair being uh, the extruded aluminum. And I'm from what I've seen in my own limited experience, these things fall apart you know, all the time and they're always modified. Um, so in order to achieve that similar aesthetic, if we could look at something other than like a storefront type window or something with thinner sight lines. It would be great to have some options, right? To, to, to see. Um, okay, well then uh, let's move on to the next point. Uh, da, 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 da. So the planting strip they have the planting strip going down the left side of the building. Uh, we talked about having it curve around and meet uh, on the front facade uh, and stop at the door. 
Um, so they have addressed it. They are agreeing to continue addressing it. Anything else that we need to add to this point? Okay. Uh, all right, and uh, the underside of the canopy will be left uh, metal. Um, I, I think Wes said he didn't say metal. He said metal like or metal looking. It's metal, right? Yeah, it's those extra words that throw me off, Wes. Okay, so then we're good there. Um, and then, you know, the six point was uh, more of a statement than a request from them, right? So the metal roof can stay essentially. So where we are right now is wanting to see options for the windows because we're not really convinced that what's been presented is the best option. But the good news is that all the other points have been addressed thoroughly. Um, uh, you know, green space came up, so we'll see how um, the commission as a whole feels about that. But I think that we have enough now to move on to a motion. Um, and so if one of you brave souls will step up and start crafting it, you know we work as a team, um, that would be great. Commissioner Walk Whitlock. Yes, I'll, I'll do a motion, but first I have a question for staff. Um, would staff, would we be able to delegate the window? Yeah, I fine. don't feel comfortable doing that. Mm -mm. Okay. This is new for us. Especially if you're asking for like a storefront or an aluminum clad and mm -hmm. what options are out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is kind of new territory for us. That's always a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I will make a motion. I uh, move to continue the application for the following reason. Um, per standards for Windows 4.12 through 4.14, um, we're asking that uh, alternates be presented for the window replacement and to possibly consider uh, uh, operable windows that would more uh, accurately represent what's being removed. And I believe that's it. Okay. Um, any friendly amendments? Uh, Second. Oh, sorry. Okay. But any before I should probably ask if we have a second. Yes. Do we have a second? Commissioner Wojcik? A second. Second. A second. Okay, so motion made by Commissioner Whitlock, seconded by Commissioner Wojcik. Any further discussion of the motion? Commissioner Barth. Um, I would like to add a friendly amendment, um, uh, sort of a two part uh, that the applicant re explore the amount of green space in the front patio area. Citing um, adding additional planting between the building and the paved area so that we don't have paving directly up to foundation walls, as well as looking at the um, landscape wall in the front as being a material compatible with the historic structure. Okay, Commissioner Whitlock, friendly amendment. Accepted. All right, Commissioner Wojcik. Accepted. All right, any further discussion of the motion? Are we, uh, we did talk about the tree and replacing it. They have it, so we don't need to bring that up again, correct? Okay, yes, Commissioner Barth. One one quick question, I guess, for staff uh, that I totally forgot about is um, lighting. How do we review lighting on commercial buildings? There, there are lighting standards and and they talk about downward directed, the number of lumens, all those sorts of things. Okay. So if you want to review lighting, you can ask for all of that information. I, you know, I I think it's fine. I think, for me as one commissioner, I'd probably want to see something, um, in keeping with the era of the building, and make sure it follows those standards for for, you know, temperature, 
um, lighted directional, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I guess we could go for staff with that to make sure that they approve that with staff before proceeding, unless any other commissioners have issues with what they've presented. No, I think if they're adhering to the standards, then staff is more than capable. All right, so do you want to add that to the motion? Should we add that to the motion, Christy? Because we didn't really talk about lighting. I mean, it wasn't one of the reasons why it was continued. Um, I would feel more comfortable if that were included in okay. the final decision. Okay. So what you could say is we've not reviewed lighting. We are, you know, open to sending that to staff with it, a, it, a church, something that match what Chris said. It, as long as it adheres to our standards. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And matches okay. the era of the building. Okay. Are you uh, good with adding that commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Are you good with accepting that commissioner Wojcik? Yes. All right. Okay. So let us vote. Excuse me. Commissioner Wheat. Yes. And thank you. Commissioner Whitlock. Yes. Commissioner Hawkins. Yes. Commissioner Barth. Yes. Commissioner Wojcik. Yes. Commissioner Walker. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Parati. Yes. Motion to continue passes 8 0. Thank you so much for the work you've done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Our next application is fifteen twelve Thomas Avenue. And this is a we do we have a moment for like a five minute oh of course break. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Let's do it. All right, okay. thank you. Five minute break. No, no. Be back at two fifteen.
Y'all ready? Okay, hi everybody. We're back from break and we're going to continue with the agenda with item number two, which is 1512 Thomas Avenue. And this is a consent item. The project, the project was a failing um, chimney, both on the inside and out. You can see in some of these photos, it's leaning um, quite a bit and in danger of falling down. And the applicants are doing have included interior photos as well. And we also have photos in the agenda supplement. Oops, which I think I closed. Um, and what they're proposing is to take out the entire chimney and then build build it back at just the outside. So it's not going to be a working chimney fireplace. But when they build it back, it's they're going to reuse the bricks. And they have all of the measurements and even in the supplement are dimensions of what it will look like. So it's going to look exactly the way it is. They're actually going to turn the bricks around and use the non painted side of the brick to rebuild this chimney. And technically, I guess this is considered a restoration. So staff could sign off on it, but given the location and that it's an exterior chimney, just. Out of abundance of caution, I'm sending it to the commission for y'all's review. That's all I have. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Barth has something he needs to say. I just want to include, I don't know if we need to look at this any differently uh, with how this case is being presented in a few moments, but I did drive by this or walk by it a few times. It does appear that the chimney has already been removed as well as the windows. So, I don't know if we need to look at this as an after the fact or what. Oh. I was not under the impression that the chimney was removed because we just got these. I just got these photos of with the tape measure. The other day, when was it removed? So it was like a week ago, maybe. Oh. Well, I think I have a pick. Well, either way, I'm not, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> um, removed or not the. I think what the commission's looking at, is it okay to rebuild as proposed with unpainted brick and to match existing? I had a question. Sure, Commissioner um, Bell. When it says that it would go back to the original state, is the brick to me looks like it's been painted. So would it go back as a painted brick or would it go back as a so set? As I explained, they are using these bricks and turning it around and using the unpainted side. So it'll remain unpainted brick. It okay. was a, a, Sorry. a little detail that was in there. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Um, any, uh, any issues with this remaining on the consent agenda? All right, well, let's get a motion. Not everyone at once. Commissioner Bell. Yes, I'll make a motion uh, to uh, assuming that the chimney has not actually been. Removed. Well, even if it's after the fact, we look at it like it hasn't been right. Yes, I'm just trying to add a little humor. <laughs> um, I, I make a motion uh, to approve um, one second. Since it's, uh, uh, I make a motion to approve this application since it's not incongruous with the district and meets the standards for rehabilitation of building elements, roofs, pages 4.5 and chimneys, page 4.7, and the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, and it looks like we wanted, <clears throat> we received the um, dimension, so. That's been covered. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my motion. That's a perfect motion, Commissioner Bell. Motion made by Commissioner Bell, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Hawkins, any discussion of the motion? All right, let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? No. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? 
Yes. Commissioner Parati, yes. Motion to approve passes 7 1. Okay. And staff will follow up with the applicant to determine the current status of okay. the chimney. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, the next application is 1900 Dilworth Road West. And I believe Mr. Green's in the room. Have you been sworn in? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, This application was continued from the last meeting for building setback, roof pitch, and a tree protection plan. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the applicants so that they can state their names and addresses. I will note that the siting of the garage has been moved to the back corner of the lot. So. Sean, if you would state your name and your address for the court reporter, please. My name's Sean Green. The uh, my address is twelve twenty one Hawthorne Lane, Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, my name is Sam May. My address is nineteen hundred Dilworth Road West, Charlotte, North Carolina two eight two zero three. And I'm on slide eight, which is the site plan. Sure. So if you and just let me know where to go from here. Um. So thanks to everybody for being here. Um, we definitely have been working on getting more in line with the comments and observations uh, made from our last meeting. Um, certainly a lot of that uh, focused on the location of the garage. Uh, so what we've done is we've uh, brought the garage to be in line with the house line slash streetscape of the side street, which is Worthington. Um, as you can see in the new and improved proposed site plan. Um, additionally, given the uh, due diligence of Sam here as the homeowner, uh, we've got some rather uh, disappointing news in that the 60 inch diameter oak tree up against the house is, has a, about a 40% chance of failure in the next year. Um, Heartwood tree has submitted their report, which I've uploaded to the via the portal. Christy, did you get that? Uh, when did you upload it? Um, three, three weeks ago. So, Let's see um, is it is, is it in your presentation? Uh, I just uploaded it th th through the Excella. Uh, thing. Did you have a chance to check your presentation when we emailed out on March 31st to make sure everything was there? Um, I, I guess I didn't think that 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 the drawings were the kind of the heart of that, but we, that, that being said, I have to say I'm not familiar with every single okay, sheet and so, every single presentation. So, so, so that's that's why I bring it up because I wasn't sure either. So, basically, that's part of what we're what we found out since the last time we met is that the tree up against the house, which is in, is you know obviously aged, is in danger of falling onto the house. Was it submitted as a separate application? To Excella. Oh, no, no, I just submit, I submit up, uploaded it via the, the project. Okay, uh, yes. if dead disease, dying, et cetera, can be handled at the staff level. Okay, so we'll okay. we can talk about that. Sure. Yeah. I think I want to bring that up just because it impacts our site plan. Sure. Because some of the uh, commissioners were um, very worried about that tree since it does kind of set the tone for the Dilworth Road West. Streetscape. Okay. It's on really. Um, so if we can go back to the site plan, please. Yes, it has crashed. So let me make sure it's sharing with the folks at home. Oh. There's the site plan. Is that what you wanted? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so, as as we had meant or discussed at our last meeting, establishing where the uh, the Worthington house is along the rear yard, and aligning the garage with that house line uh, was important. Yeah. As a result, we'll have to relocate the apron that accesses the garage off of the alleyway. 
and the, the apron will obviously match in kind what's there now, which is a concrete apron. Um, the opening in the existing fence and the motorized fence itself will be adjusted, but we're going to be matching and replacing that and the detailing of that fence as it exists now. Um, what I've also done on the site, the new site plan is located the street trees along the Worthington side, just as a matter of reference. Uh, as it relates to the um, streetscape drawing that we've included, uh, just because I feel like the street trees kind of frame where that garage is located as part of the Worthington streetscape experience. The additional uh, notes from the meeting, uh, the roof pitch uh, for not only for the new covered porch at the at the house, but also for the garage, we've we've regular regularized the hip roofs at the garage to be more in keeping with the neighborhood standards and context. The slope and hips of the new flat roof at the uh, new covered porch are more in line and in keeping with the existing you know, low slope roofs of the house. Um, and then lastly, of the um, items on the list here, as far as the tree protection plan, that's why I kind of bring up again the, the, the destiny of the, the 60 inch oak um, with the relocation of the garage to be in line with the house at the along the rear property line. We do have a, a 30 inch oak tree in the back left corner of the property that will be approximately seven and a half feet way away from the new garage location, uh, at which point we'll be uh, establishing, you know, we'll probably end up having to go with a great beam and a waffle slab to make sure that that um, root system isn't compromised coming back in during construction with the requisite fencing and mulching to protect it, as well as the needed um, superseding in advance of construction. So, um, those are the points from the email, Christy, that you sent. And uh, in advance of that, I know that you had the commission had generated a number of comments regarding kind of clarity on the garage. Certainly, we've got um, we will be utilizing a foundation stem wall with brick veneer to ensure that the aesthetic of the garage is in keeping with the neighborhood context, along with our five inch mole face plates, where we've got gang windows together. The divided light pattern of the windows at the garage will be matching that of the house. Uh, we will, we've also, there was also a desire for Clarity in notation for the columns. We are going to be using a paintable turncraft composite column on brick pedestals that will match the existing house. Um, and lastly, on the garage, we clarified um, where the dormer wall is as it relates to the wall of the garage wall. There was some erroneous information on the previous presentation. That, that dormer wall is indeed eight inches off of the face of the. Will you speak wall. into your mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last comment I made was the location of the dormer wall being eight inches off the face of the lower garage wall. And there was some ambiguity in my drawings last time. So I cleared that up. Uh, I believe that I think that uh, addresses the comments that were brought up not only in from the meeting, but in the um, staff comments as well. All right, perfect. Chrissy, do we have on anyone on the line wishing to speak for or against this application? No callers. And then the um, neighbor that spoke against it mm -hmm. has retracted the statement and now is in support as shown in the agenda supplement. All right, thank you. The tree that's not going to make it uh, yeah. Did I miss it? Are you replanting? What's happening? 
Yeah. Are you replanting? Oh, fully. Yeah, we intend okay. to replant. Yes. Okay. Where Where are you going to? Um, I'm. If we could go to the site plan, just so that I could see it there. Is it on there? And I missed it. Um, I have not located where the new plant locate the new tree location would be. Okay. Um, in speaking with Christy, I was not sure, kind of, and uh, doing my diligence as far as kind of the the guidelines that you have where where we need to put that so mm -hmm. can, can we seek counsel from you all on that i mean I, my my inclination would be to locate it along the worthington streetscape side just to not only add privacy for the homeowner but to just make for a lusher experience for the people in the community as one commissioner i'm in favor of that you'll have to ask the rest of them though right, um uh <clears throat> so that is the the 60 inch oak um we had some concerns and i'm sorry if you spoke to it and i missed it about the 36 inch oak um and you said you were going to protect it um but it's still in danger with the location of the new garage um right. and one of the things that came up was whether or not you could do like a, a a floating slab or something like that so will you speak to that please yeah as i mentioned we fully intend to work with the um, structural engineer to establish a grade beam or a waffle slab or whatever is okay. highly recommended. all right thanks sean so. okay <clears throat> commissioners other questions commissioner barth um wonderful uh response to the comments by the way and i'd like to commend you for uh doing your side-by-side -side comparisons for elevations and plans <laughs> that's that's extremely helpful and what we want to see so thank you for entertaining that um for the columns on the new porch did i hear you say you were proposing composite turncraft or what's the material of those uh, so the turncraft columns are what we were hoping to use certainly painted paintable turncraft columns to match that of the front porch uh, my understanding is that Turncraft, as the manufacturer, generates a composite uh, column that can be painted that the HDC approves. Is HDC approvable? And Christy's nodding her head yes. Sir. We've approved them on rear porches in the past. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. That's the only questions I had. All right. Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah. Thank you, um, Commissioner Karate, for mentioning the tree. Um, so hopefully we can get some more detail there. Uh, around where the failing tree will be replanted and then how you truly plan to protect uh, the existing um, oak near the rear. Um, the question, or it re really wasn't a question, but a clarification on slide 17, are we, should we be interpreting uh, this left elevation drawing and the primary at the top of the, the slide are these previous, should these be labeled previously submitted? That's a great observation. And yeah, that's a, a, a annotation error on my part. They didn't, those were the previous elevations, the elevations at the bottom that are clouded showing the changes are the current proposed perfect. elevations. Thank you. All right, perfect. Commissioner Walker. Yeah, thank you. On slide number 15. Yeah, is <clears throat> your that accessory dwelling unit you're proposing is is it it's taller than its neighbor the the house next door to it is that correct? Uh, the accessory structure. Yeah. Um, I I've not done any uh, math on that outside of what we can see graphically, so I think that's the implication. So I, you know, there's all the, I think the other part of that equation is that there is a slope to that street. So the grade is also inherently higher um, given our house site versus the rear yard neighbor's house site. Yeah, well, I, I guess we can talk about it in deliberation, but I think typically that would not be an acceptable scenario for um, a garage or an accessory dwelling unit to be taller than a house that it's that its neighbor's house i think i think given the you know i think we're we're what our position is is that given that there's a 12-foot alleyway between the two and that it's 
the garage is pushed back from the streetscape um, in addition to the amount of vegetation that runs along the front of, or along the Worthington Avenue side of, of our property that, that there's, I'm not sure that, that I, I think, I feel like we're achieving the spirit of, of what, what that is. I have no further questions. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we close? <clears throat> I just make a quick comment on that. Uh, that other tree, we'll, and we'll go back and do everything we need to do on it, but it, it is not in good shape either, unfortunately. So when, when the guys come out to, to do the radiology or the, or the checking of this tree, that the big one that's about to fail, they also looked at that one and I didn't focus on it because I was concerned about the big one. But um, when we go through our due diligence on that one, but just as a heads up, like that one, everyone that comes and looks at the big tree says, well, that tree hasn't got long either. And you're talking about the 36 inch? Correct. Correct. Oak. Okay. So if we can, we'll do everything we can to save it. But every, oh, I've had about uh, four arborists out now to do reports and all of them look at that one as well and say, um, you know, you're going to need to do something about that one pretty quickly, regardless of this project. So to, to that, thank you for that information yep. and context. Just make sure that you all are looking at trees 8.5 and provide the information that's needed uh, in order to address the tree. You bet. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Commissioner Hawkins. All right. Anything you want to say before we close for deliberation? Uh, thank you for your time. I know you guys have a lot going on. Thank you, Sean. All right, we will now close for deliberation. Commissioners, Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, so I, I believe they've addressed. I mean, we can start with why the application was continued. Mm -hmm. um, so they did restudy the building setback. They showed the relationship with the garage uh, with the neighboring property. So they addressed that. Uh, I guess any commissioners have any. No. Nope. With that, continue. Okay. Um, the next one, um, restudying the roof pitch on, uh, I think, the accessory dwelling unit to make sure that th that is offset. I believe they've done that. I think it's going to be about an eight inch offset. Mm -hmm. All right. And then providing the tree protection plan. I think that's where a little bit more uh, attention yeah. may be needed. Mm -hmm. That's a sticking point. Mm -hmm. um, it, another one came up, though, um, and I want to address it because we're on record. Uh, Commissioner Walker brought up, well, let's take them point by point, shall we? So, yeah, we don't have, oh, yes, we do additional information in our supplement. So while everyone's looking at the trees, if the tree, if the arbor says the tree has to come out, you can take that off your plate because yep. staff can handle that and we can work with them on replanting. Okay. Let's take that off our plate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can do that for the 60 inch. Mm -hmm. um, and what you can do is you can require, you know, the floating foundation around mm -hmm. the 37, is that a 36? 36, 36, yeah. 36 inch. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can leave the flexibility that if the arborist report comes back that that's failing too, mm -hmm. then that negates the need for that foundation and mm -hmm. we can just work with replanting. Um, but the direction that you could potentially give is 60 inches and 36 inches is big, mm -hmm. you know, do you want a one for one? Or are you going to ask for more? more. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. that's something that I would ask you to be really specific and directing a little more prescriptive. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Um, so let's think about that. But before we get come back with uh, what we think should replace one, if not both trees, let's speak to Commissioner Walker's point about the ADU. Uh, being taller than the neighboring house. 
I uh, would agree, Jill, that there's a nice little buffer there. And while it looks slightly taller, it's definitely diminu diminutive in um, stature compared to the its house, its primary house, and the neighboring house. Um, and the neighboring house faces a different direction, if I'm not mistaken. So um, when I look at it holistically, it still looks secondary. So will you uh, speak to that, please, since it was a great point you brought up? You mean reiterate what I said or respond to? Yeah, your... reiterate what you said. And uh, now that I've given a little uh, something else, a rebuttal, if you can speak to that too, that would be great. Okay. Um, I guess it, for me, it's still a sticking point. And I think because I don't feel that there has been any case in our past that long, as long as I've been on this commission, we're an accessory dwelling structure that was taller than the neighbor's house was allowed. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if everyone here thinks because it's a few feet further back than its neighbor's house, that that makes a difference. I'm, you know, everyone's entitled to that thought, but I, I still think that there's something wrong when, when we have accessory dwelling units that stand taller than, than a you know residential structure right next door to them. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yes, Commissioner Bell. I would just add that you know I looking at it like that I agree, but when I'm looking at the images, if I'm on slide nine, I think I'm looking at the right thing. It almost looks like it would be up on a lift. Like it's almost elevated to me when I'm looking at this. On a podium. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it does. So, and it's a bit hidden as well with the greenery and fencing and mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I agree with what Commissioner Walker's saying, but I'm not as held up on it mm -hmm. as if it was a more open space. And then again, if I'm looking at this the right way, it almost feels like, you know, there's a wall and some elevation mm -hmm. there adding to the accessory building. So that was my only comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Barth. <laughs> Sorry, I just had like, a revelation. Over I here. know. I heard I'm it. On street view, the, the house next door seems to have had an addition. I don't know how accurate the Zotwell is. Um, anyway, that being you know that aside, um, you know I'm I'm comfortable with it because it's clearly secondary to the structure that it's serving, um, as well as you know there's a step down between you know the subject house ridge, the accessory structure, and the. Um, and the house next door. <clears throat> Not that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. reference point, but. So when I think about secondary, I think about it holistically, you know, I think. Right, Chris, it's not on the survey. Yeah, so that is a taller house. Yeah. All right. So then I'm going to take that off the table. How's that? <laughs> All right. Love it when it works out that way. Okay, so we've gone through the points. They've addressed all of the points. So it kind of feels like it's time for a motion. I think so. Mm-hmm. Now, before I make this motion, uh -huh. there were some very good points that Christy mentioned. So I'll need you guys' help. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I would like to make a motion to approve this application based on uh, that it. 
is it meets our design standards uh, for accessory buildings 8.10 mm -hmm. and that I want to mention the, the garage foundation piece. Uh, so I, I guess that would be in the tree section, right? In order to protect the 36 inch oak tree, um, we're requesting that they construct a floating foundation. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and based on, uh, trees 8.5, um, that they provide a construct a floating foundation for to protect the 36 inch oak tree. Mm hmm. Um, we should probably speak now uh, to what should happen if the 36 inch oak and the clearly the 60 inch is coming down. So those are majestic trees. Do we want to replace uh, do a 1 for 1 or 1 for uh, a 2 for to replace the 1. Um, yep, commissioner Barth. if I can uh, add to that, the only thing that I'm, I'm a bit concerned about is this site. Is evident from the um, site plan. Uh, we do have several street trees along Worthington, I believe it is, mm -hmm. as well as um, uh, there in the backyard. So I'd be hesitant or cautious as to how many trees we plant. Like I'd love mm -hmm. to say we could go for you know because there are bigger trees two for one. Mm -hmm. But I just worried that they're, we're going to run into the same situation down the road where the trees become unhealthy because of mm -hmm. lack of you know airspace and that sort of thing. So okay. I, that would, for my position, I would say one to one seems one to one. Okay. To work with staff on where those go. Okay. What say you, Commissioner Walker? I agree. Okay. So then let's do a one for one. Okay. Anyone have a, an opinion that's different from what we've heard? Okay. So let's do a one for one. All right. So in the uh, case, in the, in the case where the trees need to be replanted, then that one large mature Canopy, canopy tree. tree be replanted for each tree that is removed. For either of those two. For either <laughs> of the two trees. Say uh, yes, please. Do we want to state the caliber size? Is Commissioner Walker. <laughs> Commissioner Walker is going to turn on her mic and give us some advice on this. Oh, I, we typically have a two to three inch caliper requirement for a replanted tree, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, two to three inch caliper canopy tree. Canopy, canopy tree. Okay. Based on trees 8.5, I believe I said that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So motion made by Commissioner Hawkins, seconded by Second. Commissioner Barth. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion of the motion? Okay, Commissioner Wheat. Yes. Commissioner Whitlock. Yes. Commissioner Hawkins. Yes. Commissioner Barth. Yes. Commissioner Wojcik. Yes. Commissioner Walker. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Parati. Yes. Motion to approve passes eight zero. Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next application is five hundred East Park. Um, Jesse, are you with us? He was going to join us online. Do you see him, Marilyn or Cindy? You know, we see me. The other thing it's giving us a really picture of where we can our hear you, but we can't right see you. Our AEs. Um, and uh, so some of that can be fixed with enablement, and some of that can be fixed with various. Okay. Jesse's on another call. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Thoughtful discovery or something that's complicated, but if they could just answer this question this way. Okay, well, um, Jesse, we are waiting for you. 
Do we want to go on to the next application? Okay. Um, Angie Lauer, are you with us? Hey, Angie. Feel like we're gonna hear something we should not. <laughs> no, I know. Which is kind of fun, but not productive. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's keep going, Chrissy, until we get someone who's present. Hey, Craig Isaac. Craig, are you with us? <laughs> oh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Yep. <laughs> Easy project. Move, move on through and get get back to the other two. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, will you turn on your uh, your your video so we can my see? Video. Can see Let's that. see where, where. Where is my video? Oh, start video. <laughs> A little thing that looks like a camera. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there I am. All right. <laughs> we, okay, now. Hi. It's great Hello. to see you, Craig. Thanks. Um, have you been sworn in? I have not. All right. If you will raise your right hand and respond, I do, to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. Hey, um, this next application is for an addition to an existing accessory structure. And I should note that the existing structure is not historic. Um, materials are to match existing with new cementitious siding, double hung windows, metal roofing. Um, it slightly changes the rear yard impervious area because the concrete drive footprint is being expanded but they are still under the 50% threshold. So Craig, if I am on slide six with the front of the house, if you yep. would state your name and your address for the court reporter, please. Uh, Craig Isaac, it's 900 Linda Lane, and that's Charlotte 28211. Okay. Um, let's see here. How about there's the back of the house and the front of the existing building. So let me know where you'd like to go from here, Craig. We're on slide eight. Well, if you go go back to the front just quick, um, you'll see that it has uh, has shed dormer and a gable dormer in the front, just sort of for reference. So um, then, if you go back to the existing garage, slide eight. Um, what we've done, um, we're trying to get some workspace upstairs and get some extra height. So what we've done is we've left that main roof um, intact, um, but then extend the roof line up and then back down to, you know, in one respect, kind of create a shed dormer. Um, and then um, we have a shed dormer on the backside for a little bit extra space. Um, the the metal that you referenced was just the, the little metal roof that there is existing now. We're actually going to expand that so it's a it's two bays wide for the garage um, door. And then we're taking that door and similar entry detail and shifting that over um, with our, our four foot addition as a as a new entry in um, to go up, you know, for our stairs to go up and then our door to go into the garage. Um, I mean, the elevation, our, our revised elevation kind of shows that the is the existing garage is still fairly evident what was there. Um, and then we're we're matching materials with the um, uh, shingled roof and, um, and, the, and the cementitious siding, the double hung windows. We're reusing that existing door. Um, again, it's not a contributing structure, but we're trying to, keep, you know, be somewhat in keeping with what's there. Um, I don't know if there's much else. I mean, we're obviously keeping the same roof lines, roof pitches. Um, but the the goal is just to get really get some extra workspace um, in their backyard overlooking the yard. 
Okay, thank you so much, Craig. Uh, Christy, do we have anyone on the line wishing to speak for or against this application? No. Okay. Commissioners, questions for Craig? I'll start. Craig, uh, the addition on the um, accessory building appears to be uh, when I'm looking at the front elevation, uh, and then when I turn and I look at the yard elevation, it, those two walls appear to be coplanar. Um, anyway, you can step it in a little. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, that's, not, that's not a big deal. All right. You want them stepped in on both sides? Yes. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That would actually give it even that much more of illusion, I guess, of a shed dormer. Yeah, exactly. And here's another question I have. You know, typically uh, when we're dealing with a historic structure, we don't want to increase or decrease really the size of the openings, but here right. um, we can do that, right? And so, right. of course, the larger windows are usually on the bottom level and the smaller windows are up top. We have it uh, reversed here, and I'm looking at slide 11 on the the yard elevation in particular. So it looks a little top heavy with the with the windows as opposed to our traditional look of you know larger windows on the bottom. That's something that will come up in deliberation. So why don't you speak to it now? Um, I mean, I have no problem with that. The when you look at the existing, um, those little windows were were basically there. Um, right. we've, we've pushed them to the outside and, and re, re, kind of resized them or re, relocated them. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that it's a big deal if we don't reuse those windows and just put one single window underneath that double window to balance it out. Yeah, I, I would just want to see the star windows, if you will, on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and the smaller windows on the second floor. Um, and so... Uh, we could, uh, yeah, I don't know. We, I mean, we can, the smaller windows, if we put them to the outside. Um, it, it, and, you know, this is. Um, well, I have a question. Just if a moment, Commissioner Bell. Um, and so we're also, I'm going to get to you. And so, you know, looking at the rear elevation and the side, uh, side so it's, I'm having a challenge with the fenestration on this. Okay, so that will come up, and I think Commissioner Bell wants to speak to that too. Yeah, okay. just um, and also, I guess, just as a as a little reference, that um, that little roof that is a recessed um, area in there. So the the double the windows down below that's not one wall all the way across. That's not all in the same plane. Oh, I, yeah, I get that part. I don't have any shadow in there or anything, but, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I um, assume just from your, yeah, yeah your front yeah. elevation. Okay. Commissioner Bell. Thank you. It, is the, the reason that you have the bigger windows on top, because it's going to be used as an office space. Was that yes. thinking? Yes. Yeah. Not to say it's right that way, but just for point of clarification. Yeah, I saw that still it's, you know, we don't really get into the interior. So we are talking about the exterior and they generally have larger windows on the bottom. All right, any other? Yes, Commissioner Wojcik. Hey, I just, I have a, two questions for you. One um, in the description that was written as the proposed, the dimensions on the floor plan are listed as 1911 by 173. But when you look at the dimensions of the proposed actual drawings, it's measuring 24 by eight feet, eight inches by 28. And one, I wanted to just ask you about the discrepancy, but two, also make sure that um, which, which dimensions are actually being shown on the site plan as well, so that we could compare those. Um, I would tell you that the um, the drawings should be right for the direct for the dimensions, and with when we submitted that permit or the application, 
we were probably looking may possibly at that smaller size and maybe had increased it um, since then, but that the um, site plan and the, let me just double check. Yeah, the site, the site plan and the, and the floor plans, the foundation plan and um, should all be correct as far as dimensions. Okay, and we're not supposed to get into the interior function, but I don't see a door separating the stairwell from the garage. Um, and so yeah, I was wondering what it, your it intention came back, was. It, that, that came back in plan review because um, we submitted it early in plan review, just try to get a little jump on it. Mm -hmm. And um, they said that we did have to put a hall in there and a separate door so okay. that we weren't exiting through the garage. Okay, so I was going to ask if if the door, depending on where that door would be, if that would impact the exterior elevation. Um, yeah, it hasn't. It hasn't changed. We we didn't change anything on the outside. We didn't want to affect anything that was coming up today. Okay, I I have notes, but I'm not sure that I have any more questions. Okay, Commissioner Walker. Hi, thanks. Did you give us the height of this new unit? Uh, I think I have it at 23 feet. It's in the proposal. 20 feet, 20 feet, three feet, three quarter inch. What page is that? It's two, two, a two front elevation. It's, um, uh, as commissioner Wheat said in the proposal yes, in the on page 1. It's on slide 11 huh. right okay. here. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Barth. Um, couple of questions uh, to the applicant, but first, I just want to clarify with staff. Um, do we need to see a Zoutwell survey on this? I mean, we just had a, another case where we were talking about ADUs in comparison to adjacent structures and things of that nature. Um, I can't get Zoutwell surveys that show cross sections it's it's the architect gives us the cross section of the lot so from the from the front property line to the back property line so since this is a not a corner lot and and the adu is in the rear yard i mean would that come into our purview in comparison to other structures and contact we can pair it to the main house and what we've asked for again in the past and i think i might have put this i don't know if i put it in my report or not Let's see. Yeah, number one, a site cross section showing the proposed accessory building addition as compared okay. to the existing primary structure is something we usually ask for. To your point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mr. Isaacs, given given that, um, can you tell us the height of the existing primary structure? Do you have that information? Uh, I don't. Okay. I would say that if if we're at 23 feet, that the, the existing structure's got to be over 30 feet. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then I'm just going to go down down my list here. Have a few things. Um, we'd probably want like to see a simulated. Um, uh, uh, how do you say it? <laughs> garage door that looks like two garage doors um, instead of a. A double with garage door. Um, where are you deriving your inspiration for the? I guess I would call it a salt box roof form. Um, where where did you come up with that? Um, to be honest, it's just a simple way to get the extra height. We weren't trying to turn it into a two story garage because it's not a two story house, and um, it's more of a story and a half house, so it lent itself more to that the existing ridge um wasn't tall enough to just do sh a shed dormer off of the ridge to get enough height up there um and so it was it was a way to increase the ridge height with that and and also sort of maintain the existing structure without having to take down the whole structure to start over okay um and then, uh, so we have two elevations, uh, the side um, with the gable dormer on it, and then the rear elevation, uh, both both lacking some windows. Would you be open to adding maybe a few windows 
on those elevations to breaking we up. Add, that. We, we can't add the windows with fire code. You said you yeah. cannot. They have to be no. The building would have to be five feet off the line to add windows on the backside. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then the only other thing, which you know, this will come up in the motion, but you know, typically between gang double hung windows or uh, you know hung windows, we'd want to see them at least a five to six inch mole between them. Uh, yeah, we have to verify, but I'm pretty sure the existing house doesn't have spread moles. Usually, I think the existing house might be new construction. We like to get things right when things are yeah. added. So yeah. that's that's something that we would want to ask for, just for reference. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Anything you want to say, Craig, before we close for deliberation? Uh, no, I think I'm fine. Okay, thank you, sir. So we will close now for deliberation. Commissioners. Is this how is this um, accessory building comparable to the primary? I don't believe so. I think the yeah. architectural style is completely different mm -hmm. and doesn't match the street context either. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to go through and kind of look at the accessory structure requirements and then I went through and looked at the new construction requirements to mm -hmm. kind of see how I would evaluate the proposed design and I felt like it met some of the criteria and guidelines well but some of them not so well just in terms of roof line and massing and proportion and scale all right so it's perfect right windows windows mm -hmm. it, but, so fenestration what else can we add to what else should we add to that if, roof form mm -hmm. yep in general on that street all of the houses i know the neighborhood has more of a variety but the houses on either side of this are definitely story and a half mm -hmm. um and so to have a two-story full wall is not you know, in context, and then again, as we kind of talked about the larger openings being up um, and the smaller openings being down, mm -hmm. um, details in terms of door styling, window trim work. Mm -hmm. um, it looks or it sounds like we uh, need a We, this needs to be rethought. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So why don't we get to that? Right? Because ultimately no need to go through the small things when the big things, um, need to be addressed. So with that being the case, let's see here. Let's look at the proposal. Um, it's primarily about the accessory structure. And yeah, so it's all about the accessory structure. So we can talk about that. Let's keep it high level. And um, it sounds like it will be a continuation. Yes, please. Okay. I would like to propose a continuation for this project based on our accessory building guidelines, 8.10 number three. Um, new design to be compatible with style and character of primary historic buildings on the site, uh, scale, massing, and then also the fenestration and roof forms in chapter six. Oh, chapter six point one three. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Oh. One, two, and three. And I might add uh, 611 directional expression too. Six and 611 for directional expression. And you mentioned uh, 8.10 number three, but I'd add number six there. 8.10 number six. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, we need the selection for style and material of the garage door. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to have uh, on the plan, uh, A, be able to look at it in comparison to the primary, but also um, we need, uh, I think Commissioner Walker asked for this, the height um, listed there, so we need that. So we would like to request a cross section that shows the grade with height of the existing home and the height of the accessory structure proposed. Mm -hmm. I, I did we mention anything about roof forms? Okay, good. I think uh, in you know jump in if you feel otherwise, but I think that we have enough now without getting into the minutia. Commissioner Hawkins. Just the site uh, 6.15 for fenestration. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Barth, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, I, I just wanted to add um, in, in the potential restudy of the roof form, if the current roof form is to remain, I would ask that the applicant um, provide historic examples mm -hmm. within the context of this site. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Barth. All right. Anything else before we move on? Okay. Do you mind restating it, Commissioner Wojcik? <laughs> All the way. Okay. So yeah. um, we would like to continue. This project based on requirements for accessory structures, 8.10 um, number six, we need more details and styling and materials for the garage door. We would like to also address um, const new construction 6.8 for massing and complexity of form. Um, 6.8 number one and number two uh, consistency of context for uh, one and a half story um, structures no coplanar dormers um, and then roof forms 6.13 number two and number three and one um, again, for context, reflecting um, roof pitches of surrounding homes and gable um, dormers, I'm sorry, uh, dormers in general, gable and sheds with appropriate pitches and fenestrations, 6.15, all of them, A through D, mm -hmm. yep, number one, A through D. And then we would like to request a cross section showing the elevation of the existing structure from grade and the proposed structure, the height of the existing structure from grade and the proposed structure's height as well. Um, friendly Amendment, Commissioner Wojcik, you mentioned 8.10 number six. I'd add your original one, number three. And 8.10 number three. Mm -hmm. All right, so motion made by Commissioner Wojcik, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Hawkins. Any discussion of the motion? Yes, Commissioner Barth. I don't know, I can't recall if this was in your motion, but I think I mentioned 6.11 directional expression as well. I did not. Okay, uh, friendly amendment accepted, Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. And is that so good with you, Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. All right. Any further discussion of the motion? Okay, let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to continue passes 8 0. Thanks, Craig. All right.
I've been in touch with both Jesse and Angie who assure me they are both ready. So let's go back and start with Jesse and then move on to Angie's. Um, Jesse, are you with us? I am. Great. Um, have you been sworn in? Uh, not this time. Okay. And can you please turn on your camera? I'll be trying to. Tell me if it's on. Okay. And all right, Jesse. And Angie, if you'll be sworn in as well. All right, we have Angie there. Are you there, Angie? I think she's here. Okay. I'm here. Okay, perfect. All right. If you'll both raise your right hand and respond, I do to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. All right. Thank you both. All right, this next application is 500 East Park Avenue. It was continued from the March 8th meeting for um, reviewing the standards and providing scaled dimension drawings. And the commission at that time did not review the porch due to lack of information. Um, the applicant has provided some additional information in both the application and the applicant has proposed, has included information in the agenda supplement, which I'm Pulling up and the supplement starts on slide 22 with some more information about the beam column detail, some more photos of the porch, more information about the door for the accessory structure. So with that, Jesse, I'm going to turn it over to you to walk through your presentation. I am starting you out on slide eight. And just let me know how to proceed. Yeah. And if you would state your name and your address for the court reporter, please. Great. My name is Jesse Irvin. The my address is 500 East Park Avenue, and that's the address that we're talking about. This. There are two parts of the project. One is converting a garage into a, uh, a mother-in-law suite, um, and the second is extending a porch roof, which is currently the roof covers the front portion of the porch. The porch is already wrapping around the side of the house, but the roof did not. So I'm uh, wanting to extend the roof uh, with the exact same materials and, and look, but just wrap it, have it cover the entire porch. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just the location of where the, the home is. It is um, in front of the home is the Dilworth Elementary School. To the right of the home, if you're facing out of the front porch, is a uh, county building, and then to the left is Lenders Avenue. Okay, so this is the garage today. It is an existing structure. It was built, uh, I don't know exactly when, but I'm, I'm guessing right around 2000-ish, based on the fact that it has engineered truss, trusses for the roof um, and everything, you know, it's that's when it was built. The intention or the from the impact of the exterior is really to add a door, which you'll see later, and to remove the two garage doors, fill in the space to match the existing siding, and put in two pairs of double hung windows that match the windows on the current uh, on the current house, the the kitchen, which you can't see from this view. This is the view from Lindhurst Avenue, looking at the home. Uh, and the garage is the smaller structure to the back where you see the the white door. You, it may or may not be clear depending on how large your, your screen is. Um, next slide, please. So I'll be removing those doors and placing windows in the smaller yellow boxes. They will I'll show you details on them uh, later as well as an elevation. They will again be just um, exact replicas of the windows that are on the kitchen. Uh, and placing a 36 inch door uh, on the street, the Lindhurst Street side to be an entry door into the facility. Next slide, please. So here we have elevation drawings. This, um, the elevation on the left would be if you're looking out of my kitchen window toward the structure, you'd see this and where those windows are today, there are garage doors. Those garage doors would be replaced. The siding would just be filled in to match. Uh, and the brick along the bottom would be filled in to match. And these windows are the exact window that they are facing. Uh, the other side is the only the only change on the structure is the addition of that door, which currently that wall is uh, just a clean wall, but we'd put a put a 36 inch door there. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is, uh, if you are in the new structure facing back, this is the window that you're looking at from the kitchen. So it is a uh, double hung 34 inch wood window with 12 panels across the top, uh, no panels across the bottom. This is the exact window that we are getting in return. In the details here, it actually says there's factory mullion. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to match it exactly. And so the siding on the, or the trim on the window is effectively one by six around the edge and and one by, by eight in the middle. I'll, I'll give you the exact uh, dimensions in, a, in the supplemental piece, but we'll match this window. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a just a little detail on on how it's how it's trimmed out, and and we'll again just match to the existing home. Next slide, please. Next one is a, uh, a rough order on the on the porch. Actually, thought I'd replace this with actually the I think I have the detailed drawings next. But effectively, what we're doing here is taking what is an existing porch that covers um, the main porch that you see pictured on the right. But the porch extends over to the left, and we would extend that. Next slide, please. So here are the elevations. So you can see that the difference is currently the porch would end after if you if you look at the front door and count the pillars, you see two pillars on the left and two pillars on the right. Currently, while you're looking at this drawing, the pillar on the left is there, but that's the last pillar, and the uh, that is where the roof ends. So we would just extend it with the same materials, same elevation, same everything, uh, add two pillars, um, one pillar that you can see here, and then you'll see the other pillar with the other, with the side elevation, uh, and have that extend around to the side. So next slide, please. Yep. So you can see those are the two pillars that will be added. Uh, the roof will, this is the, you know, how the roof fares. You might have a question about the window, and, and later I'll talk about that because the actual windows aren't going to be affected. That's just how how low the roof hangs, and that's how it's extending the same roof hang from the front of the porch today. Next slide, please. This is a bit of detail on just if you've got any questions on how it's actually on how it's actually done, what the trim is, and the intention is again to just simply match the existing trim exactly. Um, so same same soffit, same exposed beams, same trim, same color, same everything. Next slide, please. About the supplement. Okay. And the supplement was to specifically answer the, the questions you see on the left were um, from the notes from the last meeting. So the question was around the existing porch, asking for a section view, which you see here, and then asking for um, uh, something um, about how it how it extends there was a question about how it affects the windows if you'll see the red circle is that's how the current ceiling uh, interacts with the wall and that's how the new ceiling will also interact with the wall so there'll be the same gap uh, above the windows uh, between the ceiling there was a question about if there was a floor on the porch i show a picture here there is a floor on the porch today and there was also a question is is there another home in the neighborhood or are there other examples of similar roofs there are uh Many examples of similar roofs. I, I just put one in here, and this one is from Dilworth Road uh, around the corner from my house. In this case, they're not extending it over a porch, but they're extending it over their driveway. Um, but it's the same thing. Um, there was a, another question is, um, were there other porches that or other garages that had been converted into um, uh, living structures? I have in walking around the neighborhood, several examples, but uh, this first one, this is on Lexington, Lexington Avenue, which is, again, you can see my house is the little heart-shaped dot in the upper left part of the map, the little red dot around the, on the other side of the park is Lexington. This one's relatively new. This was done during the pandemic because I watched it go up, but that was a garage. It is now a structure. It's a little interesting because it has a giant glass facade on it, um, but that's one example. And then I have two more examples in the next slide of ones that are on, if you can go to slide 27, these are both on Dilworth Avenue. So again, just, you know, down the road, one is um, a uh, garage building that has been, the door has been sealed off and uh, they've, you know, have an entry door. So it's been converted into a non-garage. Um, I'm guessing heated space. I haven't been inside of it. 
And the next one here, as you can see, they're in the process of filling in their garage door. It's Tyvek, so they'll be switching it over. Those are two other examples. Is there another slide? No, that's all. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we I might have gone past, skipped past one because I think there were some more questions, and I was addressing each question from the supplemental. Yeah. So if we go to yeah, that there we go. There were some questions there around the entry door material. Uh, the existing door is uh, on the garage on the other side is aluminum. I'm happy to do uh, oak instead of aluminum. It doesn't doesn't matter that much to me, so I'm happy to do that. The second question was around the window mullions. Uh, the current uh, trim is five and three quarters around the outside and seven uh, inches on the mullion when I would do that the same way. So those were all the questions that were from the notes uh, of the previous meeting. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, <clears throat> Christy, do we have anyone on the line wishing to speak for or against this application? No. Okay. So it's time for our questions. And uh, one that I have is um, about how the porch wrapping around meets up with the uh, roof of um, on the left side elevation. So the porch roof will continue going mm -hmm. and then it comes around and it meets that other roof. How do they connect? How do they marry? They, um, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. They will, uh, my original intention was to have them marry up exactly the same. So it extended, uh, the, the roof as in the, the actual drawing, but because the house extends, uh, uh, a little bit further than the porch, then I would probably prefer to actually step it back and have them marry with it, turning the corner as it currently is, and then have about 10 inches of the existing or then where I would again have it turn the corner. So if we go to the elevation drawing, I'll, I'll describe it in the elevation drawing, the only, uh, the other elevation drawing. Yep, where you would see a, a, a slight diagonal line there at the bottom uh, of that extension as it steps back uh, just a little bit before it again marries up to the existing roof line. And then I'll have it fill in the, whereas today there, there might be a little bit of the existing roof that I remove and I would fill in with, uh, with siding to have it just match. I'm not really sure where that is on this draw. Uh, directly, so the lower window and the left screen. So mm -hmm. directly above that would be where I don't think they would end up, uh, well, they could, I could have it extend exactly as drawn, but I believe what I would actually have it do is step back in a little bit because the house steps out a little bit past the porch. Uh, at, at which point you would see just a, a you know, a, a diagonal line that would extend from sort of, yeah, that spot up into the left. So it, it wouldn't look like that elevation that I just saw. It would look almost exactly like this elevation. But you, not, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and I do have a question about the way it transitions around the corner. And I know you spoke to it, but I don't, um, I can't envision that in my mind, Jesse. So it's which, which hard. Which part do you mean, you mean the ceiling part? Yeah. But, and I look through your, your renderings and I don't see that the transition where it ends and then where it will pick up again. Right. So you're extending it. But I'm not sure how that works. I don't know. I don't. I don't understand where in particular. Yeah, it, we both don't understand, right? So the the porch ends, but you're going to wrap it around, and so I don't know how you would wrap it around. I don't. I I need a visual because I'm not a visual person, and so I'm not quite sure. You spoke to it, but I didn't see a drawing of how that transition would be made. So the, the, I guess I'm not understanding the question because there isn't a, a transition. Can you can you show the front elevation? Sure. So, you know, the front elevation, the porch roof, the, the porch roof ends. Correct. And your proposal is to wrap it around. Correct. I don't know how you would pick up from where it is to then wrap it around. I yes. don't. Yeah. So, the so the now. ceiling that you see underneath the existing porch, mm -hmm. there would be a similar ceiling 
under the side porch. And so those where you see today, those um, rafters come down uh, mm -hmm. on the side there, they wouldn't be there. They would be removed. Mm -hmm. And instead mm -hmm. you would, you would just see ceiling there. So it sure. would, it would look like exactly I do. the same on the right side as it does on, it would look exactly the same on the left side as it does on the right side. Mm -hmm. Can I say something I think might help Kim? Please. Yeah. Okay. So if you can imagine that roof that we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, the pillar, the stay on that oh, okay. photo, <clears throat> the end pillar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Above that, the roof has a pitch that angles on an angle back to the house. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Okay. So then what, what he's proposing doing, take that pillar, move it over one mm -hmm. and with it, that angle will now die into the corner of the house. So what's happening? One pillar early year, early one pillar, whatever's happening with that second to last pillar would happen with the last pillar. Right. That's correct. So mm -hmm. you can see it here where this line, this diagonal line mm -hmm. currently is right here. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's see how it's kind of, it would, I guess probably actually it's right here. It's probably centered. Mm -hmm. About that. That's about correct. So it's like the same distance and now it's moving. And so my question then, follow-up question is you have those two piers there, right? And so, um, you don't have the same condition really on the outer side. Oh, that's not true. Yeah, you, someone else talk. I'm trying to catch up. Sure, please, Commissioner Wojcik. Only if you turn on your mic and speak up. <laughs> yeah, um, I I just wanted to say one thing that the um, applicant did really well with the supplemental was a answer all those questions. I thought very thoroughly. I appreciated that. Um, I just had a question on the garage where the new door will be. How, will there be a step there, and what will that be? There won't be a step. It's, uh, uh, I mean, no more than a threshold. It's, uh, it's at effectively the same level in concrete inside and outside. Oh, okay. Thank you. Commissioner Wojcik. Jesse, thank you. Yeah, you provided a lot of really helpful information. Um, I I have a couple of questions specifically about this elevation where the yellow um, triangle is. Will it? We already know that it won't really work like that. So are the the heights of the gutters between the existing front porch and the bump out on the left hand side? Do those line up with each other? They uh, do. Sorry, vertically. Yeah. Yeah, they do. So, and and the way you could yeah. confirm that it's tough to do. You'd have to zoom in. But basically, the the siding is um uh, is shingles, and the you can tell if you follow the shingle line across that they are at the same height. Yeah, uh, I was trying to look at the space above the windows, but that doesn't mean that the windows are set at the same height. So I just wanted yeah. to confirm that. Um, are, so yes, it is, and that's and I again I apologize here because I. When I got my drawings done, I didn't catch this, but the difference in this elevation drawing is what would look different from this side is there would be a diagonal line that shows from the top left part of that uh, yellow uh, yellow rectangle yes. that would that would angle out uh, down in a way, kind of like the one that's on the right side, right? And that's how those you'd see those two roof lines meet. Yeah. I can't, I actually can visualize that, which is helpful, but I want to make sure that the new roof pitch coming underneath those side windows, will it impede the windows that are on the bump out? It, it won't. They, um, yeah. And, and again, because the windows on the, on this side elevation are at the same height as the windows on the front elevation. So Wonderful. that's the distance from the. And if you see the picture of the original house or the house as is, you'll see the distance from the the top of the roof. Yeah, there should be another one. Do I have another one that's just of the front that actually probably not tall enough? Yeah. Okay. If I was 15 feet taller, what you would see is there is a you know three inch gap between the bottom of that window and the top of the roof. Okay. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Can they just add the 
three inch dimension on final plans. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Did you hear that, Jesse? I can. Well, when you say on final plans, what you mean something I should submit back to you or when I, because I don't know that I have to, to put a, a roof on a porch. I don't know that this requires a permit. So whatever plans that you'd like me to, I'm happy to. I just don't know when you'll that need is. A, you'll need a building permit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Jesse, anything you want to say bef before we close? No, no, I'm just, uh, you know, please let me know if there's anything else. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, sir. All right. We are now closed for deliberation. Commissioners, Commissioner Ojik. I, I'm very happy with what he submitted to us from mm -hmm. documentation wise. Mm -hmm. I know that it is harder for you to visualize mm -hmm. and the fact that the drawing that he has submitted is very well done. Mm -hmm. It is not exactly what's going to be built. Mm -hmm. Do we, does anybody have an issue with that? Again, I can see it. I know what's going to go. I, yeah, because you know, you're a designer mm -hmm. and I like to see it yeah. because I'm a realtor. And so um, I am comfortable with staff handling that. So that's where we meet in the middle, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. had the same question around what did he mean by wrapping mm -hmm. the literal, but I can visualize it, even though I'm not a designer, I can't visualize it, mm -hmm. but likely should be added to the plan and staff. So I agree with all that. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? I did hear, oh, I'm sorry, just one more thing. On the material for the door, did I hear aluminum in it? should be metal or wood he said that he would do whatever we want whatever we want okay <laughs> okay commissioner birth i was just going to ask maybe staff or other commissioners typically we don't paint brick that porch you know assuming this is approved uh that porch is all painted brick they're adding brick to the top of the existing pilasters how do we handle that unifying I mean, <laughs> in the it's, spirit it's parts. of yeah. his own making. I mean, typically we'd say, don't paint it. And that's what you've said in the past. You said it to additions. Um, if they choose, they could paint the existing painted brick, a color that coordinates with the new unpainted brick. Mm -hmm. But that's up to y'all. If you think this is a um, exception worth making. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what what what's going to be paint. so just a moment true. one at a time please so brick is what he's saying it's not really clear oh. but when you look at them they're brick they're not wood and we don't do painted brick for these for new is what he's saying and go on sorry so we would request that the applicant put two pillars up that are going to be unpainted brick that's what the standards say so you need to come up with why um you're going to allow this to be an exception if you choose to let them paint so would match existing be an well example? this is a this is it doesn't have to be done this is a condition um that would happen because they are expanding the 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 roof it's not like there was something that happened to the structure. This is something that is an active choice. Well, here, here's where I sit, and I, I love what they're proposing here. I think it fits the style of the house, but speaking to 4.8 number four, avoid altering primary porches, avoid enclosing primary porches. Um, I mean, it, I think it helps preserve the underside of the house on that main story, putting a porch on there. I think it looks good, but, you know, our standards clearly state, you know, we like to avoid this if at all possible. And then we have the issue of the brick that comes up, you know, what do we do with the brick? Yeah, thank you for finding that. Yes, Commissioner Hawkins. Would it be out of bounds or inappropriate? Because I didn't know at first it was brick um, to have white non-brick 
columns added? Would that be, I guess, import? It, it, design. I, I would say it would not be consistent. Um, go on. But no matter what they put there, it wouldn't be yeah, sure. consistent. Sure. Um, and going to 4.8, what's the number? Du, 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 uh, four. Um, it's taking us back even further. If it would help, yeah, I, we're willing to do additional research. Mm -hmm. on the house to determine when things were painted. There was a time when people were allowed to paint foundations. I don't believe there was a time when people were allowed to paint columns. So we're probably looking at an old violation that was just never addressed. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that for certain without mm -hmm. looking back in the files. I'm going to say that as one commissioner, it would be very difficult for me to bless painting brick. Um, knowing the help of trust that this, you know, that's around our neck when it comes to brick anyway, right? Paint it brick anyway, particularly when this is something that is an act of choice that, as Commissioner Barth points out, uh, flies in the face of our standards anyway. So well, we could we could also propose that the paint be removed from the existing house. Kim. Yeah, yes, I Commissioner just, Whitlock. Google, uh, just going back on the Google shots in 2007, it wasn't painted. It wasn't painted even in 2015. Oh, it wasn't painted in 2015? It wasn't painted in. Okay. You know what? I think that it's worth having. 18. I think it's worth having the, having Jesse chime in. So let's open um, and uh, allow Jesse to speak. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things. There are many, many white painted brick homes in that neighborhood and white painted brick porches so that it would be by no means unusual. Um, when you go back to what it, it wasn't painted white, but it was painted because it was painted white in the last three or four years. Before that, it was painted, it was a blue brown, it was, which year is this? June 2000, June 2009, it was painted. It was like a red. Exactly. It was a red paint. So it was painted red. And then later that white part was actually painted a blueish color. So it's been painted for, you know, some extended period of time. Um, the white was just because it looked a lot better than the, you know, dirty brown red that it was painted. All right. Anything else, Jesse? Uh, and, you know, if if it would make people feel better to have non brick columns, um, I could add wood columns because I'd probably be I might not do it at the exact same time, but I wouldn't have a huge problem knocking down those four brick columns that are there and replacing them with white wood <laughs> instead of brick. That's not what we're saying, Jesse. We're in no way saying that. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that rather than rather than yeah. deny the whole thing and, and rather than have two <laughs> none of, none two of those two red brick are... columns next to four white brick <laughs> columns i'd be okay with four white woods thank you for being creative but no <laughs> um well well thank you for that sir so we will reclose and you know uh, jesse talking about all the painted brick you know in the context of his community that's exactly why we should not be allowing painted brick I think this might, I mean, Chrissy brings up a great, great point. You know, there's some, I think we have some, from our perspective, at least we have some time here. It might be wise to ask for the applicant, you know, and, and I've, I've recently discovered with Brett uh, Strum coming in that we have these resources with the state historic preservation mm -hmm. office where there are pictures of these buildings from way back, um, you know, potentially into the eighties to so. You know, seeing how far back maybe this brick was added, it could have been an original thing while it's not common in the community. But I think it's worth a due diligence rather than just blindly going and saying that this is acceptable. Sure, absolutely. Yes, Commissioner Wojcik. Sure. So at the beginning of the last presentation, Jesse was more focused on his garage conversion because of family 
elements if we are kind of stuck on this column situation mm-hmm. is there a way that we could address those two differently so absolutely yeah actually mm-hmm. we can we've done that before that's a great idea okay and this is the first time you're hearing about you're hearing oh yeah time. it's right. it wasn't heard last time. right we didn't hear it last time because the application wasn't complete so um and it to your point we didn't hear it in in that that was why so i think that you're absolutely right commissioner Wojcik. it um no need to hold up the accessory building um while we do a little more due diligence on the porch okay so with that being the case commissioner Wojcik, you want to make a motion sure <laughs> thank you yes. um so i i think that it would be helpful to the homeowner if we broke this into two elements and it sounds like everyone seemed to be comfortable with the accessory building in general with mm-hmm. the changes in the documentation for context and such mm-hmm. yep. okay so um i would like to approve Heather, may i say something yes please the only concern staff has about the accessory structure is the metal door usually on street facing elevations we require that to be wood but yeah and didn't you say that he said that he would be open to whatever we recommend it Mm -hmm. so good sorry to interrupt Mm -hmm. thank you christy okay i know that is listed here somewhere Garage doors. No, that's garage. What are you doors. looking for? We'll help. I was looking for the door specification, but I think that's in new construction. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So um, we would like to approve the scope of work designated for the accessory structure. Um, but with that, we would like to specify that the garage door entry be made out of wood the door be made out of wood and can be worked with staff for final approval and then um do i need a number for that the door yeah six the student construction oh, well, and then, at rehabilitation we're also approving the accessory structure based on 8.10 number three Okay. Right? Or is that new? No. Yeah. Oh, four. Okay. And then the door requirement was based on 4.10. That's rehabilitation. Oh. What about new construction? Construction. For six, chapter six, um, 6.15. Three. Number three. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. 6.15 number three. Construct doors of wood, preferred material, metal clad, fiberglass, or metal doors may also be considered for side and rear doors on new constructions. That does not speak to this one. So it would need to, no, 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 that the, the, the standard does, but the metal clad fiberglass metal would not be right for this. So it would be wood. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. So is that good for the accessory structure? Yeah, it's a new door, a new opening. So I would say so. Okay. Anyone else feel differently? Yeah. Okay. okay. All and right. We would like to continue the roof extension. Sec- why don't, uh, before you Sorry. go on, Commissioner Wojcik, why don't we vote for that one, right? Okay. Because we can split those up. So, uh, motion made, first motion made by Commissioner Wojcik, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Walker, any further discussion of that part of the motion? Nope. Okay, Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Bard? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to approve passes 8-0. Now, second part. Second part for the roof extension, we would like to have a uh, continuation. Um, We would like to have more opportunity for Jesse to work with staff on column opportunities that might 
work with the proposed design. Um, and that would determine history of structure. Yeah, in order to determine the history of the brick painting. Well, that would be 5.5 number three, and the reference to uh, the front porch addition would be 4.8 number four. So the masonry is 5.5 number three, and the porch uh, modification was 4.8. 4.8 number four. And since it's going to be continued, Commissioner Wojcik, for those of us who can't see it, do you mind adding that it would be nice to see it? Please, uh, in the drawings, represent the offset in the roof pitches as they come together with the extension of the existing front porch and the existing side roof line. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Hawkins. Does that also address the uh, distance between the window, the second floor windows and the roof? And document the spacing between the window sill and the top of the roof pitch as it attaches to the house. Okay. All right. Motion made exceptionally well by Commissioner Wojcik. Seconded by? Second. Commissioner Walker. Any discussion of the motion? All right, let's vote. Do, do we yes. want to throw the um, carrot in there for uh, the applicant to work with staff on finding historical photos of this house? Because I'm sure they're documented somewhere. Oh, I didn't, well, I said something Sorry, like yeah. that, but it doesn't mean okay. that it's found. Okay. It meant that to you. Yeah, you need that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought that the beginning, um, that, that was one of my requests because I feel like there's a history there that we can't. I must, I must have missed that. Let's just restate it. Well, with I would like the applicant <laughs> to work with staff to determine history and uh, transition of existing um, structure to determine appropriate solutions to move if, if the client applicant determines to move forward. Okay. That is, that was the way. <laughs> oh. Is that good, Candy? All right. <laughs> All right. Let's vote. That's a motion made by Commissioner Wojcik, seconded by Commissioner Walker. Any discussion of the motion? Further discussion? All right. Let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati, yes. Motion to continue passes 8 0. Thank you, Jesse. All right. Oh, all right. And then next is Angie Lauer, who's been sworn in. Angie, are you with us? I am. I'm here. And Hi, Angie. I have the owner on online as well. Who is the owner? Uh, Justin Davis. Okay, uh, we need to get him sworn in. Yes. Okay, Mr. Davis, if you will, please raise your right hand and to respond, I do to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. And Justin, could you please turn on your video? Uh, I'm using <clears throat> my phone right now. I'm trying to look up. Here we go. Here's video. Okay, this application is for an addition. And it does say tree removal, but in the time that, um, anyway, it was decided not to do tree removal. They are limbing up the tree instead. So, Angie, if you'll just point out that tree when we get to that point, that would be great. Um, there is one tree coming out, but it was dead disease dying and staff approved the removal with replanting. Um, the proposed project is an addition. It's a corner lot. So I've seen on the map visible at the corner of Park Road and East Worthington. There is also a rear alley that the rear yard is accessible to. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Angie. Angie, if you would state your name and your address for the court reporter, please. Okay. Um, Angie Lauer, ALB Design, 901 Berry Hill Road, Suite B1. 
Charlotte 28208. Okay. And Justin, if you would state your name and your address for the court reporter, please. Uh, Justin Davis, 828 East Worthington, uh, Charlotte, NC 28203. Thank you. Angie, I'm on the cover sheet. Would you like me to start with the photos? Um, the photos are great. Uh, so, um, one of the things I just want to start, as you said, so it was agreed upon to limb up the tree so we can get to that. So on slide 7, bottom right hand corner of the slide, um, you'll see that the limbs of the neighbor's tree were overhanging onto the property and they had a mutual agreement to limb up cordially and in a safe manner to protect the tree that was actually sitting on the fence. Um, and both neighbors agreed in a manner, uh, along with Hartwood and AAA uh, the trees to limb the trees to save the tree instead of tree removal. So tree application is off the table on this one. So um, we can move forward with the addition. Um, the original house built in 1914 is a one and a half for one story uh, bungalow. Um, it has original slate roof, which is um, almost unheard of in Delaware that it's still salvaged. Um, the windows are um, six over one um, wood windows. The siding is um, original cedar shake siding, and there's a band below the sill that is lap siding with, again, as Christy said, painted wood brick. Um, the intent is to not change the front elevation, um, although this house being on a corner lot does have two fronts, right? East Worthington and Park, um, and being respectful of both uh, based on the guidelines, doing any addition to the back um, of the house, no taller, no wider, um, and not visible from the street. However, it's a side street, so there will be some visibility from um, park. And the intent is to take the existing side cross gables that are there now. So if you can see on slide seven, um, on the left elevation, which is Park Road, Park, park Avenue face, um, the intent is to extend the gable until it meets the hip of the existing house. And then to do the addition um, in the rear, not extending any of the footprint. So everything would be done on the existing footprint um, of the original house. So the back of the house right now has a flat section of roof. Um, which you can see um, in slide seven, bottom left corner, where it says rear elevation. Um, that section of roof is a flat roof, um, and that's the section that we would be going up. But the addition of the new gable on the rear and the extension of the cross gables on the side do not exceed the ridge height as defined in the Zootwell survey. So, Christy, if you can just go to the Zootwell survey first. And that would be, oh, slide. Do we have it? Well, I don't have it in here. Oh, okay. Well, I have it. <laughs> um, so the height is um, 25 feet, nine inches from grade. Um, and the ridge height is 742.6. The grade is 716.7, and we would not be any taller than the existing um, ridge of the house. And I know that was a concern that we had defined that we would define the ridge height from grade. Um, grade varies, so for us, <clears throat> it's not it's not a fixed point. It's a little bit fluid because grade could change slightly depending on when the survey was taken. Um, but there is a slight measurement discrepancy versus the Zootwell survey discrepancy um, from our calculations and from our measuring, um, which is physical measuring, we have about a nine inch delta um, that even, even with that nine inch delta, and I explained this to Christy in an email, we're still no taller than the ridge of the existing house. Um, so slide nine front elevation you can actually see the two cross gables on the side 
I'm going to go to slide 10, please. So slide 10, you could see that the existing slide gable is still maintained intact based on the Department of Interior standards. And what we're doing is extending that ridge up until it hits the hip of the, um, the original roof. And you can see that in delineated line on slide 10, Christy, on the existing elevation where it, um, that line hits the go up higher right there. So we won't be any taller than the that point on the roof. So it's based on geometry. That point won't change. Um, and that is the spring point to the rear elevation. So if you go to slide 11, so slide 11, you could see um, the addition of the cross gables would be no taller than that point right there. Um, so the addition does have siding. I believe it was mentioned in the staff analysis to possibly change that to cedar shakes, which we would not be opposed to doing. Um, the reason we did that is to really delineate a difference between what was original and what was added, um, but we would certainly not be opposed to in the gable, in the gable only, I think, to maintain cedar shake and only on the shed dormers to do wood lap siding. And that changes there. Um, one of the other notes that was mentioned is the windows on the rear gable to not have the trim intersect with the with the trim of the of the eave. Um, and now that we are changing materials to cedar shade, we can slow, low, lower those windows slightly so that there is no intersection um, or interference um, and still meet egress windows um, to, to meet code. Um, we are matching the same spacing or the mall between the windows as existing, um, as you can see in the windows below. So that doesn't change. Um, the uh, visibility from the street. So um, one of the things that was mentioned was the skylights. And regarding the skylights, I know it says in your in the in our guidelines um, under section six point one three number seven that we would prefer them to not be in a visible location. Um, if and that is the reason they're on the right side and not on the left. Um, it is inner inside street um, behind the front plane of the house in the center section. One of the other thing that's mentioned um, based on section 4.5 number three, that they cannot alter the roof structure. As you know, and it says in the guidelines that they need to be flush. Well, they have to have a curb for waterproofing, so they will stick up about three to four inches, depending on the manufacturer. If it's Velux, it's a four inch flashing curb. So they will need to be about four inches, but they would be per manufacturer's recommendations so that there's no water intrusion. Um, the slate roof would be repaired, patched. Um, they are also salvaging whatever slate comes off the back of the hip um, to be repurposed and reused on the new addition. Um, all window trim, windows to be wood, uh, trim to match, um, the, there, no extended footprint, not seen from the street except for the park road, park avenue side. Um, let me just make sure I've got everything else. And then I ask that if there are any minor revisions, that it could be staff approved on this. Um, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you and see if you have anything else to add. I do not. Uh, you've covered everything. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Christy, do we have anyone on the line wishing to speak for or against this application? No. All right. Commissioners, questions for Angie and Justin. Commissioner Barth. Um. I, I know this house, by the way, uh, I believe it was actually on the Dilworth home tour last year. Um, cute little house. Um, 
Do we know that back portion, which I think is the master bedroom, was was that added on at some point or modified from its original use that you know of, Angie? Yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I don't know when it was added on, but the original, so I guess uh, where the kitchen ends into the master bedroom, which is that back half with the, um, I guess the, the roof over the back corner um, of the top picture there that we're looking at, that was added on. When that was added on, I do not know, but I'd assume it's been there for 50 plus years. It, it, Chris, to answer your question, it, uh, it has a different ceiling height. Um, and in the process of doing this addition, as you can see, we're adding a band of cedar shade to straighten that out. Um, so we actually did a, we did this project in 2014 for a previous owner and it had gone through HDC back in 2014. Um, so my understanding is yes, it was an addition at what date I do not know. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really, I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful project. I don't really have any other questions other than um, I'm a little bit concerned on how this addition connects to the house and the um, continuation or elimination of, of certain roof lines, especially this being on a corner lot. Perhaps you'd like to speak to that a little bit. Sure. So if you um, go to the site plan, Christy, I believe that is slide number eight. So the um, the addition is to the back right corner. So the articulation of the roof. Um, if you can, if you can zoom in on this, Christy, just a tight bit. Um, so Christy, so the hip roofs become gables on the sides, right? So that hip roof actually becomes an extension of the gable while still maintaining a portion of the hip on the back. And the the dormers actually um, create that dynamic of the roof. So connection, if we were not able to bring up to the same boxing height, this would not be achievable. So um, our extension is where the gable line hits the hip um, at that point. So it is the simplest of roof construction and, you know, um, destruction of what's there. So it's the simplest of roof forms in our opinion. I, I understand completely. And I think, I think it's well executed. My only concern is how, um, how that responds to our guidelines. Let me see this section. I can't recall. Call 6.20 number 11, or excuse me, number three would be a good start. We have the building attaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, essentially, we have the complete back portion of this house, houses, roof, historic roof being, you know, touched in some way. Um, Only a small portion. So 50%, if you look at where this flat roof section was, there's only a portion of it. So if we were adding a dormer on a hip roof, it would be in a, because we don't want to side load it to park road, um, you know, keeping additions to the inner side of the lot, a dormer would have been, could have been easily added on a hip roof on the back. And so the flat roof section is the part that you're articulating as maybe being difficult, but that's not even part of the original even though it's 50 or plus years old, the house is 99 years old, built in 1914. Um, and one of the things that we feel is to meet the Department of Interior Standards is if this addition were removed, could the house be brought back to its original form? And the, in my opinion, the answer is yes. You remove the shed dormers and you remove the gable, you still have the hip roof intact. While inside, obviously it's being renovated, but um, that roof, the, the main dynamic and the architecture of the roof stays intact. So we're still keeping the side gables, right? So if you go to slide 10, side gables are still maintained. We're not 
touching the side gables. You're, have, you're doing an extension, so you still follow the same gable line, which is the hip line. So that side gable is intact. So if somebody were to remove that gable 100 years from now, you still have the hip roof that's underneath. And if somebody were to remove the dormers on the back, you still have the, the main body of the house. And I think that's one of the things that's most important is we're not trying to add a full second story. I mean, these are only eight foot ceilings, you know, actually five and a half foot plate height or six foot plate heights on these um, on the on the shed dormers that are on the back. So if you were to cover up the I mean, the addition, you can still see the main house. The main house has not been, you know, swallowed up by an addition. Thank you. And I feel the way Chris does, um, Angie, about the roof forms. I just keep hearing a uh, former commissioner, uh, Damon Rumpsch, saying uh, in my head, you know, bungalows are simple. They're quite simple. And the roof form should be simple. So, but you've explained it. So I just wanted to get that out there. The proposed rear elevation on slide number 11, um, I know you spoke to this. I just want to bring it up again. The um, Double gang windows that are in the um, in in the gable dormer, they are in the gable lens. They are larger than the um, primary level, and so I'm wondering if uh, it's possible for you to 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 make those smaller. So um, you're talking about the little windows that are in the back room versus the windows that the original windows. So if you look at the original windows, they're all six feet tall. Yeah. So I'm looking at slide 11. The yes, this one that we're on now, the proposed rear elevation. So I'm looking at the two windows. They're not original windows below. I'm sorry. So the original windows on the house are all six feet. So slightly to the right, Chris, if you move your cursor, that's the original right. window. Right. But however, this. Uh, this addition that you're adding has larger windows in the gable lens than it does on the main level. So whether they're original or not, that, you know, it creates a situation that is not uh, ideal, right? So I, it's going to, I'm going to bring it up in deliberation. I felt like you should sure. speak to it now. Yeah, yeah. it can be modified um, as long as they meet egress. Um, I don't have a problem making them smaller. Um, not at all. If they need to be a casement that appears like a double hung, as long as it meets egress, not should not be an issue. I wouldn't let that, um, you know, tail wag the dog. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we close? If I may say one one more thing, um, absolutely yes. You know, and I look at this, and you know, I look at the rear elevation and some of the other projects that are similar on the street that have been done, um, and even other projects that we've submitted where we actually try to raise the ridge. Um, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example: was two thousand um, Charlotte Drive, where we raised the ridge, corner house, ideal way, and um, you know, not far from here where we raised the ridge 30 inches in order to get a second story or some livable space on, on a one and a half story house. This house, because it has, um, you know, it, it is on a corner, it is original. We're not doing that. We're keeping that existing ridge. Um, so like with the, with the Baker Knox house, um, you know, we, we tried to manipulate that roof on a corner lot and it was approved. A similar situation, shed dormer, gable on the back, um, you know, very, very comparable to this. And this, with respect to the main ridge, we're below it. Um, we're still well below the main ridge of this house. And so I just ask that that be considered um, in your deliberation so that you know they could gain some you know a little bit of livability without extending the footprint without making too many changes without doing dormers on the front and without sure. raising the ridge 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Angie. Justin, anything you want to add before we close? Nope. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We will now close for deliberation. All right. Commissioners. Yes. Commissioner Wojcik. I, I always enjoy seeing Angie's solutions uh, as a designer. She's very creative and the way that she works with our guidelines, I think is wonderful. Um, I, for some particular reason, I'm torn on this one. And I don't know if it's just because the existing bungalow has a hip a roof as its dominant roof line. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's part of me thinks it's a great design. And then part of me just kind of looks at it and goes, hmm, what what is it about the guidelines that we always talk about that's making me kind of question. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, and that's not usual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, is this a simple roof? It does to my to my eye, it doesn't appear simple. So I know Angie um, shared how it's simple from her perspective. She's the designer. So will you, can you translate that? The modifications that she are, she's making to the existing roof structure in itself is simple concept. What we're looking at with the combination of gables and hips and sheds is what oh my. you're seeing. Yes. <laughs> so from an architectural standpoint, I very much understand what she's saying and the way that she's achieving it. Yes, but I can. And that's where my complex is, is that I can see what you're saying at the same time. Um, for what she is trying to do and for the design and what she always does, it, it is a good solution. Um, but it almost seems like there's just an element that's making it more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah, and it's so hard to look at it and think, or, uh, you know, to Angie's point, and I'm paraphrasing, but it could be worse. Like, it could, yeah, you know, it's like, that's not the reason I would say yes. Commissioner Bell? You know, and I'm not an architect, so I, I appreciate the complexity and, and always love to see Angie before us. Um, but one of the things that I had written down is that when I was going through the designs and recognizing the neighborhood and the corner lot, it almost, it did feel like I was looking not so much a, at an addition to complement the space, but something absolutely different. Mm -hmm. So I did go back to chapter six and, mm -hmm. and, and look it over. Um, what points did you bring up in chapter six when you did that commissioner bell? Like, what were you leaning on? Just the complexity of it. It mm -hmm. doesn't feel, it's not to me, the simplified bungalow, the spirit of that. Mm -hmm. Although also after hearing Angie and I'm not a designer, but hearing what she had to say, trying to address the different elements of the design and what you know the goal of the of the applicant but if i separate that and i just look at the design standards still worth the corner lot what the homes the the context of the surrounding area i don't look at this design as something that supports that. Right. And you know we learn from all of the commissioners that have been on this um, board and have moved on to other things. And I just keep hearing Commissioner Rumpsch say a bungalow is simple in its design. A bungalow is simple in its design. And, you know, um, I feel like if we presented that the idea that, you know, this is we we're trying to achieve a lot and this is this is really good compared to what we could be bringing you like that's not enough of a reason to say. Um, yes to it. And the question that I had um, for 6.20, number three, the whole idea, and Angie addressed it, right? Angie always, she's a great uh, designer and salesperson. Um, the, what she, she addressed the fact that you could take these uh, components away and still have the original house. Um, and I, 
it's difficult for me to wrap my mind around that, even with the eloquent way in which she um, explained it. I just, I don't see that being the case. Um, I'd have to contort my mind to see that as being the case. And so, um, because she's so talented, I believe that there are other options that we can be looking at. There are, I mean, this is the first time we've seen this one. And so, I would love to see some other options um, because I do not think that this is a simple bungalow anymore. Commissioner Walker. Yeah, I agree to mo most of what's been said. And and to Chris's point, I, I don't see the reversibility of this, even though Angie did her best to explain it. And I guess that gets reinforced for me when I look at the rear elevations the existing and proposed, I have a real hard time looking at those trying to establish how, in fact, you could reverse this. But I agree with the uh, complexity of form of this and how it's adapting this bungalow in a, in a direction I'm not sure is a good idea. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Anything that has not already been stated? So it doesn't sound like we are saying yes to this. So what are we saying? Commissioner Hawkins? It sounds to me, I didn't want to repeat what was already said, is that the roof form seems complicated and that it needs to be restudied. Mm -hmm. um, even looking at additions, um, the illustrations on 6.22, I get that not trying to extend the footprint and all, um, but that's what we recommend with additions is to put them, attach them to the rear of the home in a quite simple manner. So um, perhaps, you know, the advice would be to restudy and, and to take a look at the direction um, that's given in the standards. I think that's a great start to a motion, Commissioner Hawkins. <laughs> All right, we'll work as a team. I think that that's a great start. Um, Commissioner Whitlock, I heard you breathe deeply, like there's something you want to say. <laughs> uh, actually, I thought what Commissioner Hawkins said was spot on. I mm -hmm. think that's, that's what we need to do. Okay, so Commissioner Hawkins is going to start us off in a motion to yeah, I'd like to make a motion to continue this application to restudy the roof forms. Uh, to restudy the addition based on chapter six, page standard six dot two zero. Mm -hmm. And to take a look also at the illustrations on six dot two two. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you want to take them to uh, 6.23 and 6.242 or? Yes, 6.23 and 6.24. Mm hmm. And then um, if we're looking. We're looking at roof forms, there's a. There's standards in here that speak to that in that 6.13. And. Standard 6.13 for roof forms. Mm -hmm. Anything else we need to add, team? Uh, number 6.13, number 1 through 3. And then I'd like to also add 6.11 for directional expression. Yep. 6.13, numbers 1 through 3. 1 through 3, and 6.11 directional expression. Um, how do you all feel about the skylights? They're pretty visible. You don't think they will be in real life? Mm hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. Sure that the skylights will be truly visible. I mean, Angie might be able to give us a better perspective um, from the street, but mm -hmm. the elevation of them, I, I just feel like that's not really a 
personal well and chris has seen the house in person and experienced it from the street so he might i think uh for those of us who are not gifted like you um it would be nice to get that perspective yeah yeah mm -hmm. just to confirm and so angie's hearing this conversation and do you mind adding that to the Absolutely. list okay and to for the applicant to add a street view of the skylight mm -hmm. the perspective from the street view uh, per 6.13 number uh seven per 6.13 number seven okay all right um any other friendly amendments mm -hmm. okay all right so motion made by commissioner hawkins seconded by second commissioner bell uh any further discussion of the motion all right, let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to continue passes 8 0. Thank you, Angie. Would Thank you, Justin. Be opposed to like a 10 minute break before I we think so. with number 7 1706? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you.
Okay, we're back with application number. Oops. Oh, I got to pull it up. Number seven. And the applicants are here with us in the room. So the first thing we need to do is get everyone sworn in. All right. You've been sworn in. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> been sworn in a couple of times but yeah but. probably okay <laughs> all right well with that the proposal is the installation of a new front porch with a trellis and some fenestration changes to a previously infilled side porch so the applicants are here they have also provided additional information i will pull that up starting on slide Starting on slide 28 of the supplement, there's some more information about some responses to the staff memo. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the applicants. Please state your names and your addresses for the court reporter, please. Ann Warren, 1706 Dilworth Road East, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28203. My name is Vital Balawader, and the address is 1706 Dilworth Road East, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And the map shows the location right between East Boulevard and Isleworth. And slide six is the front of the house showing existing conditions. So with that, please um, speak loudly and let me know what slide you'd like. They're listed behind you. Okay, sounds great. Thanks very much. So if you can move on to the next slide. So basically what we're proposing to do here we're proposing three things. So we're proposing to remove some wooden siding that was placed um, on the house in the 1970s. We're proposing to replace that with um, full panel uh, glass doors. We're asking to put a front porch on the house and we're asking to put essentially a pergola over that porch. And um, you can see the, uh, the existing condition of the house the front, the rear, the right, the left, you can see from the front, the rear and the right elevations. Those are the 3 impacted elevations for this project. And you can see the wood that someone put over an old screened in porch in the 1970s. So it's very unsightly and we would like to fix this. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the rear elevation. There is 1 existing um, door that is used for ingress and egress 1 brick staircase and you can see the uh, wooden siding that someone put up in the 1970s. This is um, the side elevation It's technically the right elevation again. Um, this was put up over essentially an old screen and porch. These are pictures of the old screen and porch. So um, the family that we bought the house from lived in the house for 60 years. They gave us these photos and you can see on the right side of the house, um, that was their screen and porch. So um, in the existing op brick openings, there were essentially full screens. And this is just another um, picture from the 1970s of that screen and porch. Uh, context adjacent structures, just real briefly, we're basically in a um, residential area in Dilworth. We're on um, uh, Dilworth Road East. Uh, residential houses flank our house on all sides and across the street. There's one funeral home that's a couple of houses away from us on the corner of East Boulevard and Dilworth Road East. Uh, site plan existing versus proposed, you can just see there um, in the bottom right where Christy is showing the um, hexagonal structure or the dotted lines. That's the idea for the new porch location. So we're not changing the existing footprint of the house in terms of uh, the location of the house, uh, the roof line. Uh, we're simply uh, trying to replace the, the wooden boards that were put up um, and then put a front porch and a pergola over it. Um, so the front elevation, that's the only elevation that can be seen from the street. Um, all other elevations are not visible from the street. And you can see here on the right, um, we are proposing a porch. And one of the questions uh, we got from staff was dimensions of the porch. So the porch is um, two feet high by 10 feet deep by 21 feet wide. Um, it's going to be made out of brick. Um, our house has existing brick that's called rake face brick, and um, we are going to use that exact same brick um, for the porch. 
the pergola is essentially going to be made out of white wood with some steel I-beams flanked in wood so that you can't see the steel. And then the um, existing openings that had been for the old screen and porch, which are now boarded up by wood, we are seeking to replace those with essentially full panel glass doors. So 80% of the door is glass, 20% is wood, and the wooden part is clad in metal because these are exterior facing doors. So for um, wood rot, mold, mildew, um, best that they be encased in metal for exterior facing doors. Um, the left elevation, really no changes there. And then the rear elevation, you can see we're trying to um, remove the one existing door and replace it with another door that will be operable, that will open and close for ingress and egress. On the right side, in place of the uh, wood that was put in the 1970s, we're seeking to replace it with another of the same full panel glass doors. This one will be fixed. We will surround the doors by um, white wooden trim to match the existing white wooden trim that um, currently flanks all of the openings uh, for the windows in the home. In the rear elevation, there is a set of brick stairs. And one question we got was, will the brick stairs be um, altered or enlarged in any way? No, they will not. We will not touch the um, brick stairs. They will remain as they are. The right elevation shows um, the wooden boards being removed, being replaced again by four. These will be four doors. They'll all be fixed doors. Um, the same style doors that will be used on the front elevation and the rear elevation. Again, they'll be surrounded by white trim to match the existing white trim that surrounds all of the openings for the windows in the home. On the next slide, that shows the street um, scape elevation. And as you can see, we're not we're not changing the footprint of the house or the roof line or anything like that. You will be able to see the changes that we're proposing from the streetscape because the front elevation is the only elevation of the house that's being able to be seen by the street. Um, this is architectural details of the doors that I mentioned. Again, they're about 80% glass. The remaining 20% is wood. The wood is uh, wrapped in metal. Um, and some of the window, or I'm sorry, some of the doors that I mentioned will be ingress, egress, the two in the front and the one in the rear, uh, the remainder will be fixed. Additional architectural details about the pergola and the front porch. Um, one important thing to note, what we did is we tried to find examples in the neighborhood of each of these three elements of the project, right? So for the porch, we thought, what other houses have porches? Well, on both sides of our house, both of those houses have porches and there's lots of other examples of porches in the neighborhood. But then for the pergola, we thought who else has pergolas? We drove around the neighborhood, we found the three pergolas in our neighborhood and the one that this historic district commission most recently approved in 2018 is on located at 1015 East Boulevard. We are copying their exact same pergola. Nothing is different about our pergola to their pergola. It is the same size. It is the same materials. We structured ours exactly after theirs because we knew they got approval and we wanted to do something similar. So this is architectural details of the pergola in the porch. And so then moving on, I just did a quick slide about the guidelines. Um, we tried to adhere really well to the guidelines and I tried to point out which of the guidelines I thought fit and which of them didn't fit. Um, the next slide again, just shows some of the examples of each of the three elements of our project from the neighborhood. So the first one is porches, both of the houses on either side of 1706 Dilworth Road East already have porches. Um, the pergola, like I mentioned, this is just a quick snapshot of the pergola that we would like to duplicate. And then um, sunrooms that have full panel glass. I gave one example there at the bottom, but further on in your materials that you have, I created a whole separate little presentation showing there are uh, five houses in the neighborhood that have uh, full panel glass sunrooms. Uh, Dilworth Road West, Dilworth Road East, Dilworth Road, Lexington Avenue, and Dilworth Road. I have pictures of the inside and the outside of each one of those homes just to show that uh, these are uh, possible and they are existing in the current historic neighborhood. Um, so not proposing anything novel or unique here really. 
Um, and then the final thing I might um, just point out to you, I know right before the meeting I checked and staff had some questions and I created a supplement and I tried to provide responses to each one of the questions. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to end my presentation and I would be happy to entertain any questions that you have for me about our proposed project. Okay, perfect. Well, first we have to see if there's anyone on the line. There's not. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think that what you're doing is bringing the house back more into compliance with what we did before. The challenge is the precedent that the pictures you provided, those are like, they're not doors, right? They're windows all around. And with that being the case, there's a lot more glass than there is solid space, which is a particular challenge that I have with the project. You said 80, 20 to glass to solid. <clears throat> if you take a look at, um, for example, here, it's a lot more glass, right? Because then you, even though it's enclosed and it's not really exactly what we want, um, it still adds, there's still pedestrian interest that's created with more glass, right? And so it will come up in deliberation um, and I'll let you speak to it now. Yeah, thanks for that. So Vitek, did you have a comment? Go ahead. Okay, um, so I think that example is a good example of a house that has a lot of glass. I think in some of the other examples that we pointed out, they have less glass, which is more similar to what we're proposing in our example. So if you look at 2121 Dilworth Road West, um, that looks like in terms of the space above the window and below the window, it would actually have um, less space that's available to be seen from the street through windows. And I'm going to guess that that is a very old, um, that is not something that we've recently approved. I, I could ask Christy. I think it's probably at least 40. Okay. So that, uh, that is not one that we'd be looking to. And then I have 1529 Dilworth Road East. Again, um, quite a lot of glass, but they also have quite a lot of partitions in their glass. And then they have more brickwork in the middle than I'm proposing for this particular project. That's just another example. Mm -hmm. uh, 1210 Dilworth Road, the one you pointed out, yes, that has more glass. Um, so there are some that have more glass, that there are some that have less glass. Um, I think ours is pretty similar to 1010 Lexington Avenue. Um, that has quite a bit of glass, but is also surrounded by these look like to me, they look like fixed panel doors, almost kind of like what we're proposing in our project. That's 1010 Lexington mm -hmm. Avenue. And you can uh, see it if you look at the interior picture. Also still windows, no doors yet. Do you have any precedent for that? I, I can't tell from this picture if these are fixed panel doors or if they're actually windows. I don't see any muntins or ability to open these, so I'm not sure if they're doors or windows. You can't tell from the pictures, I don't think. The majority of the panels will be using as, new as windows, mic. they will be fixed. Will you please speak into the mic because the people at home need to hear you too. Sorry, the majority of the panels we'll be using, they will be fixed anyhow. Mm -hmm. So they will be used more like windows, only the door at the front and only the door at the mm -hmm. back. Will open. And, and just so that you know, the door at the front is really, really important, right? It's a primary facade. So right. just something to consider. Commissioner Walker. Thank you. Um, uh, this is a lovely house. I, I pass it probably every day. And I wondered if if you considered, in what, what struck me is seeing the pictures of the original house with the porch whether or not you would have been able to um, do something like what you'd like to do, but but that would return this house so that when you looked at it, you would know, oh, that was the original screened in porch because you're changing the opening. So what you're doing is kind of, you know, you're, you're, you might be interrupting the original design of the home. And since, and since you're now in a position to correct that, I wonder if you would consider going more in that direction to provide what it is that you want, which is a, a room with, with glass doors, wind, doors or windows, and 
have it done in such a way that the house appears that it used to have a screened in porch, but now it's, you know, now it's enclosed in, in some other capacity. Because the, the other issue I think that that concerns me is matching up all the brick since you're changing the opening of the front, you will have a scenario where you're going to have to um, add additional brick, it looks like. Is that correct? Is it because if I look at your slide number 14, mm -hmm. it looks like the opening is, is changing. Opening is changing a little bit, not yeah. much, but it does change a little bit. It's we getting smaller, have... so you'll have to actually add some brick to accommodate that change, yes. right? And we do have original brick yeah. from houses that were taken down at East Boulevard, where the big apartment complex is being built. So we have the brick that matches exactly the brick that was used at our house. It looks exactly the same, and it comes from the same ha similar houses built at the same time. Yeah, I guess I'm 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 just looking at this thinking that there might be a way where this could be done in such a way that would more align the house with what it wants to be over there, which was in a, a screened in porch. Also there. If I can just point out one thing, the picture at the top is stretched more than the picture at the bottom. So it does appear that there is a bigger difference in the openings. To follow up on that, um, in our standards 4.14, uh, <clears throat> number 14, just the one I landed on, there are others, match window replacements to the height and width of the original openings. So um, we would not be doing that. You all are coming further away from, um, you're getting closer to that, but uh, however, you are changing the height and width of the original openings. We are by a small amount. We are. It doesn't say by a small amount or not. It just says, you know. I know. Just, okay. Acknowledged. Okay. Thank you. But it's uh, almost impossible to replace it to the exact same size unless we went back with screens. Any windows are going to add bulk, right? Because you've got to have space for the outside of the windows. So I can't. I can't replace screens with the exact same size glass. That's, that's not possible. Fair. That's it's absolutely not possible. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. But we can get closer than the doors that you currently have. This is generally very, this is not that far away, really, from, in my opinion. Okay. Any other, uh, Commissioner Wojcik? Um, I just have a question about why you um, kind of, want to propose a, a porch um, kind of in front of your existing house. I know your neighbors have porches, but their architecture is of a, a different style. Um, kind of what is your purpose of creating this new pergola patio to the front of the existing architecture? Yeah, so I mean, our, our purpose is really just to create a new front porch because our house doesn't have a front porch and the houses surrounding us did. We know that the architecture is different, but the the people before us in the 1970s took the screen and porch and they made it an enclosed, heated, cooled space. So we want to continue with the heated and cooled space since it was already enclosed before us. The easiest thing for us to do is maintain that, but bring it back to look more like the historical character of the house by adding doors with as much glass as we could possibly find. But also because these doors are in the front, they're actually going to serve as essentially French doors. They're going to open inward and we'd like to have a patio in the front in order to be able to kind of make a more usable space to enjoy the front yard a little bit more than it is. And we'd like a pergola for a little bit of sunshade. Thank you. If I might just offer some um, advice. Um, I think what a lot of us are struggling with is one, the the types of um, what well, we do appreciate y'all are taking it more into keeping with the original intent of the house. I think there may be a solution here, you know, again, can't design it for you, but, you know, a combination of either windows, doors, uh, side lights to these doors, 
to maintaining those existing openings while, you know, creating, you know, recreating that open porch feel and providing more airiness to it. Um, I think, you know, if, if, if we have, again, historic examples, we don't always want to look towards historic examples of, you know, how some of these porches were enclosed or these little winter porches were enclosed in certain manners. Um, you know, we're going to look at, you know, how, what you do to this enclosed porch response to the windows on the existing house too. So we want to, you know, look to the, the features that you have in your existing house house and try to, um, marry the two together so that it's, uh, cohesive. So are you saying maybe in front, instead of the doors, put windows? Yes. But how would you crawl out the window onto the porch then? So you, I'm not, again, can't design it for you. There could be one door, there could be two doors, there could be side lights. I think what oh. most of us are getting at here is that, you know, having to add brick to this is just adding another layer of complexity that honestly, um, this project might not need, you know, not going to be the, you know, not going to tell you how we would rule on it, but um, I think maintaining that brick opening is going to be fairly important. Um, and how you do it is, is really up to you guys, uh, but important. I think it needs further study than, than what we have here. Yeah. If that's important, I think we can add a side light. Yeah. I mean, side lights will just add more wooden take away from the glass, but we're happy to add them if you guys want them. We tried to add full panel glass doors because we're trying to get as much glass in there. But if you want to put us in a position to put in side lights, we can. Or or some of the other examples where we had full glass panels, you know, put a door in and then the rest is full glass panels. Again, I, I don't think that, I mean, there's more than one way to do this. Um, but as it stands right now, I think there's, you know, I haven't seen any historic examples where they're using fixed doors to enclose these spaces. I've seen some. Uh, examples in the recent past where they've enclosed these, um, but you know, I'd, I'd challenge you guys to to look for different ways to to mending, you know, to bring this back into keeping with what it was. Yeah, I think if we can maintain the doors and put some side lights, that would be okay with us. Please don't take Commissioner's Barth's. Uh, Commissioner Barth's suggestions as this is how you do it. He's just trying to give you some ideas of how you can bring it more in compliance than what you have now. As one commissioner, I'm going to be looking for more glass. We waited five months to get here, so I just want approval. This is the last project we have in our house renovation, so it's really holding us up. So. Um, appreciate the comments, and if we have to amend and come back, I guess we will. Disappointing. All right. So, any other questions or comments, commissioners? All right. Anything outside of that? I yeah. don't have anything. Thank you. And you, sir? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. We will now close for deliberation. All right. Who wants to start? Um, I could start. Okay. What one of the several issues that concerns me about this project is just the presence of this pergola and its size in relation to the house. It's probably half the width of the house, and it does seem to impact in a very large way the street presence. I think you said that it was. 21 feet by 10 feet deep. Yeah, so I'm assuming that's not going to um, impact your um, front yard setback regulations at all. They're right? closed. Oh. We're closed, so maybe. Oh, I'm sorry. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would be that. Right off the bat, just the overall size of it in relation to the house itself is a concern for me. And the precedent of that kind of pergola on a front house in that manner. Right, because what they use is precedent, different house, different measurements, different, different, different. Um, so, uh, yes, Commissioner Barth. I might, you know, granted this is totally different house context, you know, whatever, different architectural style, but we, you know, to 
counterpoint, not saying that this is absolutely a thing, but um, house on plaza, the plaza we put a pergola and porch on, I think it was an American small house. I think it was a ranch house. Yeah. Yeah, you did that, but it was the different type of architecture that they already had a porch and you were just adding the pergola. You did add one at, um, was it 808 Woodruff, but it's smaller. It's about half oh, the size. Yeah, and completely was, different Yeah, it was about half the size and different mm -hmm. architecture. Uh, and what about putting a porch in front of a porch? In the chimney, mm -hmm. the impact to the chimney. Absolutely. So, I mean, there, there's the porch in front of the porch. Um, there's the impact to the chimney. There, the, there's the use of fixed doors that are incongruous. Um, that's just a start. Commissioner Hawkins. Um, it reminds me of a rear patio. It doesn't seem appropriate for a primary elevation of a home. There are a number of standards that are right here for everyone to read um, that goes against this. Point eight, six point one five, number four and five. Mm -hmm. Four point one four, number fourteen. Um, Commissioner Wojcik, you were going to say something. This just it, the style the, of is your, architecture. Is your um, it is on. okay. This style of architecture was incorporated the porches under the roof line with the brick columns. I mean, that was part of the architecture. So they're transitioning their porch into something else, which I understand, but then to add another porch that doesn't match that style of architecture at all. Secretary seems, of Interior Standards 2.5. It doesn't seem appropriate for scale um, and then attaching the foundation of the brick to the existing brick, just there are just a lot of elements that make it stand out as not being an integrated part of the architecture. Or incongruous. Incongruous. Okay. Well, we want to make sure that we're getting to everyone on our agenda. So let's make a, a motion. Okay. Who wants to take it? Commissioner Wojcik, you're on a roll. I'd like to continue this application because the proposed design is incongruous with the existing architecture of the structure and the context that has been presented is not consistent with the proposed details. We have, we love the idea that the porch is going to potentially be more of a porch again, but it needs to be done in a way that does more match an open aired porch or a screened porch. And the idea of the porch in front of a porch architecturally should be designed, should be reconsidered. Mm -hmm. And this, the standards are? 4.8. Chris wrote them down. 4.8. Number three. 4.8. Number three. And five. And five. Also, I would probably reference the images on 4.9. Okay. Then the images on 4.9 to help windows with examples of appropriate transition 
designs for enclosing porches. And 4.14 number 14. And 4.14 number 14. And number 18. 4.14 4 number 18. And Secretary of the Interior Standards. And the Secretary of Interior Standards 2.5. Yeah. No, 2, 3, 9, and 10, I think is, I don't know what 2.5 is. Oh, oh, sorry. Two, oh, it's just this page. Oh, two, page. 2.5. Okay. Yeah. I, what you just, what, what, what just happened? You yeah, will you, will you just restate the motion, please? Now that you have standards to add. <laughs> we are continuing this project based on the incongruous design elements presented. We would like a restudy of the porch conversion and a restudy of the new porch and pergola design based on standards for porches 4.8 4. 3 3 and 5 number but 3 and number 5 4.8 number 3 and number 5 remember we have candy typing okay and and 4.9 images for reference And for 14, number 14 and 18. <laughs> and the 2.5 Secretary of, of Interior Standards. Mm -hmm. um, and this can fall into Secretary of Interior Standards. The chimney on this house is a distinctive feature. The pergola and the porch um distort it all right so we have a motion any other standards that we want to add to help the applicants um so that um we have a better situation when they come back does somebody recall offhand um the section with uh um windows to complement main structure added windows to yep hold on the style and proportion mm -hmm. yeah. it should be in rehabilitation oh yeah we just used that one because there's one a b c d but additions i think it was 4.14 number 18. was it Maybe? Can we speak? We can we speak into the mic? Everything we say needs to be recorded. I, would think that's a, I think it's six point one five, number one A, yep. A through D. Yes. Um, uh, it in potentially even six point one five number two. Respect the traditional design of openings. For instance, openings are generally recessed on a masonry building while the element is surrounded by raised trim on a frame building. New openings that are flush with the rest of the wall are not allowed. Um, may I also offer 4.14, number 14, match window replacements to the height and width of the original openings? I think they have that one. Okay. I gave that one earlier. Okay. Uh, Okay, another one. Yeah. Uh huh. Four point ten number two, which speaks to um, using stock doors with details that might provide a false sense of historical accuracy. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so motion made by did commission. You, did you get four point ten number four? Mm. Do not reduce or enlarge entrances or door openings. 
Yeah, 4.10 number four. And 4.10 number four. Okay. So there are a plethora of standards for which this is continued. Um, in order to make the best use of everyone's time, I strongly recommend uh, reaching out to staff who can help guide you so that you don't have to wait much longer. Okay, we're here to help and um, that's what we want to try and do. Okay. All right. So motion made by commissioner Wojcik seconded by. Second commissioner Barth any further discussion of the motion. All right, let's vote. Commissioner wheat. Yes. Commissioner Whitlock. Yes. Commissioner Hawkins. Yes. Commissioner Barth. Yes. Commissioner Wojcik. Yes. Commissioner Walker. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Parati. Yes. Motion to continue passes 8 0. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next application is 1921 Russell Avenue, and I believe our applicant has joined us online this time. So, Chris, are you with us? Yes, I am. I got food in my mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, why not, while you finish chewing, we're going <laughs> to you in and get everything pulled up. Sounds good. I have ice in my mouth. Yeah, that was, I was in um, some popsicle. So right there with you, Chris. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm good. Are you good? I'm good. Good afternoon, right. everybody. If you will, please raise your right hand and respond. I do to the following question. Do you affirm the information and testimony you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. And for this, and if you if you will, please turn on your uh, camera. Uh, yes, start video. And um, we're turning this application over to Jenny to lead since it's an after the fact. Sorry. Okay. Hi, Chris. Yeah, good afternoon, Jane. Um, we need you to state your name and address for the court reporter, please. My name is Chris Ogunrinde. I live at 225 Victoria Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28202. Um, so this case is an after the fact, but it's to be treated as though nothing has happened. And um, we are looking at the a replacement front door and um, when a window, a change in the windows on the front of the house. Uh, other work had been previously approved on this house, but these are the two items that we're looking at. So, Chris, I'm going to um, take it down to this slide. Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, just tell me which slide you need and we'll go from there. I think we can just stay uh, with this slide. Okay. Yeah. Do I need to basically speak to why we're here? Yes. So, <clears throat> prior to, uh, first, thank you for the time. Prior to purchasing this property, um, we were uh, approached by a uh, real estate agent that the previous owner had passed away and had um, granted the property to uh, his daughter who lived out of town and had been sitting, the house had been sitting for many, many, I mean, maybe over a year or so. Uh, while it was sitting, um, the house uh, had been vandalized and because they, they shut it down with all the belongings in there. I guess people, their grands thought that uh, they could just break in and, and steal things, even though they weren't much to, to be stolen. So while they were doing that, the doors uh, and the window uh, uh, were damaged. Uh, originally, it was uh, vinyl sided. That's the, the current look here is uh, vinyl siding. And, um, and so upon peeling that off, we uncovered uh, that is, it had some original uh, wood lap side in, in great condition, uh, which we went ahead and restored. Um, 
the challenge was that we could not restore the door and the uh, the window that was damaged. But what we did was uh, for the window, we basically um, took uh, most of the parts that we could and created a, a smaller window and framed the rest of it and uh, provided uh, uh, siding over over the uh, the rest of it. The door uh, was we just it was damaged beyond repair, so we had to buy uh, something. Uh, we couldn't find exact uh, pattern of door, so we changed it to what's currently there now. Um, and that's really and and that got us in trouble. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Christy, do we have anyone on the line wishing to speak for or against this application? No, no callers. Okay, so commissioners questions of Chris. Yes, commissioner wheat. Um, so you had mentioned, you know, unfortunately, there's not evidence for us to see the damage from the door from the photo that's provided. It's well, speaking for myself, it's not easy to tell that the door was damaged beyond repair yeah. um, and that I think will come up in deliberation yes. um, for the window. So, and you said you had this on the application though. So the window, you did take parts from what was the original. So essentially, and again, I think this will come up in deliberation. It was almost like the opening was sacrificed to salvage original window parts. Exactly. The glazing. Okay. Uh, the mittens and all of that is original, um, and that was the only section that uh, we were able to salvage to make it a smaller window. Okay, thank you. That was my only question. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Wheat. Um, Chris, you know we have a number of standards here yes. that speak to the preservation of doors, the preservation of windows, the preservation of openings. It's going to be very difficult for me as one commissioner to bless any of this, regardless of the reasons behind it. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like it's an opportunity now for you to speak to the standards and the violation of the standards um, before we get into deliberation and start talking about it for you. Well, I I, I think um, and unfortunately we didn't we didn't document the damage, and I think that's where we um, we we were at fault because uh, I this it's hard for me to prove it that it was damaged. Uh, and then I asked uh, staff, so now that we are here, what do we, how do we solve this issue? Um, or, yeah. uh, if I can find, if I can find a door to replace this one, I would love to be uh, directed to where I can find it. Uh, if, if they can find a window of this kind that we can, if you guys want me to punch the wall back out and, and uh, put an old window back, I don't know if it serves um, I mean, the community room behind this window is actually, this window is more appropriate for the room inside. And although that, that window was bigger, uh, it's a very, very tiny house. The, the entire house is only eight, less than 800 square feet. And, uh, so, uh, it, it actually on the tax rate shows two, two bedroom, one bed, it's actually three very tiny rooms. So, um, I'll, I'll want to hear what your recommendation is, uh, okay. then maybe we can figure out how to get there. Okay, that's fair. Thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner Hawkins. Um, hi, Chris. I'm happy to hear you say that you're open. Sounds like I'm hearing you say you're open to um, some ideas. And Christy, I don't know if this is appropriate, but do we have recommendations for places like salvage materials from other um, properties that could possibly be used to make the opening more uh, or closer to what it was before or what it was before. I don't know that we have many of those resources here in Charlotte. 
you know, the Put your mic on. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little yeah. further away. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if maybe like salvage antique places like Gibson Mill, um, any places in Charlotte, surrounding counties, um, but we don't have like there's not a nonprofit or anything here that focuses on salvage. Um, Habitat sometimes has a lot of salvage things, but it's anyone's guess if they can find a match. Um, what we have done is it's possible to like rebuild a window to match um, existing or find a window, a new window that matches existing mm -hmm. to install. Okay. I'm gonna order them with the same style. Yeah, I, as one commissioner, I would be inclined, thank you, Christy, I would be inclined to um, that being the resolution um, to the situation because, you know, we have the standards that are very specific to not changing the configuration of windows and openings on um, historic homes. So um, I'm happy to hear you say you're you're open to ideas. So that's my position. Thank if you. I may, am I allowed to say yes, something? Yes, you, you are. Yes, sir. If I may, uh, I will. I will have felt that you guys would rather the originality of the of the structure being in place rather than me introducing a um, a new window just because it looks like the old window. Um, oh. and, and I and that's I'm I'm a little kind of. I don't want to argue, but I'm, I just don't know why that that's more valid versus restoring the materials of an old window to make something similar to. But but I'll do what you guys uh, tell me to do. I just I just thought that was a little odd. No, well, we're not telling you to do anything. I was asking her what the options were. Ah, so it okay. sounded like there were multiple options that Christy just um, mentioned. Yeah. And so it would be um up to you to bring the home back into uh you know compliance with our standards and what it mm -hmm. was before so okay. that that's our concern right gotcha. um, because it's no longer that right now yeah okay all right thank you commissioner hawkins any uh commissioner whitlock well i think and again we need to look at this as if you came to us as it was and then you wanted to make some changes or you needed to address the damaged windows in some way and we would have looked at that and it one of the last choices for us would have unless the window was just totally destroyed would have been to to uh, one replace it with a new window or and no under no circumstance would have our suggestion have been to do what you did. Gotcha. And so I think that that's what we're we're having to struggle with. Um, you, I mean, I guess one option would be to take the the single window that you have and mm -hmm. take that and have other components made to match it and put it back in so it looks just like it was mm -hmm. and. And I think that would be what we probably would have ended up with, given that it wasn't done after the fact. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Whitlock. Commissioner Walker. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question. Um, those th the on the original house where the three windows are. Is that one room in there? Is that like the living room? It's just a, a very small bedroom. Because I, I would question, I'm just curious whether those are the original windows and if there's any way to confirm when that house was built, is that how the windows were configured? Seems like a lot of windows for that. That's a very good question and I wouldn't know how to answer that question. It's a, it's a common window style in Oakland Park. And that's where this is with the tripartite window like that. I can't tell the opening is probably original. It's hard to tell if the windows themselves are original, but I would defer to Jenny because she's been working on this more. I agree with Christy that that is the opening itself is exactly 
traditional for um, Oakland Park. Having the, the three windows side by side like that is not unusual there. And again, with Christy, I don't know if the windows that we're seeing in this particular picture would have been original. Um, whoever, if they were replaced, they did match them with the other windows. So they all had the horizontal mm -hmm. instead of the verticals, which was typical of that time period as well. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so I think that we are at a good point to close, but before we do, Chris, anything you yes. want to, anything you want to say before we close? I know I, I, I'm hoping that, uh, whatever we decide to do that, um, if the decision is for us to go find a window, um, then we'll do our best. But if we don't find it, I'd like to know what recommendation will be for the next best solution rather than just leave it just go figure it out. Sure. Um, I, mean, I, I like to rely on staff and the commission to to guide me. That sounds great. And uh, we will try and do that for you, sir. So okay. we will now close for deliberation. Uh, I think that, you know, it's clear that we would not if this had, as uh, Commissioner Whitlock said, come before us. Um, and it wasn't an after the fact, we would not have allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we should speak to that. Christy, this is going to come up um, again and again. This is our second window of a similar style. And, you know, I, I know that, for example, double hung handles wooden windows, but where do we send people when they need windows like this. I think this is a wood window. It is. Yeah, it's not okay. a steel window. Okay. I, you're absolutely right. Steel windows, yeah. you can't repair them. Yeah. You've got to replace them. They have a lifespan, unlike yeah. wood windows that can be rebuilt. But this is a wood window, and I think you can probably find one mm -hmm. or have one manufactured to match. Two, two more. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. And, oh. you know, remind him, too, like he's talking, it doesn't function with the inside. We don't care what's on the inside. Right. Like you want to cover it up. You want to put furniture in front. You right. want to cover it from the inside. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly appropriate. Yeah, that's not our purview. The interior yep. is not our purview. It does, you know, we ask questions about it sometimes because it helps us understand more. But, um, yeah, the triple window deal is not is something that is, it's right there on the uh, primary facade. So, um, I think that unless anyone has something new to say, we should be writing a motion. Excuse me, do you have any questions about the door? Like what? Um, there doesn't seem to be have been any discussion about the. Front yeah, door. because so I, for me, the door and the windows are the same. I would like to see. Um, I'd like to see it the way it was before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Bell. Would you like me to make a motion? Do you have a question? I have a question before we state the motion. Um, I'm fairly confident in anticipation of your motion that we're going to go, we're going to request a match like for like. So could this be, um, whatever the denial or whatever go and then the applicant work with staff yeah and to figure this i out. think so yeah do you okay. The, mm -hmm. okay okay great all right <laughs> <laughs> all right commissioner bell okay uh, i make a motion to deny the application um based on the standards 2.5 and, and four point four windows, four point one two, four point one three, four point one four. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. what I was gonna mm -hmm. do next. Um and then work with staff on selecting and approving the final materials. Yeah, I think you should say the the new door should match what was there existing and the window openings are to remain the same size as they were. 
I would yeah, I would just add right. that. Okay. The original yeah. window. Mm -hmm. So back on the windows, the window, the the original window size and framing needs to be reestablished. Perfect. To change from what is currently a single window back to what I think is a three panel. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and the and door. The, oops, sorry. And the door, the same, the original materials. I, I do have a question though. The, the, the windows in the original, original door are on a slant, whereas the replacement door still has the three little windows, but they're across. Does, does that have an impact? It, so, yeah, because now it's six versus the three, which was more in keeping with that style of house and that time period. So I think it's covered if you say um, that we want to, uh, you put it so well yeah, with the well, windows. I'm sorry, I, I was thinking it was three across, you're right, it's six across, so mm -hmm. I didn't answer my own mm -hmm. question. So what so you said about the- So we want to return to the original yes. um, construction of the door. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you said, if you'll restate it, that they can work with staff. And, and they can work, or he can work with staff. The applicant can work with staff okay. on all material finalization selections. Okay. All right. Is that okay? And you had standards in there. I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, motion made by Commissioner Bell. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Borth. Thank you. Any further discussion of the motion? I guess just to clarify. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Uh, the applicant did express like difficulty finding a comparable door. Mm -hmm. If if you know the the search has been exhausted and can't find something, they can always come back. Correct. Correct. And, and approve a a deviation from the motion. I agree, and I think working with staff. Correct, Commissioner Hawkins. Working with staff means that they're going to have some great guidance that way too. Candace has said suggested rogue valley doors okay already we're helping chris that sounds okay. great thank you <laughs> all right um okay so let's vote so we have a motion made by commissioner bell seconded by commissioner barth any further discussion of the motion all right let's vote commissioner wheat yes commissioner whitlock yes commissioner hawkins yes commissioner barth yes commissioner wojcik Yes. Commissioner Walker. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Parati. Yes. Motion to deny passes 8-0. Chris, work with staff. Um, they will, they are incredible resources. That sounds good. Well, thank you all very much for your time. I know you, your work is not easy, but uh, well, we'll figure it out. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank Quite you. gracious of you. All right. Next application. Yes, next application is 700 Templeton Avenue. Um, are, is Jacqueline on the line? Uh, yes, Jacqueline is present. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi. Um, were, have you been sworn in yet? I have not, no ma'am. Okay, we need no. to get you sworn in. Oh. And if you could turn your camera on, please. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, while well, you turn your camera on, if you will, thank you. Okay. Uh, raise your right hand and to respond, I do to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, this is after the fact, and you are to review it as though nothing has happened yet. Um, this case actually comes to us after having been approved um, for um, changes to the original house. It was a brick house to begin with. Um, they did an addition, and the brick is was not approved. The brick color was not approved. So they are here to discuss the um, the brick that's now there. And um, I think that's where we'll go with that one. I can provide a little more context. Um, it was an addition project with the original brick 
of the structure to remain and then be extended and to be matched on the addition. Um, and the applicant removed all of the original brick that was to remain and installed um, a very modern brown brick. Um, and so we have been working with them over the past couple of years on solutions. So now they're here to talk through solutions with the commission. And I believe that, you know, Candace, as the historic Mason, she's going to be able to talk more about some of the solutions discussed. There are um, different options that do not are not painting the brick, but rather staining the brick that still allows the brick to breathe. But I believe what the applicant has changed their mind and are going to be requesting just to keep the current brick that they installed as is. So that's the question before the commission. Um, what to do about the removed traditional material and its replacement with a new uh, modern material. Before we go on, just out of curiosity, why has it taken several years? Um, um, out of the, it's, yeah. You got, Jacqueline, do, do you want to answer that for the? So I, why has yeah, it taken I, I, several I, years? I can. Yes, I can try my best to answer. I just came into this project probably about a year ago. And to my understanding, um, there was with the owner and somebody within the, um, I guess, the historic uh, committee, uh, you know, there was communication and he was unaware of this whole brick issue. So I'm not sure. Um, why it's taken, I don't know if it had to do with COVID. Like I, I can't speak upon that, right? I can just speak upon what's current. And I think I've been trying to work diligently with um, Jenny, which I appreciate um, to just, I, I wanna come up with a solution that I can present to the owner where we just wanna get this completed and finalize this house. And now this is like kind of the last um, issue. We've had all, everything else completed with the city, with our permits office and, with all the different trades and now this is kind of holding us up. So I just, I kind of want to come up with a reasonable solution and also discuss like what's on that block and behind that block with many different colors of paint. Um, concerned that uh, with what I'm seeing is painting brick is not an option. Um, new brick should be a traditional brick mortar color and should not be painted, but now I'm requested to paint. So just kind of wanting to understand the process a little bit more because I am new to this whole project. I would imagine it's painting in lieu of taking all the brick away. Um, so I, I know that our staff likes to try for a less painful solution to a problem. And I would imagine that would be the reason why they're recommending stain in lieu of you just redoing it. So thank you. Let's move looking forward. Um, Please feel free to present your case. Uh, Ma'am, um, Jacqueline, if you'd like, we have, um, as you've seen in the presentation, we have information about the difference between painting and staining that I don't know would be helpful for the, the commission to understand. And then at some point we can also get to the neighborhood, neighboring um, homes that you provided as well. Okay. All right, work for you because this it gets a little technical. Yes, thank you. So, and fortunately, we have um, our masonry expert Candace, who can also walk us through some of this. So, um, if it's okay with everyone, maybe we start with Candace. Perfect. Okay, Candace, would you like to walk us through some of the differences so that we can start there and just let me know what slide you want? Um. Yes. Um, good afternoon. This this slide is fine, Jenny. Um, so the difference between a silica paint, which I don't particularly like that term paint, um, but that's what the industry is calling it, um, and a latex acrylic um, oil paint would be that the latex acrylic and oil paint is a is a coating over the substrate masonry that um, does not allow any kind of water or evaporation of of any um, anything really to to escape or enter the masonry wall. And as we all know, masonry breathes, 
just like we do. And so we need something to that is a coating that doesn't necessarily coat it and not allow it to breathe. So the silica paint or or glaze stain, which is what um, staff is suggesting, is chemically made up of the same um, in in the same way that a masonry wall is made up or or brick or or stone is made up because essentially it is a stone, right? So if um, if you think about like a lime wash, a lime wash um, in its original state was limestone that went through a chemical process and is broken down and then can be added to a wall. And because it is of the same chemical makeup as the brick or stone that it's being applied to, it still breathes and acts like the wall that it's being applied to. And so a silica is made up of quartz stone. So when it's broken down and goes through the chemical process and is applied over a, a, a masonry substrate, it acts just like the masonry substrate would because originally it was a stone. So um, that's why staff is leaning more towards a silicate um, glaze, which on um, page nine there, or, or um, yep, page nine there, um, on the left side, you can see it's a glaze, and then on the right side is the silica paint. And so it can be as translucent or as opaque as you would like to make it, and it comes in a variety of colors. Um, which can be shown on um, page 11, on slide 11, I'm, I'm sorry. So um, slide 10 shows what the, the paint version is. And as you can see, it's almost as thick as like what a lime wash would be, but that's not what staff is, is requesting. We are requesting on slide nine, um, the left side, the stain, and this can be, it doesn't have to be the whole um, joint and brick. It can just be the brick to be stained the color of brick um, that the commission selects. Um, but essentially, that would be the differences between like a latex paint and a silica paint. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you for explaining that to us. Okay. Okay, um, anything you want to add, Jenny? No, um, we can, if you wanna discuss this or if you'd like to see what they're saying with the supplement about house and neighboring houses. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Jacqueline and have her speak uh, about that. Jacqueline? Okay. Uh, yes, um, so I under, like going and I'm not going within you know, it's within a block of the house at 700 Templeton. There have been many houses um, in the neighboring area that have been painted. Um, and whether they've been approved or not, there's one in particular over at 601 Mount Vernon Avenue that I think has been misrepresented somewhat. And it's like right around the corner. Um, I believe that it's it's a blue color and the house was sold in i think july of 2012 and i would say 90 percent probably like rebuilt and is a blue color so i'm just trying to understand like the brick that was chosen originally on this house um is not red it's like a beige um, natural color like how is this determined where one house can have a different color and then the other one is you know it's not that we took the brick down i guess because it was dilapidated um and it had to be replaced rather than just replacing a few pieces i mean it was a they demolished the house was sitting for a couple of years and we demolished like pretty much demolished a lot of it and redid it um the outfit became a larger square footage but i'm just i'm trying to understand how the colors determined when you have houses in all different colors in that area. So we look at the historic houses in the neighborhood and the brick 
uh, the, the natural color brick that was prevalent at the time. It is considered a distinctive characteristic of that neighborhood of that time. So we're not looking at houses that have been rebuilt. We're not looking at new construction. We're looking at historic homes from that time period. You're also looking at the fact that they were to match the red brick on this house. Right. And a replacement materials are required to match original. So, yeah, I just jumped right over okay. the fact that we are now talking about what color to use when that was very clearly stated in the beginning. So, okay. And there's documents, obviously, that state that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the actual motion. So the, the details of, of the proposed request are not exactly accurate in this case because it's confusing me that the details state that please speak up commissioner Walker. the details state that this is a new a new single family house but i know it's not it's it's an addition yeah a large addition to yeah. original structure it is yeah that, it's, so yeah we're not starting from a good place okay yeah so this is not new construction it was an it's an addition um but I, I'm sorry, Jacqueline, go on. No, so, it's okay. I'm just, I'm at this point, like, I just wanted to bring that up. That makes sense to me. The blue house is pretty much probably considered a new build, which is why it's blue. And that got approved that way. So I understand with. Yeah, it's hard to step into something and yes. not be completely privy to what <laughs> I, took yes. place before. We, we understand. Um, okay, anything else, any other questions you have for us or any other statements you want to make before? We I think, I think with moving forward, like, if, if this, uh, is going to happen, is it. I don't really want to go in and stain each brick. I would rather go ahead and like, make it easier and, um, have the whole entire. I guess all the brick, existing brick um, painted and not worried about the mortar and have, because that to me, that seems more difficult. And I just want to move forward with getting the project done. So I'd like that to be considered. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Bell. I just want some clarity on slide nine. So that middle strip there, that's just created. So we have a left side. Yes, exactly. Right side. They probably so, would have taped it. I'm sorry. So what we're looking at as far as a potential solution is on the left side. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Walker. I thought Candace said the silica. The um, silica silicate, uh -huh, the silica brick? glaze, the brick on the right. No, that's it left. can be more opaque, but this is the glaze on the left that they're recommending. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Commissioner Whitlock. Yeah, I've just, I never knew that staining brick was on the table. So does this mean that any. Anybody who decides they want a different color brick can. I do up. think that this opens up a huge can of worms. I think that I completely understand why the staff even put it out there because ultimately it's this or remove all the brick. And, you know, some of us might not be as nice as staff. It's not staff's decision. It's not staff's decision. No, it's not. But staff, to your your credit, you are offering this up. And I do think that it might be easier for this one project. But can you imagine? As many requests that we get for painting brick or even staining brick it feels like we're playing with semantics here um commissioner wojcik i have a question because this has been going on for so long i don't have the background has it been explored to whether or not the original brick is available not to my knowledge i feel like but i think it was taken down and 
put in a dumpster and not the original original but like do they still manufacture the brick oh i see what you're saying i'm yeah. not sure because a lot a of standard, that red brick is pretty standard it was a standard red brick mm -hmm. i know there's brick that isn't still made that has been made in the past but if it's something that's still available mm -hmm. that might be truly something to consider I think that's a great idea, Commissioner Logic. Um, well, we are preparing to close for deliberation. Jacqueline, anything you want to say before we do? Um, the only other thing is I, I just need to clarify if it is allowed. Are those the three? Because that's kind of when I came into this, that was my point. Like, instead of coming up with a color, like, are there colors that the historic district allows and what's the suggestion. Um, and so I could present that to the owner um, and just pick out of those three so we don't have to go back and forth. So are the three on the slideshow, is that what's being accepted if allowed those colors? Well, that's if the body even agrees to painting or staining as a solution. So I'll let staff speak to that. Candace? Yeah, so um, the stains come in, as you can see at the top here, there's several different variations of red. And so we would just um, probably, if this is a direction that the commission is going, um, considering that the the current structures brick is probably readily available i would suggest that there would need to be a couple mock-ups of at least three different color reds that the commission would then want to see again and choose from um, and um, moving forward just so that everybody knows there is a maintenance requirement with the stain um, you know, the UV rays of the sun will um, tone it down over years and therefore it would need to be reapplied over three to five years. And so that's also something to think about whether if you choose, once you, if you select a color, um, then, you know, would they have to come back to the commission every three years to get that one color approved again? Or if staff could do that, but that's in the distance, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. It does have a maintenance requirement. Thank you. And is that, I guess my question with that, is that the same with paint, painting? Like with the paints, like I imagine there's still upkeep with painting as well. So when it's not masonry, we don't, we don't have purview over the color of um, like wood, for example. Brick is different because it is a distinctive feature of our historic houses. So this is masonry being painted, not wood. It's very different. Um, so let's close now for deliberation. I. Mm, can I just put on the record that there aren't any more callers? Just thank you. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Um, I, someone else start, please. I, just, I oh. think that they Can should I, have replaced uh, their record. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's start with Commissioner Wojcik, then kick it over to Commissioner Whitlock, and then to Commissioner Walker. I think that they should have to replace the brick with brick that matched the original structure that's they were supposed to match the original structure with the addition they chose to remove the original brick that should have been replaced with like brick mm -hmm. okay thank you commissioner logic commissioner whitlock well can i is this house is this house inhabited yet it, i'm looking on the Google and it's seven months ago, it looks like it's still under construction. I, I'm to my knowledge is not inhabited. Yeah. Can I speak louder and into the mic? Yeah, I apologize. To, to my knowledge, it is not currently inhabited. And is everything else about the construction conforming to the approved 
plan? Honestly, we haven't gotten to that point. The brick has been the, the issue. We have not gotten to that point yet. Um, the brick has been the, the overriding issue. Um, I have gone past there. It still looks a bit like a construction site, so I think there may still be some some more um, items going on. So, well, Commissioner Wojcik kind of summed it up for, for me, given that they, the instructions were clear to Yep. And, you know, I understand Candace did an incredible job, a wonderful job explaining the difference between stain, staining and painting. I do think that that's going to get lost in translation, like um, painting slash painting and or staining um, is something that is like a, a, it's a major deal for applicants who come before us. And I don't necessarily want to open up that can of worms for people who just knowingly defied what we asked them to do. I don't think that it's worth it. Um, and okay, the brick was so bad off, but correct me if I'm wrong, you all were not contacted and made aware of this. Correct. And the app, I had conversations with the property owner as far back as September 2019. Yeah. To fix this. So we're so grateful. So, so grateful Jacqueline has gotten involved because sure. she has been wonderful to work with and mm -hmm. very responsive. And, you know, coming at it with a collaborative attitude, which sure. we all value with. Clearly you projects. value it. That's why we're here looking at this, right? Okay. Um, as one commissioner, I would not be in favor of voting for this. I'd be more in favor of um, making them go back with the proper proper brick. Um, so that is me. It sounds like one, two, three of us at least feel that way. Um, yes, Commissioner Bell? Yeah, I would ditto that. I mean, I think just given the history of the applicant, the application, where the house is sitting, not that that should be a deciding factor. Um, and given the number, just in my short time on the commission, the number of applicants that come before us regarding brick painting, and we have sent others back to the reset that they've had to return the brick to the to its original form. I, I would, yeah, I would deny the, mm -hmm. the application. So that's four of us so far, Commissioner Barth. Just one little bit of um, perspective. I, I appreciate what Candace said about the staining, and it may be a wonderful f solution for other things, but given her comments about it degrading over time, I mean, this could be stained and brought more into keeping, but it's going to fade, and we all know, you know, it's not going to be stained again. <laughs> so, you know, that that's more reason to, yep. to deny this. Okay, so there's five of us. Um, I, there are eight of us on this commission, so maybe one of the four of you who can make a motion should make a motion and let's see where things fall. Commissioner Barth, thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to deny this application for alternative brick. Um, as it does not meet our standards for building materials. 6.18, number 6. 6.18, number 6. I would also say contact Secretary of Interior Standards 2.5. Um, Secretary of Interior Standards 2.5 as well as uh, I've referenced section 5.5 and 5.6. Okay. All right, motion made by Commissioner Barth, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Bell. All right, any further discussion of the motion? Okay, let's vote. Could, could we add something that mm -hmm. direct, kind of like, we know that you are requiring brick to match existing mm -hmm. and say, you know, I know a new application is going to be required, mm -hmm. but if you could say you're denying it and that the new brick needs to match it, what was pre-existing and sure. size, scale, color, texture. Be very clear about that. Be very clear about that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Barth. 
Uh, would additionally um, like to mention that requiring that the applicant um, come back with a new application, uh, referencing the previously approved um, submittal, uh, that the brick match the original in color, size, texture, um, and scale. Okay. Thank you, sir. Motion uh, remade by Commissioner Barth. Are you still good with that, Commissioner Bell? Yes. All right. Let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to deny passes 8 0. Okay. Um, and I have neglected, I announced it in email to all the applicants, but number 10 has deferred. Okay. So um, we will move on to John Friday, number 11, 1119 Belgrave. Former commissioner and chairperson, John Friday? Of, I think so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I know. Do you want to swear yourself in, John? <laughs> if you will, raise your right hand and respond, I do. Do you affirm the testimony and information you are about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you, sir. No, it, it's on when it's green. Okay. The next application is for a uh, request for tree removal. And I'm just going to turn it straight over to John. John, I have the slides up behind you. Okay. I will start with the map showing the location of your property. Okay, if you'll leave it there Green for Bell a Grief. second. That'd be and great. if you would state your name and your address for the court reporter. Uh, John Friday, 1119 Belgrave Place, Charlotte, Gilworth, 28203. Um, Y'all are all new faces. I used to present in front of this group a lot um, doing house renovations and so forth. And really enjoyed it um, and I enjoyed the give and take today. Um, no one wants to take a tree down, um, but I wanted to present our thoughts to you on, on why we're doing this. Um, can we go to the next slide? So this is the front of our house, recent before the leaves, so that you could actually see the tulip poplar in the back, which is the red line. Um, with the exception of the old street tree, the maple, of the old magnolia and that tulip poplar, everything you see in this photograph we planted. Um, even the smaller street tree, don't tell uh, urban forestry, when they took it out years ago and said the, because of funding issues, it would be two or three years, we put one in. We just didn't tell anybody. The next photo. So in 1993, when we bought the property, we came to historic district and got permission to put in the fence. Um, and at that time, there were three trees on the property, the tulip poplar on the right, the hickory on the left, and the dogwood, which didn't live very long. Um, we started building a wall of green between us and the development that I knew with all my planning background was going to be in our backyard. Um, it's our belief that the removal of this one tree does not greatly affect the preservation of the canopy, given its location and all the trees that we've added. If we can go to the next slide, please. So that's what our yard looks like now. We could see Moorhead Street, and now we're, we're hoping with a 50-foot building behind us, we won't be able to see that either. Um, this shows the wooded and planted areas that we've created that did not exist before. One more slide, please. And that's the context of our request, because I know context is important. We have a site plan next of the trees we've planted. We have planted seven large maturing trees and 22 understory trees like redbud, ginkgo, specimen Japanese maples, and others. The next slide. If you approve our taking this tree out, we will plant two trees. The cost of the equipment, equipment that's going to be needed to take this tree out, because it is huge. We can put in a large caliper maple behind my garage that we built some years ago that I wish we had done at that time, and now we'll have that opportunity. Its location would add to the canopy of the historic district because we are on that edge of the historic district. And we're going to add a specimen um, 
yellow Japanese maple where the Yashinko cherry died. So if we can go to the next slide. We're here with this request because December 9th, after five days of rain, but a day without wind or storms, the large hickory tree that used to be next to that tulip poplar simply fell. Our painter was in the backyard, heard a snap, and watched it hit our house. Next slide, please. The fall, we were extremely lucky. Had it fallen to the right, it would have gone to the glass addition that we did with historic district approval and taken out most of our roof. Instead, it fell through the Shima cherry, whose branches helped support it, and the damage was relatively minimal. In any other direction, it would have created significant damage to the house or plantings. So we've never really thought about these trees being an issue. Next slide, please. So when it fell over, um, the we, we've had arborists here every year. They prune the trees, they fertilize the trees, they tear, take care of the trees. There was no indication at all, visibly, that there was a problem with this tree. Once it was down, the severe root rot on one side was visible and the significant internal rot as well, you can see in the stump, had no idea. So that led us here today. We had bar next slide, please. We had Bartlett come over and um, study the tree, study the tulip poplar and tell us what to do. We requested permission December 29th to remove the poplar with a letter from the arborist, which is part of the guidelines. From my expensive work helping to create the HTC we have today, I knew I couldn't take the tree down and pretend we didn't know the requirements. So we submitted an application as we were supposed to do. Next slide. So we had the arborist initial report modified for a lot of additional information as directed by staff. As I understand, that went to the city arborist and they concurred. And the HTC has no in-house staff, so you really have to rely on the city arborist to, to advise you. Um, next slide. And next slide. And if you read all this, you went to sleep. So I'm going to, next slide. So I'm going to give you just the key points. The overall rating of the tree is that of a moderate risk. And the city arborist agreed with an email to staff that he agrees totally with that, he or she. That doesn't mean there's no risk. It doesn't mean it's gonna to fall tomorrow. It just means it's a possibility. And that's derived from three things. What is the likelihood of failure, which is possible? What is the likelihood of hitting a target, which is high, given our yard? What's the consequences of hitting a target? They rate, labeled it significant. We would call it catastrophic. So we were asked to test the roots. That was one way to do it. And by testing the roots, 20% of the root structure is deemed to be decayed. Both the city and our arborist agree, it will only get worse. There's no way to make it better. So what are the characteristics of a tulip poplar? As beautiful as it is, they tend to have branches that scaffold weakly attached, and that's where they break. And in and this is a long sentence. In general, it's a weaker wood species that has a greater potential for breakage as it does not compartmentalize decay very well. What that means is if the wind catches it the right way, it'll snap it in half or knock it over. That's what it amounts to. But a key comment in there to us is, however, the overall risk rating, the mitigation recommendations or any other conclusions do not preclude the possibility of failure from undetected conditions. Trees can unpredictably fall, even if no other defects or other conditions are present. That's a problem for us. Next slide, please. So we were told that 33% um, root rot is the threshold someone set for staff to make an approval, and I get that. Um, but root rot is just one, one factor that are equal in the 12 page International Society of Arboriculture Tree Risk Assessment Manual, another long sentence. So when you look at all this, it takes into account target assessment, recent history of failures nearby, soil conditions, is the tree protected from the wind? It's a long list. Um, I know it's a lot to take in, and you may wonder if it's only 20% root rot, 
and it's going to get worse over time. What is our concern? Next slide. It's the risk. This is a diagram of the result of a 100-foot tree falling. And this tree is actually taller because from the hickory fell, we measured it was 94 feet tall. Well, this one's much taller than that. 40% of the tree fall zone is occupied structures. The remaining 60% is a garden and, and canopy of trees that we've cultivated over 30 years. If this tree falls and creates damage, our neighbors know we're here to manage the risk. It seems the question of liability arises. Taking this tree down will damage the yard plantings, our driveway, and our sprinkler system. It's going to be a big deal. We have an HCC approved plan right now for a new driveway and a patio in the backyard that we've obviously put on hold till we know what we're doing with this. It would put in jeopardy if we do that now and don't take it down. It's going to put all that in jeopardy years from now when we do. And we simply don't want to live with this over our heads. So again, why are our concerns? And this is my best photograph, and there's no one to move it forward. I think I do. <laughs> okay. It's okay? Yes, perfect. So in 1998, um, we had concern about a neighbor's tree, and we had an arborist come over, and they examined it, said it was fine, gave us um, a report how to mitigate the risk by trimming it. We did all that. The next year, it failed, and here's a picture of my brand new crush car. So we would not be here if the hickory tree next to the tulip poplar hadn't fallen unprovoked. We have arborist visits every year. There was no sign of issues or it would have been taken care of. The report I had up earlier, the comment said, trees can unpredictably fall even if no defect or other conditions are present. We know this tree has root rot. As much as I would like, you would like an arborist report to be math where you can add it up and the numbers add up or they don't. It's not that kind of science. It simply doesn't work that way. Next slide, please. So on our street, and the city arborist knows all of us well, um, we have old trees and they have dropped limbs. They have dropped limbs through people's windshields and onto their cars and so forth. So I've talked to them in the street, they know us. Despite that examination, December 29th of last year, this city tree simply fell after several days of rain, but no event. We didn't have a wind event. It just fell. And luckily, no car was in front of it. Nobody was in front of it. And I think you all have a case um, last year that also proves the point. The homeowner came in after the fact, as we've seen so many cases after the fact. Um, and the photographs and the evidence they had, there was nothing wrong with the tree. And you all saw that, and the city arborist agreed there was nothing wrong with the tree. Now, it had already been taken down, and when it was taken down, it had rot in it, and those photographs were presented. But because it was after the fact, you voted not to give a certificate. I get that, but it had rot in it with no sign of any rot. Next slide. So much as I would do if I were presenting a project to you like Angie did earlier, um, I went through the ACC guidelines looking at the specifics of what it is I need to bring to you. Um, and I have to tell you, trees are mentioned seven times, but there aren't any guidelines in there. There are 23 pages, as there should be if you saw today's presentation of projects. There are 23 pages on scale, massing, rhythm, roof, all the stuff that homeowners can read for themselves and have a sense of what to bring in front of the commission. But I could find no guidelines for you guys to decide if I can take this tree down or not um, in this situation because it's not part of a project and it's not next to a structure. Um, next slide, please. So the entire basis for our request is really the risk. The trees on our property, it's under HTC review. It's also part of the Charlotte Tree Ordinance, which makes us responsible for protecting our neighbor's property. We know this tree has root rot. Our neighbors know this tree has root rot. It won't get better. We don't want to have it checked every year till it reaches some higher percentage that somebody comes up with. 
And I frankly don't want it over my head during that time period. We want to do so now. We want to take it down now. Next photograph. One concern, a major concern, is the distance of this tree from our house and the fact that it has no limbs up until very high into the tree. Um, when I lived in uh, Elizabeth during Hugo, a pine tree went through a house at the corner of 8th Lamar and went all the way through the house to the brick foundation because it was so far away and so tall with nothing to stop it. It just sliced right through it. The arborist said, given the location of this tree and its distance from the house, should the tree fall, it would undoubtedly crush the roof and walls of the residence, likely cutting the home directly in two. I don't want to live with that. I want you to see this because we can talk about a tree falling, but this is the kind of damage it can do. So we would like your permission to take the tree down now as we continue to add to the district's tree canopy with our proposed plantings and as we have for 30 years. Thank you for your time, patience, and consideration of our request. Thank you, John. Thank you. So I know there's no one on the line and I was looking for my tree woman who's all about trees and she's sitting in the audience. Yes. Let the record show that Commissioner Walker has recused from this case. Um, so commissioners. I have a question. Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you for your work. My question is um, going to the Bartlett report, and I can appreciate the visuals that are they're impactful. But one question I have is if I read correctly, the mitigation recommendation actually moved the um, I guess the risk level from moderate to low if the elements of the plan were implemented. And I'm just curious, have any of the, and I know it was just since January, but have any of the um, recommendations for decreasing the risk been implemented or is there any plan or appetite to do that and then reevaluate? Barley comes every year and climbs every tree and trims out all the dead limbs and do all that. We've done all the maintenance one could ever want to do on a piece of property. So taking down some of those higher limbs or whatever, it still has 20% root rot. It's the kind of tree that falls in a windstorm. But we do, we, we maintain this property beautifully in terms of the trees, the amount of money we spend doing that. So. That's what I mean. If Bartlett had any idea that hickory tree had a problem, we'd have already been here and dealt with it. But no one knew. But but they're there every year. Thank you. John, um, you know what it's like to sit on this side of the table, right? I do. <laughs> and you know how um you know, our neighbors or community members come before the commission and they say, well, you let so and so do it. Or I have a whole list of houses that have been painted. Why can't I paint mine? Um, so often we have people and rightfully so talk in earnest about the fear they have of these trees, older trees giving out. Um, for many, many years, we lived with a black uh, walnut in our backyard that when it was finally taken out had serious cavities and we feared for our lives too. We have a child, you know, and, and, you know, a puppy and creatures we care about. Right? So, um, that was 1 of the reasons why I personally, as 1 commissioner felt a sense of relief when urban forestry, um, stepped in and said that they would take on some of the onus of our judgments because they are making uh, recommendations about trees, something that they are a lot more equipped to do than we are. So all we have is their recommendation and numbers. And um, looking at numbers, the 20% uh, root damage, that's scary. It is also just one step above possible when we're looking at possible, probable, imminent, uh, uh, wait, 
there were the four levels, the lowest level, it, it was just one step above the, the lowest level. So my question to you, albeit a long drawn out one, is if we do this for you, then tell us how, advise us on how to deal with everyone else who's going to come behind you because they too are afraid of their trees. Um, my first question to you would be what guideline number are you following to have this discussion? 8.5 number two. Which says? When tree removal is needed due to disease or other reasons or desired, a certified arborist must be consulted and the written recommendation must be provided to the HDC before removal is granted. This guideline includes trees in front, side, and rear yards. Um, and my point is, the rest of the sentence isn't there telling you what to do. We we have. I know I'm being very technical and. Um, I answered your question. Now you answer mine because you're over there and I'm over here right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so help me. Okay. So seriously, here's, so here's if the, if if you ha we have twenty percent for you, right? Right. And there are so many other people, as you know, who come here who are at twenty twenty two percent, and we tell them, well, urban forestry says that it's dying, but it's not dead. Like we're all dying, but we're not dead. So if we do this for you, then tell me. Tell us what to tell everyone else who comes behind you who says the same thing. Um, the problem you have is that we have as a group, because I had been involved for many, many years in getting all this done and what I didn't realize there were no guidelines. There's nothing in there about if it's 20%, yes. If it's 22%, no. Any of that, not one sentence in the entire 82 page document has any of that in there. So, my first recommendation would be now that the UDO is passed, and I was involved with that for six years, I would let urban forestry take it all on for the removal of all trees because for the first time in history, they're now going to do private property. Staff really shouldn't be doing that, in my view, because you don't have the expertise. And having to go to urban forestry and ask them to help you isn't really fair. They either need to be staff or not. So um, I guess my pushback on your question is, no, back up. First thing I would do is get out of the business because you really don't have any guidelines. We can talk about the window sizes and the opening of that porch and all day long, there's nothing in it about trees. But if you get out of that and let urban forestry do it, they do have all of that. And starting June 1, they will. And I believe you voted today to accept the heritage tree. Um, we did. Okay. So as of June 1, we will go to urban forestry and take the tree down. It's a given. Urban forestry, John says, um, uh, do, 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 just a moment. The root information as you have identified shows 20% decay and the likely and lists the likelihood of failure as possible. And then it goes on and it talks about that 33% threshold that you're talking about. And then he says, Henry says, he rates, he being Austin, the tree is a moderate risk, which based on the information that he has provided is an appropriate rating. The four levels of risk are extreme, high, moderate, or low. All trees will fall into one of these categories when, um, pre-formatting a risk assessment. Um, and so he also goes on to say that uh, there are options, mitigation options, that if done would lower the overall risk of the tree from a moderate risk down to a low risk. Which is why I think Commissioner Bell asked you for as much as you take care of trees, if you've done what they told you to do to bring that risk level down. Um, and so this includes 
pruning the tree, monitoring the root decay, and providing an inspection of the lightning protection system that was previously installed. So he's saying that it can go from moderate to low. There are people who come in here who are looking at probable, you know? And so I wanna say yes to all of them. I wanna save all the trees. I wanna save life more, right? right? And yet we have urban forestry coming in, telling us, giving their assessment, giving us their opinion, in addition to your certified arborist, because we are not equipped to do that. And so they are saying that it's moderate now, it could go to low with these mitigation, uh, options, these mitigation techniques or they, that Bartlett or whomever you decide to use would apply. Right. And so it makes it difficult to say yes to you when that is the case, when there are people who come in who are well above probable or excuse me, well above um, possible. Again, you're at 20 percent. There's nothing to laugh at, but it's 20 percent as opposed to going all the way up to 50. Right. right. And so it's I, I'm just saying in from one commissioner to a fellow uh, former commissioner, it's difficult for us. And you know personally what that's like. And so to say yes is just going to be difficult for me as one commissioner. I understand. I understand the difference between almost everything you do and trees, which I have to tell you, I did not understand until we had this issue ourselves, um, is that there is no, um, there's no life and limb. You know, the houses you looked at today where they had windows that I probably wouldn't, I would probably vote the way you all voted. Um, you know, we see houses all the time, they have a window. It's like, how in the world did that window get there? Okay, but no one died. Yeah. You know, it didn't destroy half a house. So yes, you're in a, a difficult spot. I happen to think your guidelines don't give you any support in how to make a decision. Is my view. Okay. And um, after June 1, we'll be able to take the tree down anyway because of the heritage rules. That takes a little pressure off of us. Uh, off of us. Thank you. <laughs> and I fought for those rules to be higher. I was on the Zoom calls with the public trying to get more um, fines for taking heritage trees down. I don't want to take them down either. Um, I do have a concern that if you say no, with the city attorneys here somewhere, um, and before June, before we get permission to take it down, if it falls, are y'all liable? Is the city liable for telling me no? Because if something happens, I am concerned that my my neighbors know of this issue. I am required under the Charlotte Tree Ordinance to manage the risk for my neighbors. And 20% may not seem like much, but it's known. So I'm also on this side going, I'm in a hard place as well. I understand. And we've been waiting since December 29th because we would have taken it down immediately. Having had yeah. the fall. Okay. Thank you. Stop. Commissioner Wojcik. Can I ask a question to the commission? How many trees do we review? And the only ones that I've ever done were after the fact. And is there a standard? I mean, I get the mild, moderate, high, likely, but is there a, a point that you guys as a commission over the years have said, this is kind of the line or um, is there a, a like a past voting consistency or anything like that that we could use? We've relied on the certified arborist to give us their opinion and before the pressure was on us to take that information and decide. But that is uh, one of the reasons, because we're always you know, trying to get better. We brought in urban forestry mm -hmm. because we don't know it. And so we wanted to be able to use what the certified arborist gave us along with the feedback that we got from urban forestry. 
and we have feedback from Henry. So in number two, or sorry, 8.5, number two, when it says due to disease, there's a degree of that then to an extent. I mean, you wouldn't have rotten roots if you didn't have some sort of disease. Right. And I think one of the things that we've talked about is, because this has come up frequently enough, is that we're, everything's dying. <laughs> You know, um, if we took down all the trees that are dying, we would have no canopy left. And so, but yet we're in this position and I remember a couple being in here and I felt for them, but they didn't meet what we thought was the preponderance of evidence. And so we said, no, um, not to John's point, a position that as a commissioner that you wanna be in, which is again, why we called in urban forestry. Mm -hmm. So, um, any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Whitlock. So, I mean, we've got Bartlett tree experts giving their recommendation to take it down. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering, when is that not enough? I mean, Same question here, because our guideline says a certified arborist recommendation, and we have a letter from a certified arborist that says, I would recommend removal of the tulip poplar. It's on page 14 on the uh, the second to the last paragraph, or third to the last paragraph. I, th I think that that's a, I don't know how I got to fielding these, but I think that that is a call that we each have to make. There are four levels. This is at the very bottom of the second level. And so I think I know that as a, one commissioner on this body, um, I want to be consistent with everyone. So for anyone who comes here and has a letter from a certified arborist who says, take it down, um, then if we do it for John, we must do it for them too. And our urban forestry person said that, it, Henry said that it could go from um, moderate to low. So we also lean on him as an expert. Yes, our attorney, who, thank you, wants to jump in. Attorney Hewitt. I would have to just give you guys one point to consider. As you're sitting in your quasi-judicial function, you're supposed to consider the testimony and base it on whether it's competent, material, and relevant to the issue at hand. What that means, I think, in particular to one of the questions that you are, you guys seem to be struggling right now is you have two experts that have provided you with information in the presentation you have the city you have the city expert and then you have the applicants expert as a quasi judicial board you have to sit in your quasi judicial hat and make a decision about how you evaluate that evidence whether you find it credible and make a decision as to that i hope that provides a little bit more context cuz i i think that's maybe one of the things you guys are struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Attorney Hewitt. Thank you very much. Yes, I Commissioner Bell. To, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, in the email, and this goes back to my initial question, it seemed to indicate that if there was a routine mitigation plan that the rating would go from moderate to low. So it's hard for me to not pick up on that as part of our consideration for making a decision. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Any other questions or comments before we close? Commissioner I, Hawkins? Now I'm better, I'm, I'm better understanding what our, uh, issue is because I did miss that initially. I went straight to what urban forestry um, was saying. Um, so, and to the point of what the applicant mentioned, if we are, we are held to our standards and our standards do say, get a letter from a certified arborist. And so, I, I do. I would caution us if we operated outside of that. Then what are we 
leaning on. So that's kind of my, you know, feeling on it right now is if the applicant followed what our standards are saying, then I think we need to stick to what our standards are suggesting. Okay. All right, Commissioner Hawkins. Before we close for deliberation, John, anything you want to say? I would say that we invited the city arborist at least three times to come to the site. And to my knowledge, they've never been there. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. We will now close for deliberation. Um, Commissioner Hawkins, it sounds like you have a motion in motion. Okay. All right. I'd like to make a motion to approve this application based on trees 8.5. Number two. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Hawkins, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Wheat. Any further discussion of the motion? Okay. Let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati, no. Motion approved. Thank you. Seven one. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's six one. Uh, sorry, six one. Six. Thank you. Okay. Um. So, do we want to he hear one more tonight, and then? Yeah. Oh well, let's ask. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. Everybody's staying. <laughs> How many of you can stay a little longer? What's the next one? It's a signage yeah. um, package for 15, 13, 15, 15 South Mint. Mm -hmm. And then. Um... Okay. So who's able to stay for the signage? Okay. Okay. All right. So Commissioner Walker, was your hand up? Yeah, awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you, team. You are a tireless team and I really appreciate you. Okay. Okay, so we'll hear the remaining cases 13, 14, and 15 at the beginning of the May 10th agenda. All right, okay. thank Thanks. you. Okay, so, um, I need to know if uh, Sherry is on the line. <laughs> is Sherry on the line? Jenny, it's Candace. I don't have a Sherry on the line. Okay, well, that might answer the question about hearing another case. <laughs> well, okay. Candace, is anyone on the line? Like, even number 15 we could hear? Um, I'm checking. Hold on one second. Number 15 is here. Yes. Would you like to hear 15 instead then? I Number 15, 15 is. Oh, are you Sherry? Sorry. Oh, well, perfect we go. timing, perfect. Sherry. Come on to the front. All right. Okay. <laughs> 15 got excited. Sorry, 15. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, we can handle. Yeah. Okay. Who's up for handling 15 too? Come on. Come on. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Hi, Sharon. We're going to have to have you. <laughs> we need to have you sworn in first. All right. If you will, please raise your right hand and respond. I do to the following question. Do you affirm the testimony and information you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? All right. Thank you. Okay. This is an after the fact case, so it needs to be heard as though nothing has happened yet. Um, prior to this case, uh, there had been work done on this property approved under various COAs, um, but had also said that the um, signage must come back as a package. So okay. here we are now. Oh, shit. Would you oh, hit yes. the button so it's green? 
and, and it, talk loud into the mic and say your name <laughs> and your address for the court reporter. Okay, Sherry Christy. Hartzell, and I am 4, 414 Russell Street, and that's Kannapolis, North Carolina. Um, I'm here representing uh, 1515 South Mint Street and the signage proposal for them. And we are proposing three non illuminated wall signs, and they're all fairly small. Um, one is 10 square foot. One is 5.5 square foot. That would be the trio, the little uh, clover looking logo. And then we have the 10 square foot, the horseshoe, the projecting sign. And then we also have the borough Welchel and Culp orthodontics, which is eight square foot. I don't really have anything else to add other than <laughs> that. You know, if you have any questions. Okay, fire away. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll let you know that we do have um, the slides up behind okay. you. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, commissioners. I'm checkered out on the last one. You all take this one. <laughs> Questions? Questions for Sherry? I don't really have any questions for the applicant. I have, mm -hmm. I'm, I've always been so hazy on the, the signage guidelines. So, mm -hmm. um, so I may ask staff, how do we look at this as being you know, in breaking this up into properties, because there are two buildings Correct. and we limit the number of signs per building. Correct. Um, we have multi tenants. Correct. So, so what happened is you approved the rehab of these properties and you're very specific in your decision, just like we did for 1913 Cleveland last month. You said, we're not approving any signage, come back with a total sign package for the buildings so that we can evaluate it holistically since these are this is a group of buildings that are adjoined okay. and it's it's you specifically retain that for the commission to review correct but and we're looking well yeah this isn't after the fact being that the signs are already there um so i guess my my thing to to you know here i, I believe some of these signs are a little larger than we would approve mm -hmm. um so what say you to that? I mean, are, are you are you guys proposing any consolidation of the signage or is this basically where we are? This is basically where we are. Since they are individual tenants, we we were gonna, you know, propose for them to each have their individual signage on their tenant space. Gotcha. I mean, so I guess given that I I don't have any further questions. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Barth. Any other questions, commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Walker. How much does that one sign exceed the um, allowable 10 by 10? Did I miss that? The 10 square foot? Yeah. And I cannot remember what is the allowable for the historic district. Um, anybody? Eight, six <laughs> inches or less or uh, up to eight, yeah, eight square feet. Okay. If it's uh, if it's on the building, an individual deal on the building. And the larger one is a projecting sign. And we can reduce it um, if you would rather us, us do that. If I may, please. So. Have you been able to look at the signage uh, standards at all? Yes, I did back when this started, um, but unfortunately my notes I don't have with me as far as that goes. So I guess the question, because I just heard you say you would be willing to reduce it. The question I would have is if you are able to review the, the standards and see how you can bring the signs into compliance with the standards if you're oh this is after the fact it's after the fact i think there's because of the size of the buildings they're not going to be able to comply because there's too many separate um, units tenants mm -hmm. and so that's why it comes to the commission 
what they could comply with was, you know, not internally lit um, projections, but you were going to look at it holistically to make sense, make sure that the design of where all the signs were going fits with the design of the building. So you have a lot of leeway is basically what I'm saying. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, so Sherry, anything you want to say before we close for deliberation? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we'll close for deliberation. Commissioners, what's the solution? Just, just so I can be clear. Um, we have three signs, we have two buildings, um, you know, the, for the projecting sign projects more than 6 inches, correct? So that would be, uh, it needs to be no more than 6 square feet, which I believe that exceeds. 10. Is it? I mean, no, I think the actual sign is 10. So yes. Yes. I, thank it you. does exceed. <laughs> she said that it was 10 square feet existing. It does exceed. So that directly contradicts our guideline for Appendix A signage. Um, and then the other the other two are face applied, but smaller, um, which we have eight square foot designated for those. Which one the the borough Welch Welchill and Culp sign is already eight feet. I think we we need and we need a reduction overall. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, so anyway, if I'm reading the guidelines, that's just that's how it speaks to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's pretty black and white. <laughs> it is. So, do you have a motion? Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I would imagine this is a continuance for for. I'm sorry, I don't, I, I need clarification on something. So then each of the tenants could very well have their own little sign. Should you determine and should you review all of the sign package for the whole building and what it looks like? With the rhythm, right? The projections, right? Right? Yep. Right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, did I just. One thing is, I was looking at this, there's a lot of mix and match, right? Mm -hmm. We've got it's not a cohesive one look. sign in the middle of the two storefronts, and then you've got other signs on the side. Mm -hmm. So, to Christy's point, I think we have to obviously look at the standards, but then how do we ensure the signage aligns with the, you know, the look of the I would think that, uh, my opinion in is that, um. We could very well do the 1 side, the 1 sign with the 2 sides. Um, because I don't see with each company having their own individual brand. How to make it look cohesive outside of that. That's correct. Like, we can't tell the companies what their color story is, but we can, I think, provide direction on placement, sizing, and flow for the building, even though we understand the brands would be very different correct. Mm -hmm. because they're all different businesses. Yeah. So, it does, what you're saying is it doesn't just have to be a sign with the two sides. It could be where you place your logo as long as it meets the standards. Um, I, I have a preference. I think that the sign is a better way to have a holistic, consistent look. Um, what say you? If you have a different idea, what is it? Well, we we we've come across this, and this is a general generally new guideline, but we've come across this on East Boulevard where you have a multi-tenant building, mm -hmm. and there's the sign out front, which I imagine is what you guys are mm -hmm, talking mm -hmm. about, um, which which would allow the applicant to, you know, produce maybe a more centrally located sign, but it's how do you identify, you know, these each individual tenant spaces? Which yeah, that's now. true. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Commissioner Bell. Sorry. Yeah. Could it not come? Because it, it just feels like the, 
I don't know what this is. The black and gold is just sticking in the center of the building. Whereas the other sign, oh, I'm trying to get to it, was on the side. So is there a way to have consistency with placement? I'm assuming one on the kind of the end, one in the middle, one on the other end. Mm. Commissioner, no, I'm not really sure where. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's. We want to hear your voice, Commissioner Bell, Commissioner Hawkins, and I think that gets back to the whole the what we were asking for initially, which was to see the package of the signage because we're still we're trying to figure it out and piece it together, um, without really seeing it in totality. Mm -hmm. Um, and so perhaps that's something that we could, you know, ask for. Mm -hmm. What do we do with new tenants though? You know, what do we do when new tenants come on board or when old tenants leave? The discussion that you had previously mm -hmm. was show us where the signs can be placed. Mm -hmm. And what the building owner said is we don't know where it's going to be placed because it's going to be up to the tenants. Mm -hmm. But I still think that's the solution here mm -hmm. is you need to designate where it's appropriate for signage. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't matter if tenants turn over, mm -hmm. like that's where the signage can go in this building. Mm -hmm. But that's just sure. my thought. No, no, I, I think that that's the better of these options because to Chris's point, you're right. Like, how do you know where you're going if it's just, if it's just one landmark sign? Um, but if it's affixed to the building, if it's projected, then that can change as long as we're adhering to the size standard, but the placement is where I think we're hung up. Yeah, and I think that's where the black and gold comes in, because if I look at slide eight, mm -hmm. there, you know, it looks like it was just placed in the middle, but you've got two storefronts there, even though the green tenant B essentially bleeds into tenant C and by, you know, the floor plan is a little unorthodox. And so if you look at where the door, the entrance is, that would be your logical kind of solution for sign placement. But it, it's hard to tell because there's doors in, in other areas. So I like what Christy said. I think we just need to identify the the signage needs to be placed at the main entry point. Right. Yeah. Um, it needs to be this square footage as referenced in our guidelines, and and that's basically it. I mean, it shouldn't go beyond that. And for multi-tenant spaces, I would imagine it's divided up equally between if if they are separate signs, it's the, the allotted square footage is divided equally between tenants. Is that a motion? Sounds like a motion. <laughs> Okay. Totally sounds like a motion. Like maybe a continuance <laughs> to bring us a sign package that shows that. So I uh, would like to make a motion to continue this application, mm -hmm. requesting that the applicant restudy the signage for each individual tenant as a is a holistic approach, um, requesting that the applicant place signage near the main point of entry for each tenant. And given the allotted um, sign uh, restrictions as referenced in Appendix A for sign standards and regulations, um, I would imagine this is urban districts um, mm -hmm. number two. Mm -hmm. A point two, number two. I think it's in A the TOD yeah. overlay. Wow. Oh. So, yeah, urban districts and then the sign Appendix A. A as an apple is more side standards that a, a two. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So motion. Okay. It, while you have, uh, let's talk into the mic so people know. What and we're uh, I would additionally like to reference a point one number thirteen. 
Was that A as an apple? A as an apple. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so motion made by Commissioner Barth, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Hawkins, any further discussion of the motion? All right, let's vote. Commissioner Wheat? Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to approve passes 8-0. Okay. okay. Great. Um, Kevin Davis. Am I all done? Thanks, Sherry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Sherry. <laughs> all right. Have a great evening. Okay, and just uh, Candace told me it was a little hard to hear, but we are announcing that applications number 13 and 14 will be heard at the beginning of next month's meeting. And in the kindness and generosity of the commission to get through as many cases as possible, they are skipping down to case number 15. Um, which is should be fairly quick and straightforward. So, Kevin, are you with us? Christy, this is Candace. Um, I see Kevin. I'm unable to make her a pan panelist and I'm unable to unmute her. Oh, no, I'm not sure what to do. Okay. Um. Cindy or Marilyn, are you having any luck with that? Can you um, ask her to leave and come back? I think she has left. I'm sorry. Oh, you think she has left? Yes. Kevin's gone. Okay. Okay. No, well, I mean, it's, it's not that they're gone. They're, they're you can't do anything with them. Is the way this system is set up now, you have to keep hitting the refresh button at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, Kevin, it seemed to has left. Okay. But um, just so everyone knows, they switched WebEx to be meetings to webinars. And so we're technically in like a new system for this meeting. Um, so I'm, you know, thankful that we haven't had any other technological hiccups since we did completely kind of switch. When are we uh, getting back to full in-person meetings? Um, applicants are able to come in person and we are allowing um, remote access until you should deem otherwise. So you won't be true. Yeah, for those for, <laughs> I it's mean, we're tell. walking around naked faces and all now. So I think that it's time to have people come back in. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can I, discuss. That, that is, I think anybody our, else have an opinion? Okay. I think our city attorneys would be very happy for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing that I would add for the commission, can, just like Christy said, it, it is up to you mm -hmm. to require individuals to come back. My understanding is that you have been working in a hybrid capacity where all of you have been here in person, but you've allowed certain applicants to participate in a hybrid way. Mm -hmm. Again, you can make that change to the way you proceed. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I would add, although it doesn't sound like you would be interested in, but there is also the the possibility for your remote participation. No, there's if, not. not <laughs> there's not. They're oh, quasi-judicial. I'm sorry. It's okay. My bad. It's okay. Completely okay. Mess that up. Okay. No. Um, no, <laughs> no, but thank you for jumping in there. We appreciate that. So, no yeah. Worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what I would say is maybe we have a transition. Yes, ma'am. Can you, can you? Excuse me. I just texted Kevin and she just left for a walk because she thought our meeting ended at seven. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> catch up with Kevin next month then. Mm -hmm. um, well, she's wondering if she should rush back because she's just I down the block. No? no. Okay. Um, Tell her to enjoy her walk for all of us. <laughs> all of us and the pretty evening. Um, the only thing I would ask is that maybe we have a bit of a transition period. Okay. And so my suggestion would be maybe we start this with the new fiscal year mm -hmm. at our July meeting. So I that like would be that. May and June and let people get used to a transition and let them know it's coming. That's a great idea. I, 
I need the same thing okay. and my daughter does too. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I think that works for a lot of people. Um, okay. Thank you for, for that, Chrissy. It was a great idea. Okay. Time. There might be some minutes. There are some minutes. Who who is on top of the minutes? Who wants to make a motion about the minutes? Then I'll speak at once. I'll make a motion about. All that. right, the Commissioner is, Wheat. At least, at least March. <laughs> uh huh. I make a motion to approve the minutes from the March eighth meeting. Okay. No. Uh. No changes. No changes. Okay. Not, so motion made by Commissioner Wheat, seconded by second Commissioner Barth. Any uh, further discussion of the motion? All right. Let's vote. Commissioner Wheat. Yes. Commissioner Whitlock? Yes. Commissioner Hawkins? Yes. Commissioner Barth? Yes. Commissioner Wojcik? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Parati? Yes. Motion to approve the meet, uh, the March minutes passes 8-0. Thank you, Commissioner Wheat. All right. So um, thank you all for staying late. I, um, I, our attorney feels badly about misspeaking and wants to <laughs> clarify one point. Just <laughs> Just for the room and commission, uh, not commissioner, but attorney Hewitt, you Just have really briefly, yes. uh, to clarify when you are sitting in your quasi judicial function, we have uh, advised that you continue to meet in person. However, if you sit in an advisory function, so, for example, your retreats and situations mm -hmm. that don't require the hear a quasi judicial hearing, there is a possibility there if you so desire for mm -hmm. some remote participation. OK, but yeah, I just wanted to clear that up because <laughs> I wanted but, to make sure that that's it. Thank you. And thank you for speaking up during the tree conversation. That was greatly appreciated. I'm happy to help. Yes. Oh, and we have one more from. Well, they they voted on March. Did we? Did February get resent again, or because they were not voted on last time? Yes, didn't vote on February. Do we have February. Okay. Are they resent or no? No. Okay. So we need February. Okay. Well, you know what? We'll have March 29th, and we'll have April 12th, and we'll send you Februarys out in a few weeks. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you, thank you, thank you to Cindy Kohanic for being a rock star. All right, so we've reached the end of today's agenda. Is there any further business to discuss? All right. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Walker, you good? Okay, all right, so hearing uh, no additional business that we need to discuss, this meeting is adjourned at 7.11 p.m. Thank you so much.